All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Oh, okay, there we go. 2020, Happy New Year, everyone. Like I said, 2020 vision in 2020, yeah. We've got five minutes, so we're going to sing The Lion and the Lamb, okay? So everyone rise up, and let's sing along.
We're about to start the next section, so um, before we start going in, I'm going to take a step back. I mean, it's a new year. I'm probably the first section of the decade, so, um, and we're all tired, so I'm going to take a step back. Before my section, we were talking about the angels. So we got to the first angel, which was talking about the gospel, the angel about a presentation of the gospel to the whole world. And then the second angel was talking about Babylon and how Babylon was fallen, um, talking about it is fallen because it was so sure that Babylon will fall. We know for a fact that Babylon will fall. And so then we get to the third angel. And the third angel is going to talk about a warning. Don't take the mark of the beast. So Revelation can be a little scary sometimes. I mean, it's about the end of the world. There are things that are going to happen that are pretty frightening and uh, uh, mostly unheard of. But what we need to realize is that this book is for our good. Revelation is about bringing God justice to this world. And if we are saved as believers, Jesus took our sins and justice for us means that we will live with God forever. We don't deserve that, but that's what Jesus gave to us. So this shouldn't be frightening or we shouldn't get anxious about this because this is something good for us. We should look forward to this day. All right, let's get into this text. So a third angel will arise to make a new announcement. Then another angel, a third one, follow them, saying with a loud voice. Historically, angels frighten humans. And when they yell, I'm pretty sure everyone will stop to listen. What John is saying here is this angel is broadcasting a statement to the whole world. This angel is saying, here, hey, everyone, stop right now. This is what you need to hear. Angels have made people faint before. Angels um, are very frightening, and when they yell, it's going to get everyone's attention, which is exactly what he wanted. And this is what he was saying. The angel warned those tempted to take the mark of the beast. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. This angel is making something pretty clear. The mark of the beast is bad. That's what he's saying. You're going to get tormented forever if you take this mark of the beast. God designed this warning to prevent those as yet unmarked from choosing to worship the Antichrist and as a result, choosing eternal doom. Everyone without exception who receives the mark of the beast will spend eternity in hell. Receiving the mark of the beast is allying yourself with Satan. That is not something we should be doing ever. Satan is the enemy of God and if we receive the mark of the beast, we're on Satan's side now. That's why we would get sent to hell for this. This is something, um, it's bad. This is what this angel is saying in simple words. Mark of the beast is bad. That's what we do need to know. And we can, we can look at that a little more in depth later on. This passage helps provide a time frame for the announcement of the three angels. We determined in Revelation 13 that the false prophet will cause people to take the mark of the beast after the abomination of desolation appears in the temple. So here we can look at a little bit of a time frame when they're talking about this. Since the abomination of desolation will appear at the midpoint of the tribulation, we can conclude that these angels will make their announcements at about the same time. So these three angels we've been talking about will make their announcements at about the midpoint of the tribulation. We can look at Daniel 9.27. Um, yeah, if you want to turn there, I can give you some time. Alright, 
Daniel 9.27 says, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And remember, when we're talking about week, we're talking about seven time periods, seven years. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolated. So this is sort of talking about um, the midpoint and what the, uh, I believe it's talking about what the Antichrist is doing. He's going to put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And then these angels will come during the midpoint of the tribulation. Revelation 14, 10a says, Every person who takes the mark of the beast will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. So something interesting to note is um, the alcohol people drink is not actually mostly alcohol. I believe it's somewhere around 5 or 6% alcohol, um, because if you drink 100%, it's going to kill you. And people who drink alcohol do it to get drunk most of the time. I mean, if you drink too much. Uh, they don't do it to kill themselves. So no one drinks 100%. Receiving 100% of God's wrath is going to do more than that. It's going to do more than kill you. It's going to eternally kill you. And that's not something that's good. That's not something we want. We don't want to take the mark of the beast. That's the main, that's the important part of, that's really the only thing this angel is saying. But it's very important because during the tribulation, people will be very tempted to take the mark of the beast. It's going to be tempting because the Antichrist and Satan and the beast, they're going to, um, the false prophet, not the beast, sorry, yeah. They're going to harm the people who don't take the mark of the beast. You're going to be persecuted if you don't, and it's going to be very hard for you to live if you don't. This is why this angel is saying this, because it's going to be something that's very hard for these people. Everyone who joins the beast will receive a personal share of God's judgment. At the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, most wines were diluted with water. The mention here of full-strength wine means that God's wrath will not be weakened. Unbelievers will receive his wrath in full. And again, his full wrath is being sent to hell. Allying yourself with Satan is an eternally punishable offense. The one who receives the mark of the beast will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Ooh, don't be that person. Also, it's our responsibility to tell others about the hope that Jesus gives us. This is why we do these conferences. We want to tell others about the hope. In the church age right now, you have the chance to be saved. We cannot save you. Only God can save you. But as Paul says, we can plant the seeds and water the seeds. God gives the growth. But God gave to us the job of planting and watering those seeds. And that's what we're doing at these conferences. The judgment will come from a very personal God who has been patient and gracious in the extreme by continually extending his loving offer of salvation to everyone throughout history, including during the tribulation. God has been patient for us because he wants all people to come to repentance. Unfortunately, for those who still reject him during the tribulation and receive the mark of the beast, they don't receive any more of God's patience, patience and grace. Those who become marked with Satan's property will personally bear the results of that decision under the judgment of Christ and his holy angels. This verse indicates that these good angels, who at some point in eternity past chose to follow God rather than Satan, will personally execute this justice. This seems to me to be, to be a bit of poetic justice. These faithful angels who did not leave God execute judgment on the unfaithful angels who did leave God and went with Satan. This same punishment, eternity in the lake of fire, awaits Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. So the unholy trinity that we see here during the tribulation is going to end. That's something very comforting because we know we win. We know God wins. And therefore, we don't have to be worried. We don't have to be scared at all because in the end, God will win. It is interesting to note that all unbelievers of the tribulation will be judged in the presence of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. According to 2 Timothy 4.1, the Lamb will sit in judgment on the great white throne together with the Father in final, or judgment, in final judgment of all unredeemed humankind. We can turn to Psalm 96.13. I'm going to start reading in verse 12. So Psalm 96, verse 12 says, But the field exults and everything in it, 
Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the earth in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. So verse 13 is talking about God who's going to come judge the people. And of course, he's perfectly righteous. He will judge them perfectly. But verse 12 is saying, let the field exult. Let everyone be happy because God is coming to judge. Why David or whoever wrote this psalm is saying this is because as believers, we should be happy because God's justice for us, even though the justice we deserve is eternal death, is not actually what we get because Jesus died for us and rose again. Our justice is living forever with God. That's why we should be happy about this. Amen. Revelation 14, a says, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, a description of the awful eternal judgment waiting all who reject God's salvation, choosing instead to side with his enemies. It says forever and ever. Forever and ever is the strongest expression of eternity in the Greek language. Those who side with the beast will have no second chance to change their mind. They already had many chances. God gave them their whole life until that point to repent. But instead of repenting, they chose to turn to Satan, to ally them with Satan. They flung all of their chances. And at some point, at this point, God is saying, you allied yourself with Satan. That's eternally punishable in hell. Today in the church age, every unbeliever, for as long as he is alive, can change his mind or repent about believing in Christ. God is gracious, not wanting anyone to perish. Now, everyone has the chance to change their mind, a.k.a. repent, about believing in Jesus. We all have the chance, but this chance doesn't last forever. It shouldn't have to. And again, this is why these conferences exist. We are instructing people in the ways of the gospel and giving you the material to instruct others. We are trying to send out the gospel to the whole world as we are instructed to do, as Jesus told us to do, in order to give everyone the chance to hear the gospel. We don't want anyone to come to the tribulation and not hear of the gospel and not, um, not have the chance to believe and then take the mark of Satan and be eternally punished. That's why these conferences exist. That's why we do DMC. We want everyone to hear this gospel. Revelation 14, 11b says, They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast at his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Worshippers of the Antichrist, those who worship the, his image or receive his mark, will find no rest either day or night. Their punishment will continue forever without break. Since their sin was against an eternal and infinite God, their punishment is the same. As people like to say, let the punishment fit the crime. When you sin once, your sin is still against an eternal and infinite God. And therefore, the wages for your sin, as Paul says, is death because your sin was against a perfect and holy God. That's why we need Jesus, because all of us have sinned at least once. All of us have sinned more than that, which means our wages are death. Our wages are eternal death. That's what we deserve. But because Jesus died for us, because he rose again, our wages are not that. And again, that's why we should look at Revelation with hope. We should look with hope towards Jesus' second coming. Revelation 4, 12, and 13. So what will happen to the saints or the saved people, the believers who choose not to receive the mark of the beast or worship him or his image? So now we're more, um, we've sort of gotten past the third angel's, uh, the third angel's warning, and we're going to look at the believers, what's going to happen to them. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep or obey the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. The perseverance of the saints remind us that these tribulation believers will faithfully endure the, to the final days when God will pour out his intense judgment on his enemies. So these tribulation believers will faithfully endure. We can look at Daniel 12, 11 through 12. Daniel 12, 13 is the last um, verse in Daniel, so there are the two verses before that. Daniel 12, 11 says, As from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, 
there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. So I'm not going to do the math to see how long those days, um, how long that day is. But again, these people who arrive, these believers, they will be blessed because they have faithfully endured. And we're going to see a little bit more about this faithful, uh, this persevering. These people will endure faithfully. They will definitely be persecuted, but they will last. Plus, their persecutors will receive divine punishment. Again, everyone who takes the mark of the beast and allies themselves with Satan is going to spend an eternity in hell. And that's sad, but they had their chance. They had their chance to repent. God gave them that chance. God is merciful, but they, they flunked it. They did, not, they, uh, they did not pass the test. Those who persecute tribulation saints will suffer fierce divine punishment during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So again, this could be a little bit more of poetic justice. Those who punish the believers will now get punished by God. These people who persecute tribulation believers are now going to see their own persecution, per se. Because these saints remained under and endured through intense suffering, the Lord's judgment will approve them during the final days of the tribulation. God will save them through it all. We can look at Mark 13:13. 13, 13. All right, Mark 13, 13 says, And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. So these believers who endure will be saved. And um, as a believer, we can never lose our salvation, which means we know these believers, these people who do believe during the tribulation, they will not receive the mark of the beast, and they will endure to the end. Revelation 14, 13, John heard an announcement from heaven that called death a blessing. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So this seems sort of weird. Blessed are all the people who die in the Lord. Like, why are the people who die the blessed ones? Hmm? All right, so even though this seems sort of weird, we can look at um, why, why God is saying this. This announcement will come as a decree. Seven times in the book of Revelation, an announcement come from a voice in heaven. And again, when there's a voice in heaven or when there's an angel shouting to the whole earth, it's so that everyone can hear. They're making sure that everyone knows what is being said. Since the voice will come from heaven, the message must be both urgent and important, which means that this message of this blessing of death is important. And we will see why later on. Since these last days bring unparalleled suffering, these announcements from heaven will bring welcome information to all those standing firm in the Lord. These messages, all these messages are important for the believers still living, and some of them are important for the unbelievers also. Revelation 14, 13a, th um, it's the message, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. God will encourage the saints by telling them that death will be better than life. Believe it or not, this announcement is a form of encouragement. God is telling them that the place that Jesus has prepared for them is far greater than anything on this earth, especially because this earth will be persecuting them greatly. God is actually comforting them with this semi-morbid decree. It seems sort of weird that he's saying blessed is death, but he's giving the believers encouragement because when they die or when they're taken up into heaven, heaven is way better than anything this earth has to offer. Why will death be better? Because Satan will take out his anger and frustration on all Christians and Jews. The dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So again, in the last half of the tribulation, Satan is going to be persecuting these believers greatly because he knows he's on the losing side. He's going to fight like a wild animal. He's called a roaring lion. And when a roaring lion is cornered, that's going to be an even more roaring lion. And that's, um, that's why I'm glad we're raptured before all this happens. 
Why will death be better? Because of Satan's fury and God's severe judgments, the tribulation will be the most dangerous and challenging time in history for believers. For him, death will be obvious gain. We can look at Philippians 1, 21. Here, Paul was talking about to, um, how for him to die is gain because he knows that God is preparing a place for us. Jesus is preparing a home for us, which is better than this earth. So Philippians 1, 21 says, for, to me, for it to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's just a short sentence, but what it's saying is to live is Christ. To live as a believer is, um, is Christ. Is to, be, is to be a believer is to share the gospel as Christ told us to do. But if we die, then we go to heaven to live with Jesus, to live with God. And that's something that's even better. So here on this earth, we shouldn't be wanting to live in this earth. We should be wanting to live as Christ commanded us to do which is actually doing this DM2 conference, which is sharing the gospel with other people, making disciples. And then when we die, we go to heaven and we can live with God. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be of this world. That's not in those two um, parts of our life, parts of what our life should be. We shouldn't live of this world. We shouldn't try to do the things of this world as Romans talks about. We should live at, um, and do what Christ commanded us to do and then we die, we go to heaven. That's like the perfect life of a believer. Revelation 14, 13b says, From now on is yet another phrase that helps us understand, or is talking about that verse, um, that this verse refers to the midpoint of the tribulation when the persecution of believers will increase to all-time evil levels. It will be hard. The tribulation will be trying. But we shouldn't fear, as our God will bring all believers through to heaven, whether we live before the tribulation or during the tribulation. Either way, we are going to go to heaven as a believer. Why does God give such a morbid blessing of death? It seems, um, we already looked at the reason, but even, even if we understand the reason, it still seems a little bit weird that there's such a blessing of this death. So that they may rest from their labors. Death will bring the believer rest from his intense, unending pains and persecutions. Death will bring the believer from being tortured to living with God. I mean, that seems like a, pretty good thing to me. For their deeds follow with them. Believers' good works, those done in the power of the Holy Spirit, won't stay on earth but will go with them to heaven. At the judgment just before the beginning of the millennial kingdom, God will evaluate and reward their service to him. See, our good works won't just stay on earth. They don't save us. Salvation is only through what Jesus has already done for us. They do nothing to justify us, but they are part of our sanctification. Our good works um, in Christ do help us grow. And in heaven, we will get rewards for them. I really like gummy bears. I will do a lot for gummy bears um, because they almost seem like a reward for me. They're just, they're so good. I have some in my backpack right now. When we do something good, that good deed glorifies God since we are his children. Therefore, he will reward us for that. It's going to be a lot better than gummy bears. I mean, if God gives me heavenly gummy bears or something, I'm going to be really happy. But there's probably something a lot better in heaven than gummy bears. Um, it's going to make gummy bears look like trash, which is hard. But in heaven, that's what's going to happen. So let's, um, let's look at what we have seen. We first talked about the third angel and how the angel is saying, don't receive the mark of the, um, of the beast because that's an eternally punishable offense. And then we looked at the believers What's going to happen to the believers here? They will be persecuted. They will suffer a lot. But in the end, they know they will go to heaven and they can be comforted by that. All right, let's close out with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you that I have the opportunity to teach here and that even though I am not very good at teaching, you give me the strength to teach and you help me. I thank you for this DM2 conference. Um, not a lot of people in this world have the chance to do this conference. So I pray that with the materials that this conference teaches, we can spread the gospel more effectively to other believers. I pray for the rest of this day that we would be safe and get to learn a lot. In your name, amen. All right.
Uh-oh. Stop. All right, let's uh, make our way back. Merry New Year to everybody. Oh, I'm sorry, Happy New Year, right? Uh, yeah. And the first morning of the new year is almost over. In about a year, we'll be saying, wow, the year is almost over. We're getting ready to continue in chapter 14 here with the final part of the encouraging messages that John is given by these angels that are designed not only for him to keep going, but also imagine those that are will be in the middle of the tribulation, what they will need in order to keep going. To get started, I was reminded last night as I was listening to all the testimonies and the sharings, and um, I was reminded how preachers and pastors can be wrong. Brett and I were coming back from a Sierra Leone trip, was it 2011, I guess, October 2011, and uh, we just talked about possibility of doing a U.S. Uh, DM2 conference. Neither one of us really thought it could take off, I guess. And then Brett went to his, his board, and the board was, was for it. And again, Brett and I, were, we're, we're, we're uh, pessimists. Uh, maybe me more than Brett. But, <laughs> but when he came back, we t- I think we had lunch. I don't know if you remember, we had lunch at the barbecue place, I think. And, uh, uh, we talked about it, and I remember Brett saying, well, we're going to try it, and at least we can say uh, we gave America a chance. <coughs> and now, as it was pointed out last night, it's not just a chance, but it's great hope. And I'm just so happy for the new year. That's what it is. <laughs> it, about to make myself cry. All right, well, that's enough of that. But, but I was really moved last night by everybody's testimonies and sharings. We really appreciate it. And the reason I want to bring up preachers being wrong is because we're going to do kind of a counter uh, point going on here in this section. And I'll explain why as we get into that. But let's read through this section here, verses 14 through 20, and then we'll open in prayer. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle, and gather the cluster from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle, a lot of sickle swinging going around in this, (laughs) in the earth, and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. This is a very violent section uh, that we're getting into, and so let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before your throne of grace. It's grateful that we can do so through our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's through him that all things are possible. It's through him that we can approach your throne of grace at any time to find help in the time of need and father we are in need anytime we break open your word and read it and study it we're grateful that you've given us God the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide and we ask that he will guide us in our understanding this morning and guard us from error and help us to recognize the things that we need to understand so that we can apply what we need to apply and you be glorified in our lives for us in Christ's name we pray amen so, as I've said, I look at the book of Revelation like a DVD as John's watching the DVD, writing down what he saw, what he heard, and then there's the special features. And we are in the special feature section of John's Revelation here, Revelation 10 through 14. And this serves as more details for the events. And so let's, let's get a big bird's eye view before we dig down into this 
very violent event that takes place. So Revelation 10 through 14, in different parts of the special features, spans the entire tribulation period to one point or another. If we'll do it in chronological order of the books, chapter 10 happens really at the midpoint. As John is in need of encouraging, and this encouraging angel, this big strong angel with the rainbow head, steps and puts one foot on the earth, one foot in the sea, and makes his announcement, gives John that little book to eat and continue to prophesy. And that's an encouraging message for him. And then it jumps us back into the beginning of the tribulation period with the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, as we have the two witnesses that testify to the testimony of Jesus Christ in the temple area. They're the protectors for the temple during that first three and a half years, which seems to tell us that there's an attempt to destroy things before the actual midpoint takes place. Revelation 12, we've, been, we've already studied this week, the Revelation 11 and 10 last year. In Revelation 12 with the great sign of the woman who is Israel, who gives birth to Messiah, and then, of course, the dragon, which is Satan. That even takes us back beyond or before the tribulation, at least going all the way back to the time of Abraham, if we want to push it to the Abrahamic covenant. Then chapter 13, which we saw yesterday a good bit of, where we have the beast that comes out of the sea. We also have the beast that comes out of the earth, the beast out of the sea being the Antichrist, the beast out of the earth being the false prophet. These come to a, a prominence at the midpoint. The Antichrist is there at the beginning. So is the false prophet, by the way. There are many false prophets. As Jesus says, there are going to be many of them coming. But then there's one that rises to prominence in connection with the beast, the Antichrist. And so, again, special features with more details of that. And now we're in Revelation 14, the last part of this special feature section, really, because in chapter 15, things are going to pick up more chronologically. And we're looking at the last of these encouraging messages. So... I don't know exactly what page, and my manual is a little different from yours, but uh, wherever we're, okay, page 37. It's Revelation 14, 14 through 20, the third scene. The scene changes this chapter, describes two harvests. The first reaps grain, while the second reaps grapes. So we're going to be looking at these two separate harvests, and who is doing the harvesting. And that brings us to a kind of a conundrum because there's a great deal of difference of opinions within like-minded preachers and pastors and Bible teachers on this passage. I'll put a picture up. Anybody know this, who this man is? If you do, if I had a bag of chocolate coins, I'd give it to you, the whole bag. This man is known as, Andrew, you don't count. This man is known, <laughs> known as Clarence Larkin. Clarence Larkin is one of the older dispensationalists of the, now the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. And he was an engineer, and he charted everything. Here's one of his charts on the book of Revelation. Uh, he has a book called Dispensational Truth. You can still get these things, and, and they're excellent reads, excellent charts. It's just you've got to have a magnifying glass to look at the thing. I mean, it's very small, so you've got to blow it up to take a look at it. But you can see where the seal judgments are. Uh, we've got seven churches of seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl judgments. For the most part, Clarence Larkin follows pretty much exactly what we've been looking at, or maybe we follow the way he lays it out. Now, he has a, pardon? Was he a Christian? Yes, sir. Okay. Very much so. Love the Lord. I, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. And this right here, the age of ages, that's a, a kind of a unique thing with him, but uh, regardless, this is one of his charts. What about this man? Some of you may be more familiar with this man. Oh, yeah. Um. Uh, I, I don't know. All right, too late. <laughs> this is Dr. John Walward. Okay. Dr. John Walward was uh, president of Dallas Theological Seminary, another great Bible teacher, and prophecy was his thing. Prophecy was Clarence, Lar Clarence Larkin's thing. Now, I'm hoping some of you going to know who this is. All right, Andy, I have no chocolate for you, though, but uh, Andy Woods. Uh, Andy is a uh, pr uh, pastor of Sugarland Bible Church here in Texas, and he's also the, the president of Schaefer Theological Seminary. But Andy's also, prophecy is one of his things. Matter, matter of fact, when we get into Revelation 17 and 18, that's what Andy wrote his thesis on at Dallas is on Babylon, and so we're going to be getting into that. 
You say, why do you put these men up? Well, these men have a lot of things in common. All three of these men love the Lord. It seems like I know all of them because I've read all their books. I know Andy well, but it seems like I know the other two because I've read the, their books. It's almost like also I know Moses because I've spent so much time reading about his life in Scripture. You kind of get to thinking you know somebody because you look at what they wrote. And I know that all three of these men love the Lord. All three of these men also love to teach the Word of God and attempt to apply consistently a literal hermeneutic, a literal interpretation of the text of Scripture. And also, all three of these men disagree on things in Revelation. And they disagree with what we're about to go into here in Revelation 14. And what I want to do with that is, because of many things I heard last night, I know in my own, own experience of my young life, I had doubts because I heard a different opinions or teachings in different parts of scripture and it made me think well who, who's going to be able to know what's what's right if you got all these different people who's supposed to know what's right saying different things and there's a there's a difference between that which in those disagreements that which is essential and non-essential doctrines okay essential and non-essential doctrines the gospel for example is an essential doctrine okay We've already seen 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made Him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might have the righteousness of God in Him. These are essentials. They're not up for debate. And the reason why we can say that is because there's so many passages of Scripture that deal with it. Now, Here's a non-essential. What Jesus wrote on the ground in John 8, 6 through 8 is a non-essential. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The woman caught in adultery, and they bring, which she, she, they bring her by herself, which is odd. And because to be caught in adultery, there would need to be someone else. And they just bring the woman. And they accuse her of adultery, and they say to the Lord, Lord, it says in the, in the law that she's to be stoned. What do you say? And he's just drawing on the ground, text says. You'd be surprised what's written about what he drew on the ground. You can make churches out of what's written about what's drawn on the ground. If we needed to know what Jesus was drawing on the ground, we would have been told what was drawn on the ground. I think it's more he's just ignoring them, is my opinion. We don't need to know what, what's going on on that deal. That's a non-essential. All right, so let's take a test. When did Satan lead one-third of the angels in rebellion against God? Is this an essential or non-essential doctrine? If you say non-essential, raise your hand. Let's get commits. If you say essential, raise your hand. All right, what's the key question here? What's the key term in the question? When. All right, give me a passage of Scripture that tells us when. All right, see, this is a non-essential this is a non-essential. Now, there's a lot of debate over when he fell. You could put it before the creation of man. You could put it before the creation of day, in day four. You could put it many places. You have to have it, though, before what? Before Genesis 3. You have to have it before the fall of man. Okay? But it's a non-essential. So now let's take another quick test. Does Satan exist, and did he lead a rebellion against God? Essential or non-essential? That is essential. Okay, you've got to have this. Now, what's the difference between these two things? The first one, where's the text? Where's the scripture? It tells us, boom, there's when it happened. The second one, we've got many texts of scripture. Okay, that's going to be where you determine what's an essential and non-essential. Okay, that's going to be what's going to help us recognize. And on these non-essentials, sometimes... There's going to be differences of opinion. And so we're going to get into that, and I'm going to, I'm going to present what we've got here along with what Dr. Walbert and Dr. Woods and, and Dr. Larkin held. And you can weigh it out for yourself. But what I want you to understand is just because good men disagree does not mean we doubt the Word of God. That's what I want you to come away with. Because when it boils down to the end of this, the essentials are going to be the same for all in this, for all four that we're looking at, okay? So... The ripe harvest, this is part of the essentials of this. 
We know that the judge of the world will do right. The judge of the world is God. We know this. We have passage after passage after passage that the judge of the world, God, will do right. This is what Abraham says when God comes to him, Jesus Christ comes to him, says he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's a little worried about Lot and doesn't want Lot destroyed. And he says, will not the judge of the world do right? He puts it forth in a rhetorical question. And the answer to that is absolutely God will do right. He will do justice. The time to bring judgment on evil and the earth dwellers arrive at the end of the tribulation. That's what this is about. In the big pictures of things, that's what this passage is about. That's an essential. The final scene of the special feature section, Revelation 14, focuses on the ripe harvest. Regardless of how you see the harvest, the harvests are ripe. And the end game, the end result is the same. So these are essentials that there's going to be no differences of opinion on. But there, when we get into the weeds and get into the details, that's where there's going to be a little differences because there's a lot of scripture that can put bearing on this passage. And it kind of goes, you've got to look at the balance of it. Okay, So that's what we're going to try to do. So first John saw someone who looked like a man. Question that's asked, is this Jesus? It says, then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man. The verse does not say that this was Christ, but that he was like a son of man or a human being rather than like an angel. Now the word homios for, for uh, or homo as we have it here, uh, like just means a, a simile. Remember he is like the lamb that is slain in Revelation 5, Jesus is. Here, maybe it is Christ, maybe it is not. Since the whole tribulation is under the direct control of the Lord Jesus Christ, the mastermind who severely disciplines both rebellious Israel and proud humanity, this reaper is unmistakably under his control also. And that is built from who has the seven sealed scroll? Christ has it. And so there's a very strong uh, textual argument for that to be Jesus Christ here because or not th that this is an angel, not Jesus Christ, because he's in control of the events, and, not, um, and the angels are not. Although the reaper resembles a son of man, looks human, he is not the son of man, rather he is an angel who represents Christ. Now this is built, note the underline of the letter A, there is no definite article in the Greek in this passage. But Greek articles work a little different than our articles. So an argument from the other side would be, that the absence of the article actually em emphasizes the def definiteness of this as the Son of Man, even though it doesn't have to say technically the Son of Man. And that's built from Daniel 7.13. Daniel 7.13 is the first time we see the phrase Son of Man applied to Jesus Christ. And that's when Dan we saw that yesterday in my section when Daniel was saw the throne room scene. We couldn't focus on it until the Antichrist was pulled out of the way, a little horn was removed. And that's when the Son of Man came up to the Ancient of Days. And that's where the title comes from. And it was the favorite title, by the way, of Jesus Christ. He uses it over a hundred times to refer to himself in the Gospels. First, in Revelation 10, a strong angel represented Christ. He held a scroll in his hand and he stood with one foot on the land and the other on the seas. That was the angel we were talking about earlier that gives John encouragement. Verse 15 says, And another angel came out of the temple. Therefore, this one sitting on the cloud was also an angel, though he had a human appearance. And again, that is a possible understanding, but uh, you have to look at what you might have as a control factor in the text. From the other men that I put up there, the control factor for them is the phrase, Son of Man. The phrase, Son of Man, is only used one other time in the book of Revelation. Let's look at it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1. And by the way, it's no article, and it uses the same word like. Revelation 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. And we could keep reading, but who is this? Yeah, there's no debating on that one. That was pretty much an essential in, in this sense. So that becomes a controlling factor for some when they interpret this passage. For others, the controlling factor are other things. 
we're only going to look at two two positions here the one here and the one held by some of these men from the well andy's not in the past i hope andy's not in the past <laughs> so we're going to look at those men that hold a different position this one like a son of man wore a victor's crown stephanon not the royal crown diameta christ will wear when he returns now that's when when the diadem that he wears at the second coming uh, Revelation 19, I don't want to take away from it by section, but when we look at that, that's what we'll see. He's wearing the diadema. Here, the Stephanos, if, if it is the Son of Man, it is, if it is Jesus Christ, it's just emphasizing his victory. If it is an angel, then he is a victorious angel. He's going to be one who's going to have victory on the earth going out for the reaping that's taking place. Christ will return with the clouds, note plural, not sitting on a cloud, singular. Note also that this phrase does not specify white clouds. Now in Matthew 24, which is the reference there, uh, with coming on the clouds as well as some of those others, he, it just says coming on the clouds. They're not said to be white when he comes on the clouds. And if this is an angel sitting on, on, on the cloud, again, the, the emphasis on white is on purity. And the angel in Revelation 10, he has a cloud, but there's no white associated with it. So that could be an argument in, in the other direction, that the, the whiteness with purity actually emphasizes the Son of Man being Jesus. And at the same time, Jesus does not sit on a cloud that we know of. He comes actually sitting on what? A horse, a white horse, probably with clouds around him. You can just imagine, because clouds in Scripture are often associated with the glory of God. And the presence of God. And so as Jesus Christ comes to the, to the earth, he's coming riding on the white horse. And he's coming with the clouds, his presence coming forth on the earth. When Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, he will be seated on a white horse, not a white cloud. He will not return with a sickle for harvest, but with a sword for war. And again, that is absolutely what we find in Revelation 19. And that's not what we find here. Although one would argue from the other side that the reaping, when the Son of Man is given the order to reap, then he goes with his angels to reap, and they do the reaping, and he does the slaughtering, in the sense, with the sword. Again, just the counter-argument with that. According to Matthew 13, 47-48, just before Jesus Christ returns, he as Lord will issue the command to harvest, but angels will do the harvesting. And let's go to that passage there real quick in Matthew 13. These are called the kingdom parables in Matthew 13. And it's about the, the postponement of the kingdom. It's called the mystery form because it was part of the kingdom that was unrevealed in the Old Testament. And as the mystery form, it, it's a little difficult, but it's not about the church. This will make that clear. These things aren't about the church in Matthew 13. These things are about the coming of Christ with the uh, regeneration of Israel. So Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish in the containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the reaping of the earth, and, and these harvests are going to be related to these parables that deal with that. And so the sickle that's given to the angel, the sickle that the one like the Son of Man has, note it often is called a sharp sickle. You notice that? It's not a pop sickle, it's a sharp sickle. And the sharpness means the severity of the judgment. It's going to be very severe, very violent. Violent deaths being brought about as Jesus Christ runs up the wine press from Basra up to Megiddo and the Mount of Olives just slaughtering the armies of the Antichrist. And angels are going to be involved in this in some way as well. Having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Again, the severity of the judgment, the sharpness of the sickle. This passage is the only one in scripture in which an angel wears a victor's crown. Which, by the other side, would be an argument against it being an angel, just so you know. Again, the controlling factor is, what do you do with the phrase, Son of Man? And if you take the Son of Man to be only reference to Jesus Christ, that's going to control your interpretation through the rest of the passage. 
If you take it as not, that's going to control your interpretation for the rest of the passage. So just keep that in mind. Again, good men differ on this. And they're not differing because they just want to be argumentative. They are actually wrestling with the details of the text honestly. There are certain things in Scripture that are a bit ambiguous. I may have said this yesterday. But what they are there, when, when we find those things, it should keep us going back, reading the Scripture, studying deeper, and finding where these things fall into place. Right now I'm teaching Revelation back home. We're in it for about 170 hours now. I'm getting ready to start Revelation 17. And as a result, this is the first time I've been able to really dig down in some places where I've never been able to dig down before. And as a result, some of my positions have changed based on that digging down that I had taught in the past. That's the trouble about writing something. When you write something and you come back later, you, you change your mind. Well, you've already got it in print, you know. <laughs> right? When we wrote the Life of Christ curriculum, um, there's a number of things in there that I go back and read and go, Ugh, why did I write that? <laughs> you know, so that happens. But, but it should. If your teaching is the same in 10 years as it is today, Where's the growth? See, there should be growth. There should, now, we're not talking about change into a false gospel. That's not, that, not that kind of change. I'm talking about the change where you can see development and growth in the teaching. You see, that should be happening as we continue to study. We should get clearer and clearer in our picture as we study these things. A crown is not normal attire for angels, and that's true. Probably in the vision, the angel wears a crown as part of his costume as a visual aid to portray God's ultimate victory. And again, you take that as an angel that fits within other things we know in Scripture. He's wearing the victor's crown. The angel is not a grim reaper, but rather a joyous harvester who goes forth in victory to gather the wheat, believers, into safety from among the tares, the weeds, unbelievers, before the final judgment. And note Matthew 13, that's another one of the mystery parables. For the sake of time, we won't go to check that out, but that's what the mystery parables deal with of the kingdom, is the time frame from when Israel rejected the kingdom by rejecting Messiah to the time frame of when Christ comes at the end of the tribulation based upon Israel's acceptance of Jesus as Messiah. Now, in between there... We have the rest of the ministry of Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, 40, 40 days uh, after the resurrection to the ascension, and we got 10 days from ascension to Pentecost, the church age, the rapture, the tribulation. We've got all that in the mystery time frame. Okay? That all fits in to that. So it's not just the churches within that, but those parables are not about the church. It's about the end when the kingdom comes, when, or right before the kingdom comes. So let's look at a summary of the one like of Son of Man. And these are essentials. These, these are, no matter which way you go with who the He is sitting on the cloud, these things are true. doesn't matter if the, if the He is Christ or an angel. Since He will be on a cloud, He will have a superior perspective for harvesting. He's got a divine perspective. He, we have that perspective. As believers in Christ, identified in Christ, we are to have a mindset on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand. And because we are identified in Him, God the Father sees us seated at the right hand. And that ought to have an impact on the way you live, realizing that you're seated right there next to God the Father in Christ. So we're to have the mindset on the things above, and that gives us a perspective. You know, often we'll... we'll uh, I'll hear, I say goodbye to people, will say something to the fact, keep looking up. And what we're referring to is keep looking for Christ. But you know, there's kind of another way of saying keep looking down. Keep looking down from your identification perspective because that gives you the view of the circumstances of this life from God's perspective because that's the perspective we're supposed to have that we get from Scripture. So this angel or Christ, whoever it is, sitting on the cloud has the divine perspective of the events going on on earth. Which, by the way, is why the special features are given. If you notice, the special features always come after a series of the judgments. The seal judgments, chapter 7, special features. Trumpet judgments, chapters 10 through 14, special features. Bowl judgments, chapter 17 through 20, verse 3, special features. And the reason why is... 
Because when John's seeing all of these judgments, it would be easy to get off perspective. But the special features give us the divine perspective of why these things have to happen. And they're being done for John. John writes them down for us, for us to get the same perspective. The gold crown, Stephanos, on his head shows he will be victorious as he harvests. Again, regardless who the he is, this is true. We're going to come to the same conclusion. It's just we dicker over who's actually sitting on the cloud. And, that, you know, is that essential or non-essential? It's a non-essential. You know, I wouldn't make a church over who's sitting on the white cloud. Okay? Now, I might argue one or the other, but I'm not going to break fellowship over that. Now, if you're going to say the one sitting on the cloud is Satan, now we might have an issue, okay? But there's no textual support for that. The sharp sickle will allow him to reap with precision. It's the sharpness, the severity, the precision. He won't mistakenly gather a few unbelievers or neglect to secure believers. He's, going to not, he's not going to make any mistakes. It's like in the bold judgments when those hailstones are falling, they're falling on earth dwellers. Precise hits, precise targets on the earth. Just like when the the plagues of Egypt, there, when it was all darkness in Egypt, darkness that could be felt. How, how do you feel darkness? That had to be scary. I mean, it's bad enough just being scared of the dark, but imagine you could feel the dark. But in Goshen, it was light. And so if, it's almost like if you had a dividing line, here I'm in the dark, and here, well, maybe here I'm in the light, and, and, and over here in the light... But you step over here, it's a darkness that can be felt. You just cross the line into Goshen, you're an Israelite. Over here, you're an Egyptian in the dark. It's a precision judgment. It's the same thing going to be during the tribulation. At this point, John saw another angel come forth from the temple with specific instructions for the angel on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the angel's coming out of the temple. And this is very important because he's coming out of the temple where who is? God the Father for certain, okay, sitting on the throne. He's giving orders. We see that later on in chapter 16. So this angel's coming out, and another angel indicates that the one like a son of man in the previous verse was an angel also. Again, the controlling factor is what you do with the son of man there, and that would be the case if it is an angel. But the other side would argue that the angel is coming with orders from God the Father to give it to the son and saying, son, it's time to go reap which would mean the angel isn't actually the authority. The authority is being brought from God the Father. So there's another position to look at that. Came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap. Now, hold your finger here. and Let's look back at Revelation eleven nineteen. This is a rather interesting thing here, I think. The last time we saw the temple opened was right here. Revelation eleven nineteen. 19, And the temple of God which is in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Now skip over to 15, verse 5. 15, verse 5. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around with their chests with golden sashes. So you could read from Revelation eleven nineteen, skip over to Revelation 15, 5, and it flows. And you wouldn't miss a thing as far as the flow of the content. But boy, look at what we're missing from the special features. See, that would be where you're watching the movie, and that pop-up comes up. You've got one of those smarter-than-I-am TVs, and that pop-up comes up and says, if you want to know more about this, click the special features. You could say, I want to watch that now. Or you say, well, I'd rather watch that later. And that's kind of how that works. Because you can read Revelation that way. If you just skip the special feature sections, man, it, it reads fast and it reads quick. And then go back in and watch the special features. But the point is, the last time we saw the temple, it was open. And the next main event that happens is the bowl judgments, chronologically. But within that, we're getting more details about how that gets carried out. And that's the reaping that's happening here. That's why... This, with this connection with the temple, the order is coming out from the temple from God the Father. Since Christ does not take orders from his angels, the one sitting on the cloud cannot be Christ. Again, depending on how you deal with the phrase Son of Man. 
the contrary, Christ issues orders to angels who, unlike us, too often immediately obey him. Who, unlike us, too often, they obey, we don't, as, or we don't right away. Slow obedience. We're often slow, slow obedient. You know, I like the term slow obedience. I use that at home a lot. You know, hey, we'll go, no, no need to go down that trail. All right. The word ripe. Exoronte actually means dry or withered, indicating that the angel's harvesting is far past due. This is the ripeness of the harvest that's coming. This word is really almost in a sense, uh, it's not normally used in a good sense. Uh, and it connotes usually more an unproductive character of humanity. And that's definitely going to be the last harvest, but not necessarily this first one. In every other place in the Bible, the Greek word exernate is translated as withered or dried up. So it's just past the point. And what it is is now the time for good and evil to grow side by side is over. The, the harvest is overripe for the evil to be separated from the good. And that's what's about to happen in this passage. The same word exernate describes the Euphrates River as dried up. You see that later with the drying up of the Euphrates. This word shows that the harvest could have begun long before, therefore the grain, all tribulation believers, is in danger of being lost or spoiled. So again, the long age of Jesus' central teaching on the kingdom at hand, drawing near that has been postponed, that period of the mystery is about to end and the Reaping to establish the kingdom is about to take place. Many passages to go to, we just don't have the time. A good harvest is the subject. Here, not the text, not the next harvest, a bad one that another angel will reap. So we've got a, we've got two different harvests. Now, some will take a position that both are bad. Here, we've got a position of one good and one bad. But in the end, we're going to have the same results. Again, that's a non-essential as far as which way you go with it. This harvest cannot be the rapture of the church. Now, that's an essential because angels do the work, not Christ. Christ himself will initiate the rapture and only for the church. Further, the rapture will occur before the tribulation. So this is not the, the getting of the church out of here before the tribulation. As some do interpret some of the mystery parables. That's not what's happening here. This good harvest is of living tribulation saints, those who neither choose to worship the beast nor take his mark. Let's go to Matthew 24 just for a second with that. Matthew 24, 31. Because this is a very strong passage here to argue that the Son of Man is an angel here in Revelation 14. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. That was Matthew 24, 31. And so the Son of Man directing the angels. Uh, or the, I'm sorry, Jesus Christ directing the angels, which this one here, the Son of Man, may be one of those. The harvest will occur at the end of the tribulation, immediately before Christ's return. There is an aspect of where they may coincide, because when we get to the bottom here with the uh, striking of the, uh, the blood to the horse's bridle, that's Revelation 19. Jesus Christ is involved in that slaughter of the wine press which is the, the path that he takes when he comes and puts an end to the Armageddon campaign. At that time, God will send forth his angels and gather his saints from the four corners of the earth to be protected and included in the kingdom. Wheat versus the tares. Again, you have all those references there. Those are the kingdom parables. We looked at a part of some of those. And then Matthew 24 and 25 is the Olivet Discourse. Again, not about the church. So you just need to read through those and, and dig with the details. And look at the details. God will begin removing the tares, unbelievers, through the judgments of the entire tribulation. Because it's on the earth dwellers, remember? The seal judgments, the, the time of testing that's about to come on those who dwell on the earth, we learn in Revelation 3. And that's not that there won't be saints killed, but the primary judgments are aimed at those who are in rebellion against God. So many will be killed. We've got over a third killed in one, one plague. 
This description is not of the second advent, but of the ingathering of the saved from among unbelieving Jews and Gentiles shortly before Christ returns. And it's sort of like, in some of this, is when you're trying to think about your salvation. When we believe in Christ, we are regenerated. We are indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by God the Holy Spirit. We are identified in Christ with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are gifted by the Holy Spirit. All these things happen to us. What order do they happen in? You'd be surprised what's written about the order of how these things take place. It doesn't really matter. It happens all kind of at once. That's a non-essential as far as the order. The fact is they happen. And another essential is, where's the passage about being ungifted, unregenerated, unsealed, unindwelt? unidentified you can't lose those things that's your security again the double fisted in the hand of God you cannot lose it you can't be unregenerated well in some of these passages dealing with the coming of Christ and the events just before it or right around it trying to figure out which one happens first and in the order is important but it's just a non-essential the key is it's going to happen and when it's over we'll look back and go oh that's we were all wrong. <laughs> we'll look back and go, oh, that's what that was. The, the horse was a, wasn't a horse. It was an angel. That it, was, it just looked like a horse or angel. We know angels have, we know they have heads of a, of a calf and an eagle, so maybe they have a head of a horse, and that's what it looks like to John. I don't, I don't know. I know I want to have one. As a church age saint, we're going to have one because we're the armies coming in from behind. Anyway, I don't want to steal somebody else's. That, that's it's exciting stuff, though. It could happen today as far as getting and going and getting cleaned up to get on our horse seven years later you know. anyway I digress Jesus predicted that a harvest of believers would occur shortly before he returns in full battle armor to pour out God's vengeance so they're going to happen and it could happen so fast that it's, it looks like just one event again these are details that have to be thought through and worked out at the second harvest a second angel reaper will reap grapes and gather them for trampling not for storage as with a grain or of the, of the first harvest. So again, there's a distinction being made, a good harvest being the first one and a bad harvest being the second one. Again, there are differences of interpreting on some of those. Yet another angel came out of the temple in heaven. This one carried a sharp sickle. There's another sharp sickle getting ready to be swung in this event. So he's got the authority from the command of God to do the reaping, the wrath reaping that goes on here. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar. Now perhaps this angel, as he's coming out from the altar, has the prayers of the saints for centuries, millennia, that have been prayed for the wrath of God to come on and bring justice. And it's being connected with the altar, the altar of incense, which symbolizes prayer, that's very, very uh, close to what could be going on. Take that with Revelation 8.3, you have the same thing. Another angel tells the sickle angel that the time to harvest has come. Because this angel has power over fire, we know he is a judgment-bearing angel. And it's very well probably the baptism of fire that John speaks of. When he tells the Pharisees, you know, he, he has a way of making friends. He calls them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath of come? You know, he, he doesn't care for them too much. And he says, I baptize with water, but there's one coming who's Sandal I am not worthy to untie. He baptizes you with spirit and fire. And this is the fire baptism. This angel of judgment comes out from the altar. Initially the sounds of martyr tribulation saints crying out to God for vengeance will be housed under the altar in heaven. Look back at that at Revelation 6. I know that was last year when y'all studied this. So let's remind ourselves of the fifth seal here. In Revelation 6, verse 9, when the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ, broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Now, these have to be believers after the tribulation. These are tribulation martyrs, tribulation saints. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth, the earth dwellers? They're calling for justice. And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. Note, 
until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So they've got to wait for more martyrs to show up. So they're told to just hang out until the time comes and it will happen. But this is a prayer and it may fit with uh, the other prayers that go along with that that have been, again, throughout the centuries. Having endured the cries of anguish from these tribulation martyrs, this angel will be pleased to issue the command to harvest the grapes, the unbelievers, from the vines of the earth, a harvest of death and destruction. It's kind of like when Christ comes to have lunch with Abraham, and he's got two of his angel buddies with him, and they eat lunch, and they start to head off, and the angels go away, and then Jesus talks to, he's the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, angel of the Lord, talking to Abraham. But then the two angels get to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they tell Lot, hey, uh, we're going to destroy this place. You got to over after the night's over, and you got to get out of here. We got to get you out of here. And Lot doesn't want to go. He said, well, can I make coffee first? You know, hit the Keurig button and then uh, go around and pack some things up. And they're, no, they're in a hurry. These angels are in a hurry because I think they're excited to nuke the place because <laughs> that's what they're going to do. And you get the impression this angel's the same way. All right, about time. I've been holding that sickle long enough. I'm ready to go and use the thing. You get that impression sometimes because the angels who dwell in the presence of God and see His holiness all the time and see us violating it all the time, you get the impression the angels are ready for, to see God's justice carried out. And they get to play that role in the book of Revelation. And they're involved in a lot of these things. This is fascinating stuff. It's better than the Avengers. And he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the loud voice of authority issues this command. This judgment angel will instruct the second reaper angel to use his sharp sickle to harvest from the earth a cluster of ripe grapes. These are the unbelievers. And there are three key Old Testament passages. We're not going to go to them. I want you to write them down, if you write things down. Joel 3... 12 through 16, and I may go to that one while we write down the others. That's Joel 3, 12 through 16, Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, and Jeremiah 25, 30 and 31. I'm going to read Joel 3 to you. Joel 3, verse 12. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That's around Jerusalem. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come and tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. That passage is what's happening there in Revelation 14. And those other passages correlate with that. So you put, again, I'll give them to you, Joel 3, 12 through 16, Isaiah 63, 1 through 4, Jeremiah 25, 30 through 31. These passages how high bearing here on what we're looking at in Revelation 14. Here the Greek word ripe, it's a different word, akmazo is different from the word used in the good harvest. This one means to flourish or be in one's prime. So a change of words can often indicate a change of harvest or a change of what's going on. Sometimes it's also um, emphasizing just a different emphasis in the same thing that may be taking place. You've got to make a decision. Through their continual rebellion against God, these tribulation unbelievers will be ripe for final judgment. The wine press is ready. When grapes are harvested with one swing of a sickle, the vine is also destroyed. You're not coming back next year to grow more grapes. The whole thing is taken. So it's over. Grapes are usually picked by hand, not with a sickle. I used to make this argument with my granddaddy about butter beans. My grand, I was raised by my grandparents, and uh, he loved butter beans. And, man, we would sit there, and I had made me out of seed on a five-gallon bucket so I could sit down and pick those things off of there. And we'd fill them up. We'd do like four or five pickings. And so I asked Granddaddy one year, I said, how many rows, how many pickings are we going to get off these butter beans? And he said, well, four. We'll get four good ones. I said, well, why don't we plant four more extra rows? 
In other words, let's plant extra rows for, uh, to get four full pickings, and when they're all full, let's just rip them up and go sit under the shade tree and pick them off. The problem is what? No more butter beans. Once you pick them up, uproot them, it's over. You can't grow anymore off of them. That was his argument back to me. I didn't know it was a biblical argument um, at the time. But that's what happens. When you cut the vine, you destroy the source of life. There's no more grapes coming from this. And that is the picture of the judgment coming. This judgment will show no thought or concern for the vine, the planet. You know, it's a, there's a great deal of emphasis that the earth dwellers are worshiping the nature, creation. And God's destroying it before their very eyes, and yet they keep worshiping. They're worshiping demons. And they worship demons right after the demon army just killed a third of them. And they keep on worshiping the demons. This is the judgment. This is why the judgment must come. The second reaper's response will be immediate. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So the angel swung with one furious, swung his sickle to the earth with one furious swing. This angel will cut all the grapes from the vine of the earth and gathered the clusters, although Christ will do the pressing. Very key passage. Angels will bring the nations together. Let's go to Zechariah. Well, you don't have to go there. I just want to read it to you real quick. Zechariah, I'm going to be talking about that more later when we're dealing with Babylon, but in Zechariah, a lot of, a lot of white space in Revelation is filled in by Zechariah and Daniel. In Zechariah 14, verse 2, For I, God says, will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on the day of battle. So the, the angels will get the grapes together. They're going to reap them, put them in the press, and then Jesus Christ comes through and presses them from Basra all the way north to the Mount to the Gido, Megiddo and all the way back to the Mount of Olives. And threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God. The word throw, ebalon, eris active indicative, means to throw with great force. And the eris tense emphasizes the action taking place, being the emphasis that it will happen. It's seen here as a completed action, but it hasn't happened yet. But it's viewed as so certain. That's the idea of the use of the proleptic eris here. This throwing will happen in the final battle of the tribulation called Armageddon or the Armageddon campaign. The final move will, uh, when God wipes out all his enemies, is taking place here. All the armies of the earth will be brought together in northern Israel. Someone will cover that in Revelation 16 with the sixth bowl of judgment. The nations will believe that they are gathering on their own free will. But in truth, the angels under God's command will influence them to gather. And it's, it's demonic influence involved in this also. That, those are the frog demons of the bold judgment. God will amass them all in one location in order to spill their collective blood in one short, decisive battle led by Jesus Christ. And that's the verse we just read, Zechariah 14, verse 3 as well. <coughs> As Christ stomps his enemies, the blood will run. Look back there again in Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, verse 12. Now this will be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will rot in their mouth. It will come out in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them, and they will seize one another's hand, and the hand of the one will be lifted against the hand of the other. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered, gold, silver, and garments in great abundance. This is a horrific picture of what's going to take place. And there's an interesting thing happening while those armies are being gathered. Angels are involved in that, but their angels are also involved in gathering another group the birds to come and feast on the bodies that are left. There's a lot of stuff going on at once as we look at these things. Because of the evil of the Antichrist and false prophet and their unparalleled satanic activity, this harvest will be destructive.
Revelation 16, 13 through 16, and 19, 17 through 21 give the geographical location and features of God's great wine press. I failed to put a map in here, but there's a really good one on the wall in that other room there. But we might be able to do it here. Down below here, if we take the position that Israel's place of protection and provision is in Basra, or Teman, or Edom, because there's several passages that say, who is this who comes from Basra, whose robe is, is red with blood, and, and all that. If we take Basra being down here in Edom, then when, when the Antichrist army has come against Basra here to try to get to the Jews that are protected there, Jesus Christ comes, kills the Antichrist, and gets rid of these armies, and keeps working up the path of the armies, killing these armies in the wine press, passing Jerusalem, coming up here to Megiddo, all the way up to the Kishon River Valley, and then back to Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives, and that's when the Mount of Olives split, and that's when it's over. Everybody that's dead is dead. The birds are feasting, and it's time to clean things up in the kingdom to come. That's what these passages are talking about in Revelation 16 and 19. The wine press battleground will be in the Holy Land, but away from the confines of the city of Jerusalem. He bypasses Jerusalem on the way up to where they've gathered at the Armageddon Plain. But then there is an army that has come, and he comes, and they're destroyed, it seems like, by the bold judgment with the earthquake and the hailstones and everything that's going on with that in the seventh bold judgment. The great wine press of the wrath of God refers to his fierce pressing of judgment. Blood will be as deep as a horse's bridle, 1.4 meters, 4.5 feet, and will cover about 1,600 stadia or 200 miles. So I mean, we'll go back to that map. Or Anyway, so the 200-mile radius would be from Basra all the way up to the Kishon River Valley. Now, I, I kind of take the position, instead of looking at this as how deep the blood is, it's more of when Christ comes slashing through with his sword, the blood is splattering as high as a horse's bridle. It's a very violent picture of the action taking place as he's slaughtering the armies of the Antichrist that have been gathered against Israel. Although so much blood is hard to imagine, we should under, understand it literally. Christ will instantly crush the bodies of his enemies. And so you've got two literal ways to go with that. You can go with the deepness of it or the splattering of it that high. That's a literal interpretation both ways. Which one's going to be? I don't know, I'm going to be watching with my white horse. Because I'm not going to be doing it. Jesus Christ is the one who's doing that and coming in to establish the kingdom. So summary of these verses. The section describes two future harvests. Again, Matthew 3, the, the baptism of fire passage, the baptism of spirit and fire. An angel will come forth from the temple in heaven and order the first harvest of grain. And gives, it to who, gives the order to whoever we choose is sitting on the cloud. The wheat harvest depicts the gathering of the saved from among the nations to include them in the millennium. So it, 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 taking it this way, the idea is that they are taken into protection so that they, are, they don't die within the judgment that comes when Christ returns. Another angel who has power over fire judgment will come forth from the altar in heaven in order the second harvest of grapes, which symbolizes all tribulation unbelievers. This grape harvest, verses 17 through 20, depicts the ingathering of the nations for the final battle before the millennium, the Battle of Armageddon. That final battle, they're being gathered against Jerusalem and Basra to annihilate the Jews. Remember, that's Satan's last hope, is to annihilate all the Jews, and he's not going to be able to do it, of course. The harvesting of the grain includes no punishment because the harvested grapes will receive God's full wrath. Sinful man's rule over the earth will come to a sudden end before Christ begins his perfect kingdom reign. This is important to look at in Daniel 2 real quick. Let's turn over there. Daniel 2 is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has of the kingdom of man with the head of gold, which is Babylon, the arms and breasts of, of silver, which is Persia, the thighs and belly of bronze, which is Greece, and then the legs of iron, Rome, and the feet of iron and clay, the last part of the, of, of the revived empire, however we put that. 
Note how this is destroyed by the rock cut without hands, which is Jesus Christ. Look at Daniel 2, 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. Now when that stone comes, look back at verse 35. That's the interpretation of it, but look back at verse 35. It says, Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found, but the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Does this happen gradually or all at once? It's all at once. So there's no gradual bringing in the kingdom, you see. There's a confusion of that, that the church is about to bring in the kingdom. That's not the church's responsibility. We're told to do what? Go and make disciples, okay, of all the nations baptizing them and teaching them the things which we have learned. When the kingdom comes, Christ will do it, and he will do it quick, and he will do it decisively, and it will not be gradually. It will be a cataclysmic event, and, and it's going to be horrific. There's going to be a great deal of death. But what, we'll, what we're looking at is the justice of God coming forth to protect his righteous standard on all the earth. Real quick, in part of this, these are... No matter which way we go with the small parts of the interpretation we went, these are the same conclusions. During the postponement of the kingdom, sons of the kingdom will be sown in the world coexisting with evil. We've got good and evil coming together, being sown at the same time. Because the parable is that the field was sown with good seed, and then someone came along and sold the, uh, sowed the tares, and the owner asked, do we, do we take out the tares? And he says, no, if we take out the tares, we'll uproot the wheat. So wait till they grow together, and then we'll reap them both at the same time. And that's what we're looking at there in Revelation 14. The time for good and evil to grow side by side will come to an end. That day will end. And when that day comes, for the earth dwellers, the day of grace is over. It's the day of judgment. God will remove, in the future, suffering in His perfect time in accordance with His perfect plan. The big picture of things... The events there in Revelation 14 are bringing in the events that move us forward to that time when he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And the reason that can be done is because of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins on the cross, not ours only but for the entire world, there was a lot more going on as well. Yes, he paid the penalty for our sins. And when we believe in Jesus Christ, we simply put our faith in Christ, we are saved in that moment. But also what Christ did on the cross is he, when he satisfied the perfect character of God, he also became the only one worthy to take that seven-sealed scroll of judgment from the Father's hand, the title deed of this earth, and open it and bring these judgments to bring in not only the kingdom, because in the kingdom people are going to die, the youth are going to die at 100 years old. So we're all in the youth group right here, every one of us in here in the kingdom because no one's 100 in here. But the youth will die at 100, but there's still going to be death. But see, when the kingdom is over and eternity comes, there won't be any more of that. And the reason there won't be any more tears, any of those sufferings, is because of who Jesus Christ is and what he did with you in mind. So we continue to urge you, if you've never placed your trust in Christ, it's just a simple understanding that he died for you, thinking of you. Was obedient to the Father's plan to the point of death on the cross with you personally in mind. And what you do with that is your decision. So we urge you to believe in Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're grateful for, again, the time that we've had to look at these things. And, oh, there's so many details and that you've given to us and we just, just keeps driving us back to your word to, to look at these things and we're thankful that we can be certain about what we have to understand and the things that we don't Father please give us patience give us desire to keep going back keep reading keep studying may God the Holy Spirit in, in time as we learn more be able to put these pieces of the puzzle together more clearly for us 
as so many things can over over rush our mind when we're not familiar so help us to never lose the spiritual heartburn or the desire to know these things and father we just pray for the rest of the day that things will go you know, for your glory and that you continue to bless our time together in christ's name we pray amen
happy. There birthday. is someone in our midst who has a birthday today. Yeah. And starts with a T, ends with an N. There's an I in the middle. It's Tim. Uh, not Tim Sowers, Timmy Bradford. Where is he? Right there, yeah. 19 years old. Everyone stand up. We're going to sing happy birthday. <laughs> You want me to hold uh, it? You're going to lead. Ready? No, I'm not. You're, okay. You're going to lead. Uh, well, yeah. I'm li Okay. <laughs> ready? All right. Ready, set, go. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Timmy. Happy birthday to you. Hey, Tim, how old are you now? 19? Your body will start breaking down soon. <laughs> okay. Um, Turn up volume. Is that better? Hear me? No? Yes? No? Is this why you don't wear shirts like this? Like, okay, is that better? Can you, okay, is that good? All right. Okay, so we are on Revelation 15 and Revelation 14. Can you guys, can someone summarize for me what happened? In, okay, so in, in Dr. Clay's section, can someone summarize what happened? Yeah, so there was angels, right? And they were reaping, okay? And there is, yeah, yes. Was there a lot of judgment and wrath? A lot of violence? Okay, and we're going to kind of continue that a little bit in this section. So let's read chapters 15, and let's read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll open in prayer. Okay, so chapter 15. And this is kind of the last part of the special features as it's been addressed. And so 1 through 4, it says... Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And so this is a very cool description of God and what people are saying about him as this judgment's about to come. So now let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day. Thank you once again to just to be here and to hang out with everyone and to go through the Bible, Lord. I pray that you would um, impact us with this section, Lord, and that we would see your character clearly throughout this and see how even in the midst of wrath and, and tribulation and judgment and all these terrible things, that people are still giving you praise, and we should also do the same. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so point A, I think the battery is dead. No, it's on. Just, just hit the space bar. Okay. <laughs> Too fast? Okay. All right, point D. So Revelation 15, 1 through 8. So the fourth scene, 
the pageantry related to the outpouring of God's final seventh judgment. So now we're close to the very end, right? What does verse 1 say? The final judgment, his wrath is finished, okay? So we're getting towards the climax. We're getting towards the end of all these terrible things. So point one, okay? So how does it start? Then I saw, who's speaking here? Help me out. John, okay, and what's he doing? He's seeing this happen, right? So then I saw another sign in heaven. This, this begins, or thus begins the third of three signs John recorded in the book of Revelation. This last sign continues chronologically from chapters 11, 15 through 19. So remember, um, as, as Clay talked about, you have the tabernacle, chapter 11, and then verse 5, the tabernacle. Okay, so we're kind of closing out that sort of parenthetical or sort of the, the special feature section. So point A. So the first great sign that John observed in heaven was of a woman in labor, clothed in the sun, moon, and stars. We determined that she represents Israel. Remember, very first session, that was the first sign, okay? Israel, the woman, okay? So that's the first one. It's a nice sound. Very good. Okay, so now we have a second sign. We're just kind of going through the signs, just a, a quick little recap. So the second sign that John observed was the great red dragon. We determined that, th that he represents Satan. And so what was that great red dragon doing in chapter 12? What, what was he trying to do? Yeah, devour the child. And yes, he was waiting for the woman, right? So he's trying to do what? Kill Jesus and also kill Israel. Okay, so those are the first few signs. And now we kind of have a different sign. So point C. So now in Revelation 15, 1, we see the third great sign in heaven. This one having to do with the seven angels who will hold and, and administer the seven final plagues. Revelation chapters 15 through 18 describe this sign. Okay, point one, Revelation 5, 1a. So he sees this sign, and is it going to be lame and boring and trash, or what's it going to be? Okay, the sign will be both what? Great and marvelous, okay? So this is something that we should pay attention to. This is something that we should see, okay? Point two. I guess I'm 23 and my voice still cracks. So for those of you who have voice cracks right now, there's, there's not a lot of hope for you, I guess. <laughs> it's it's going to keep on happening. But um, point two, okay? So it's going to be great and marvelous. This is going to be amazing. This is going to be something that's sp spectacular. This is going to be intense, okay? So we want to pay attention to what this sign is all about. And so what does he see? Okay, so point two, John saw seven angels holding the seven plagues, which are the last. Okay, so these are the last. This is the final judgment, okay, the final plagues, the final bowls of wrath that God is going to pour out on the world. And in that, the wrath of God is finished. Okay, so this is the very end. Point A, so plague or plagos primarily means a blow or a wound, not a disease as we often think of. The word in English, for example, the, bu the bubonic plague or the black plague. So it's kind of not necessarily a disease, but more of a blow or a wound. And we're going to see that in chapter 16, all these wounds, all these blows happening to the world. So point B, God's judgments, which began with the breaking of the seals and continued with the blowing of the trumpets, will end with these seven blows. Okay, and Revelation 16 calls them bulls. Like it's kind of interesting. It kind of mixes the plagues with the bulls together. Um, but that's going to be the end, okay? And point C... These seven great blows will make the plagues of Egypt as well as the seal and trumpet judgments seem mild by comparison. Okay, so this is like, this is the intense, this is the greatest form of judgment we're going to see. Okay, it's far greater than the rest that we've seen. And you guys remember the book of Egypt? Okay, can anyone just throw out some plagues for me? Just to, maybe you guys, just throw out some plagues in the book of Egypt. Pro okay. Darkness, okay. Death of the firstborn, okay. Hail, okay. Boils, right? Revelation has some of that, too. So th there's, a lot, there's a lot of similarities. Frogs, okay. Locusts. What was the first one? Yeah, the Nile turned into blood, okay. And so there's kind of some similarities here that we can see in Revelation. There's kind of some parallels with Exodus and Revelation. But notice these are going to be far worse because that was just on Egypt. What is this going to be on? The whole, the whole world, right? And so it, it's going to be a lot worse. Okay, so point three, Revelation 15, 1c. So after the pouring out of these final judgments, John could say that the, that the wrath of God is finished. Okay, it's over, okay? This is going to be the end, as we've already been saying. This is the final wrath of God. Point A, the word wrath, or thumos, used here,
means a passion or fury that, that boils up, erupts, and then quickly subsides. Note that the Holy Spirit did not inspire the Greek word orgy, which describes a steady, or orge, I can't, I don't know, one of them, which describes a steady, smolder, I think both of those are wrong, I don't really know. This is why I shouldn't pronounce Greek words when I'm up here. But it describes a steady, smoldering anger, okay? Point B, when Satan realizes that, that his end is near, he is said to have this explosive wrath. Remember in Revelation 12, 12, what's happening there? The wrath is about to happen, okay? And so his time is short, so he's going to be a lot more feisty, okay? He's going to be ready. He's going to be doing a lot more things, okay? And then w when Satan's doing those things as well, the wrath is also turned up for who? God, okay? So Satan's wrath is turned up. God's wrath is turned up. And it's going to be a really awful place to be, okay? There's going to be a lot of terrible things going on during this time period. Point C, from the midpoint of the tribulation until the end, God's white-hot anger will be righteously expressed progressively through each plague. So it's going to go worse and worse, right? Seven, so it's going to go from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's going to go in a sequential sense. And so point D, at Armageddon, or Armageddon, God will also have this furious anger in his final complete victory over the evil armies of the world. And then point four, Revelation 15, 1D, finally God's wrath will subside. So after this, that wrath is over, okay? It's finished. The wrath of God is finished. Point A, the Greek word finished means to accomplish or complete something, to bring it to perfection or to the desired goal, not merely to end it. So this is the final consummation of all the wrath, as we've been mentioning, okay? So this is, after this part, chapter 16, that that is the final wrath of God. Point B, these plagues are the judgments God will use to prepare the earth for the coming of King Jesus. They will allow him to establish his kingdom and destroy the world system that usurper Satan established. So after all this wrath comes, what comes after that? Jesus Christ, and, and what does he bring? His kingdom, okay? With the rock, you know, as we talked about, he's going to set up his kingdom, and it's going to happen all at once, okay? It's not just, you know, gradual. It's going to happen, you know, like that. It's going to happen like that. And so that's something to realize as well as we talked about. So also in Revelation 14, okay, the wine press of wrath is kind of starting to heat up, right? And so I, I just kind of want to go through a quick little summary of wrath kind of throughout the, the Bible. I'll try to make this short. This, is, this won't be very long, but I, I just kind of want to show you guys different ways that wrath has been seen. But this wrath in Revelation 15 is going to be more final than the rest that we've seen. And so God doesn't just have wrath here. He's had it all throughout history, okay? So let's go to Genesis 19, and let's see that. Kind of one picture of this wrath. This is just kind of fun. Like, I had a shorter section, so I thought that I would <laughs> add a few things. But Genesis 19, <laughs> 24 through 25. I won't take that long, I promise. <laughs> so Genesis 19, uh, 24 through 25. And just to kind of picture, these things are all terrible things, okay? But this wrath in Revelation 15 is far worse than the ones that we're going to go through. So Genesis 19. You guys remember the story. Someone brought it up earlier, okay? Sodom and Gomorrah. So verse 24, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. So what do we have? Wrath of God, fire and brimstone. There's some wrath, okay? The city gets destroyed, okay? So it's something similar to the tribulation. Now let's jump to Exodus 14. Okay, there's another similarity here. So let's go to Exodus 14. And let's read verses 17 through 18. So Exodus 14. And this is when Israel escapes, right? Pharaoh's chasing Israel. Or sorry, he is chasing Israel, okay? And then the, the sea parts, right? And then what happens to the Egyptians? They try to follow him, okay? So verse 17, As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. So the wrath of God, okay, it happens on Egypt. They get destroyed, okay? And what does Pharaoh, what is he supposed to know? That what? That I am the Lord, Okay. 
that he is God, okay? So a lot of this wrath, it's really also supposed to shift the focus back to God. They will know that I am the Lord, okay? It's the beginning of Exodus, okay? What does Pharaoh says? He says, I don't know the Lord, okay? At the end of it, what happens? He knows the Lord. Kind of the same thing going on in Revelation. So now let's go to number 16, another one real quick. Number 16. Okay, so number 16, Israelites aren't being very, or the sons of Korah are kind of rebelling here. Okay, so we'll just kind of briefly go through it. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open. Okay, so here's more wrath, okay? And in other words, when people defy God, what happens? Bad things happen, okay? Wrath happens, judgment happens, okay? Also, one more, Romans 1.18, we'll go there, we'll talk about that briefly. But just kind of picture, I'm just trying to kind of show you guys briefly that wrath has been all throughout the Bible, okay? And normally what happens is when people defy God, wrath happens. What are people doing in Revelation? They're defying God, okay, and then what happens? Wrath happens, okay, and that's the just response of God, okay? He has to punish that because he's a perfect judge. So now Romans 1.18, we can kind of see this in our own world, okay? So Romans 1.18, notice, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, un and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So that's currently what's happening. It's currently being revealed, okay? So everyone who suppresses the truth, everyone who doesn't believe in the gospel, rejects the Bible, things like this, wrath is slowly being kindled up, okay? So wrath, there's a lot of things what wrath affects the world, but ultimately that wrath, all this wrath we talked about, it'll be finalized in Revelation 15, in Revelation 16, in the final coming of Jesus Christ when he comes in Revelation 19. So, a lot of wrath going on, okay, but ultimately that's going to be totally finished in the end, which is kind of the big theme here. And so, point two. So now let's kind of shift back to Revelation, and let's read verses two through four, and then we'll break these down. But it's a very simple point, right? The wrath of God is finished. That's the clear point of verse one. Okay, so verse two. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who have been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. Okay, so that's verse 2. So now we're going to see victory by way of death. So how do you win by death? Okay, we're going to talk about it. We've already talked about it. It's kind of interesting, right? When you die, you win as a Christian. That's kind of cool, right? That's a good thing. So when you, are, when you and I die, do we win or do we lose? We win. And where are we going to be? With who? The Lord. Okay, and that's a beautiful thing. So in the same way, these people here also experience that. So point A, so something like a vast ocean of glass glowing with fire was spread out before John. Point one, this crystal sea is probably the one before the throne of God in the heavenly temple. Okay, let's all, I have a quote here, Revelation 4, 6, probably the same thing. We can kind of compare these two passages and it says, and before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal, okay? Revelation 15 says what? Crystal? What do we have here? Crystal, okay? And around the throne, on each side of the throne, as are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Also, if, if you read later, these creatures are praising God in Revelation 4. Revelation 15, what happens? There's, they're praising God, okay? So it's probably the same throne room. We're probably talking about the same thing in these two passages. So point A. In the earthly temple, the, the laver used by priests for ceremonial cleaning was referred to as the sea. So just kind of picture this, okay? Sea of glass mixed with fire. Glass can kind of be jagged when it's not, you know, like completely finalized, right? When it's not, you know, like a window. So kind of imagine something like that. It's a pretty cool sign, and, and, and there's red as well. So just imagine kind of some red glassy sea. It's probably very beautiful. And it's the throne of God, and God's there as well. So point B, we should remember that Israel's earthly temple was modeled after the heavenly temple, God's dwelling place. We see that in Hebrews 8. Point two, the formerly calm crystal sea will now become active with fire. 
So Revelation 4 is kind of calm, but what's it doing in Revelation 15? Mixed with what? Fire, okay. And what does that signify? Wrath, destruction, violence, bloodshed, things like this. So that, that, that's being kindled up, okay? So it's ready to be exploded upon the world. So point A. In the word of God, fire often depicts or accompanies judgment. Second Peter 3 talks about the heavens melting, okay, fire raining down, okay, so fire normally means judgment. Would you guys like, have you guys ever been burned by fire? Yeah. Is it fun to get burned by fire? Yeah. <laughs> One time I was in, I'll tell a quick story, I was in fourth grade, and I was making my lunch to go to school, and my sister Rachel, some of you know her, she tripped me, and we have a fireplace that was hot, that was on, okay, like a wooden fireplace, and I fell, my whole left arm, got on the fireplace, right? So my whole left arm, the whole thing was literally burned red. I think I still have scars from it. So that was what my sister did to me, okay? And it wasn't fun. I didn't like it, okay? <laughs> it hurt, okay? And that was just a little bit of fire, okay? But just imagine the fire that's going to come here. No. Nah. <laughs> She's very kind most of the time. But point B, <laughs> after the midpoint of the tribulation, <laughs> the most severe judgments in the history of the world will erupt from heaven and pour down over to earth. Point C, when we consider the unrelenting atro atrocities committed against God's holy people, beginning with rebellious Babylon and culminating with the Antichrist Babylon the Great, we're going to talk about that later, we easily understand his fiery judgment at the end. Point D, under the beast government, many tribulation saints will have been slaughtered legally. So that they're killing Christians, okay, and so they kill Christians and then they're going to be killed by who? God, okay. So this, this is a just, righteous thing that God's going to do to them. Point B, Revelation 15, 2B. So he, he, he sees this sign, and then what does he see? And those who have been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. So these people are what? Are they in defeat or are they in victory? They're victorious, okay, and they're standing, and they're holding harps, okay, so they're playing music, okay, so they're singing songs, and they're victorious over the beast, okay? Point one, in this context, these victorious believers will be killed or beheaded in martyrdom during the tribulation. So these ones have been victorious over the beast, okay, let's, let's briefly jump to Revelation 7. And let's read um, verses 9 through 14. We can kind of see probably what this is talking about. So Revelation 7, verses 9 through 14. Okay, so verse 9, it says, So after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, so a bunch of people, okay, <laughs> which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. So they come out, so there's people, every, every nation, every tongue, okay, this, this group of people. And what are they doing? Verse 10, and they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So they're praising God. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. That's a very beautiful thing that they're saying, right? Verse 13, Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Those who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where have they come? So someone asked, who are these people? Okay, there's a group of people, they're praising God, who are they? And then verse 14 gives us the answer. I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so we have these people that come out of the tribulation, Revelation 7, probably the same people that are talked about in Revelation 15, okay? And, they, and they're victorious through what? The blood of the Lamb, through death as well, okay? Blessed is the dead, but through the blood of the Lamb. They're victors, okay? They're, they're overcomers through the blood of the Lamb. And point two, they will not fight the enemy. You might say they will win by losing. Does that happen a lot? You know, you guys ever play sports? You, you ever win when you lose? Not normally, right? You know, well, the Cowboys are out of, are out of the playoffs because they are not very good, okay? So they lost, and are they going to be in the playoffs? Are they going to have a chance to win the Super Bowl? Why? 
because they lost, because they're losers, because they're bad football team, right? <laughs> Go Seahawks. They're probably going to lose sun Sunday, but at least they're in the playoffs, okay? That's a good thing. <laughs> but these people, they, they win by losing, okay? You, you get beheaded and you win. <laughs> That's great, okay? In this time, blessed are the dead, okay? Point three. So by our human standards, dying seems an odd way to be victorious, but by God's standard, those who die through martyrdom by remaining faithful to Christ are true winners or overcomers. Revelation 14 says, blessed are the dead. Okay, so blessed is it to be dead, okay, to get away from all that judgment, all that trash that has happened in the tribulation. And so this is the verse. So And I, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Oh, here we go, yeah. So, there's a lamb, okay? And I had it in red, because blood is red. Well, I guess when you see it, right? It's, it's not red, and anyway, it doesn't matter. But, they overcome by the blood of the lamb, okay? So now let's briefly go to these verses, because these are cool verses. Let's go to Revelation 12, 11 first, and let's read that. So Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. So they overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the sacrifice of Christ, but also we as well. Let's now go to Revelation 1, 5. So Revelation 1, 5. Here we kind of have a quick little gospel summary, which is a really cool thing. That's how the book starts. Revelation 1, verse 5, and it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So there we have a beautiful picture of the gospel. W what did Christ do here? He loved us, okay? And how did he love us? He demonstrated by doing what? He died on the cross. He rose again. Okay, so my sins were placed onto the cross. Your sins were placed onto the cross. He died for those sins, and he rose again. And now, based on faith in him, what happens to our sins? They're released, right? We're released from that penalty. Those sins are forgiven. That's the amazing truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ, he died, he rose again. He did all the work, okay? We don't do the work, okay? The gospel's not about us. It's about what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. And if you put your faith in that message, then you're saved. That's the simple Grace message of the Bible, okay? It's what he did. Trust in what he did. He's the one who did all the work. He's the one who releases us from our sins. We can't do it, but Jesus Christ did it. And if you believe in that message, you will be saved. That's the very amazing grace message. That's the total just beautiful message that the Bible co consistently talks about in Revelation and also through the tribulation as well. It's always by the blood of the Lamb. He's the one who did all the work. He's the one who died, okay? Dying isn't fun. Jesus died for us. He took all the wrath of God. And it's, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. And so now, I guess here's a, I, th this was to make you guys pay attention, so I just threw this in here, just to kind of. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty gross, right? Yeah. <laughs> should, sh should I stay on this? or? <laughs> okay, so point C. Okay, so Revelation 15.2. Okay, so these tribulation saints, they're standing on the sea of glass. Note that these faithful tribulation believers will not lie dead, but rather will stand in heaven on the sea of glass. So they're standing, okay? They're not dead. They're standing on the sea of glass in victory. Point one, the participle standing is in the perfect tense, active voice to emphasize the continuation and permanence of their position in heaven. They will never again be moved or hurt by an enemy. They're standing, okay? It's victory. Point two, these overcomers will stand on the sea above the fire, certainly not a sign of defeat. So they're standing, okay, on the sea of glass, and what are they doing? Point D, these tribulation saints will be holding the harps of God. So who owns these harps? Okay, so imagine God having a harp. Okay, would it be probably pretty cool to play, probably sound a lot better than... Some people here, <laughs> myself included, <laughs> right? Why? Because it's the harp of God. So they're probably playing something very beautiful. It doesn't tell us what it sounds like, but I'm sure it sounds very beautiful. 
and they're praising God with his own harp, okay, which is something that's really awesome. And the statement, harps of God, means that God will give them the harp. So who gives them the harps? God does, okay. Point A, another grace gift, okay. If you want a harp in heaven, you know, talk to God. He might help you out with that. Point one, a harp is a soothing instrument that lends itself to both singing and playing songs of praise. Point two, these harps will be heard in heaven. And you can go to those passages if you want in your free time, but it kind of mentions that sort of thing. And point three, imagine the contrast between the sounds of death, destruction, and carnage on the earth and the joyous sound of harps in heaven. Okay, so just imagine the, the distinction here, okay? What's happening on the earth? Bloodshed, violence, everyone's being destroyed and killed, okay? And then there's heaven, okay, and what's happening in heaven? They're playing harps of God and they're singing, okay? So just imagine the total just the distinction that we see, and that's really beautiful. And it's cool that John, he gets all this judgment, all this trash, okay? He's probably, like, super overwhelmed by it, and then what does he see? The throne of God, okay? And he sees harps, and he sees beautiful things. And so the angel and, and Jesus is trying to kind of help John out, encourage him as he sees all these intense things. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the song, which is actually a really awesome song, okay? There, there's so many cool things about the character of God in this song. So now let's read verses 3 through 4 again, and then we'll break it down. So just two more verses, okay, and then I think we have lunch, so it's almost there. So, verses 3 through 4. I, I, I think that was right. If I misspoke, you can correct me. I think lunch is after. Okay, anyways, ver verse 3. So, verse 3. <laughs> anyway, okay, verse 3. <laughs> I think it's verse 3. <laughs> yeah, Revelation 15, verse 3, okay. And they sang the song of Moses, so they're only harps and they're singing, okay. The bondservant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So they're singing. Just kind of take your time to kind of think about what they're singing about. That's the character of God. We need the character of God more and more as we go through life. That's what's going to change us, knowing the character of God. Because as you know the character of God, you know how he deals with his people. And we're his people, right? So it's important to know how he deals with us and his character and, and his attributes and who he is and how he's going to deal with people like us. And point one, according to John, they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So it's not, it's not just one song of Moses, okay? It combines them, right? The song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. So it's both their song. So point A, these overcomers will sing the song of Moses, which one we can't be sure of. And so we'll briefly talk about this. Point I, it could be the song of Moses in Exodus 15. That begins with the horse and rider being thrown into the sea, making it a victory anthem that proclaims God's wonders and the fact that he is indeed just and true in all his ways. So there's two songs of Moses, and maybe this one, Exodus 15. Or it could be, point two. Or it could be the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, 1 through 43. Concerning the Lord, verse 41 enthusiastically exclaims, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on justice, I will render vengeance on my adversaries and I will repay those who hate me. So you have two different songs here. Okay, and my opinion is that it's Exodus 15. I think that, that that's the song that they're singing here. I think that makes more sense because in Exodus 15, what do you have? You have the, right, so that Israel escapes, okay, and then Egypt follows them, okay, and then what happens to Egypt? They get destroyed. The water crashes in on them, okay? And then what happens? The Israelites sing. So I, th I think that makes more sense than the, than the Deuteronomy one. But, of course, we can't be definitive on that. Okay, point B. These overcomer believers will also sing the song of the Lamb. Clearly, these tribulation saints will not be saved by works, but rather by faith in Jesus Christ, the same way all believers throughout history are saved. They will rejoice by singing praise to the great and righteous Lamb who saved them. Point two. So now let's talk about the lyrics. So let's talk about the, the, just the amazing parts of this song. So point two, let's consider the lyrics of the song as they appear in the text. Point A, Revelation 15, 3b. So the song begins, 
Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Point I. In much the same way that God won a great victory over Pharaoh and Egypt for the Exodus believers, he will also win a stunning victory over Satan, the Antichrist, and the world for tribulation saints. And so what is he? He's almighty. Okay, what does that mean? All-powerful. Okay, he's righteous. Okay, holy. Okay, he's true. Does he lie? No, he's honest. Okay, and he's also what of the nations? He's the king of the nations, so he rules over the nations. So that is who God is. Okay, that is his character, and that is what... He is doing, and that's very a beautiful thing. And point two, these overcomer believers will not hesitate to praise God for his righteous judgments of the earth and his inhabitants. Because they know he is God, they will not question his allowing suffering and evil on earth. So after all this judgment, what are they doing? They're praising God for his judgment. Okay, it's kind of interesting. We'll kind of break that down. Like, how is that possible? We see all this judgment, all these awful things happening, and they're praising God. How does that make sense? Okay, how does a bunch of violence, and then we're going to praise God for that? How can we like actually think that, right? And we're going to kind of talk about why that's actually something we should think, and that's why, and that's the way that the Bible presents judgment, our, our response to it. Okay, so point three, these worshipers will have seen God's patience and unwillingness to let anyone perish. Therefore, they will confidently wait for him to end all suffering, evil, and death at the right time. We've already talked about it. Okay, Revelation 14, there's an angel doing what? What, what is he proclaiming? The eternal gospel, right? So he's proclaiming the gospel, okay? And so he's trying to save people even throughout all this judgment, okay? So God wants people to be saved. He wants them to come to repentance. He wants them to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so point four, their song shows that they have God's eternal perspective. Okay, so now we're going to kind of just briefly go through this again, just because I think it's really cool, the, the description of who God is. Okay, so the Lord God, he has great and marvelous works, okay? So in other words, when he does stuff, is it good? Is it great? Is it marvelous? Yes, okay, that's who God is. He's almighty, we've talked about, he's all-powerful. He's righteous, he's holy, he's true, he doesn't lie. We lie, right? People lie. Does God lie? Does God change? And that's something that we can really put our faith in. Because we change, right? People change. But God never changes. And so we can really put our faith completely in him because he never changes. And that's encouraging, right? Because in the world, everything changes except for God. Point E, he's the king of the nations or king of the ages, as some translations say. So this is who God is, okay? These are really awesome things about God. So point B, their song climaxes in magnificent praise. Point I, so who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? The anticipated answer is no one. The truth is that at that moment, everyone will tremble and worship because he obviously is Almighty God. So when you see him, okay, you're going to have the exact same reaction. Okay, sometimes now in this world, we don't see him, so it, it's easy to not to fear God. But when you see him, you're going to have this exact same reaction. You're going to be on your knees. You're going to be praising God because you see how glorious he is. And so the hard part for us is trying to have that same reaction now, even though we can't see him. And that's where faith comes in. So we, we have a faith in who God is. And this is who he is, okay? This is what the Bible says, okay? And so if we put our faith in these descriptions of us, or not of us, but of God, it'll help us as we go through life. So point two, all the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So are there just a few nations, or is it all the nations? All the nations, right? Everyone is going to see this, and they're going to praise God, because it's that obvious that he is that perfect, he is that righteous, he is that holy, that is who God is. Point one, even though God's righteous acts are obvious, sadly, many will not respond by faith during their lives, which is true. We see this all throughout the world. You know, we, we have the greatest message ever, the message of the gospel, God's message, okay, of salvation. You can be saved simply through the grace of God. He did all the work. But what do people do with that? They reject it, okay? So in the same way they reject it now, they're going to reject it here as well. Point two, even so, at the end of time, all who have ever lived will bow and worship. Another one, there we go. Before the Lord, just as the song prophesies. <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, there's worse things, yeah. <laughs> Point three, these saints will sing in anticipation of universal worship by all the nations during the millennium and later at the great white throne. So there's going to be a lot of singing, okay? Okay, so quiz for you guys. So why are the saints singing? Victory, okay. Yes, there you go. Yeah, because of what? God's marvelous work. So that's why they're singing him. We, that's why they're singing to God. We should also do the same. And so I kind of want to briefly talk about, um, so like it's, it's kind of a crazy thing, okay? So there's all this judgment, all this destruction, all this wickedness going on, okay, in the world, and God's destroying all these people, and the response of them is to praise God, okay? It's like, mm, you know, like, like how does that happen, okay? Like how does that make sense? How can we kind of understand this? And I think the best way to understand it is think of the world today, okay? When someone murders someone or, or when someone rapes someone, okay, what is our response to that? Yeah, well, if we're angry, we're upset, right? We're, we're wrathful at that because that's an unjust thing that happened to that person, okay? So in the same way, all these people, that, that, that there's injustice, there's unrighteousness, they're defying God, they're rebelling God, so God has to respond in this way. And so in the same way, we should have the same reaction. So w when God's judgment comes, okay, we should have praise for that, okay? It's kind of interesting how that works, but that's really how the Bible presents it. So we should put our hope in that, okay? Because ultimately, he's going to come, he's going to right all the wrongs, Right now, a lot of wrongs go on, like a, a lot of times, you guys know this in life, right? Things go wrong, people wrong you, situations wrong you, life wrongs you, you know, you wrong yourself. You know, there's a lot of things that go wrong, okay? But in the end, all those wrongs will be righted and Jesus Christ will reign supreme. So that's a very encouraging thing that we can put our hope in. And so that is my section. Um, actually, let's read Exodus 15. Let's just read it because that's the Song of Moses. Okay, I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to comment on it, and then we'll close in prayer just to kind of see how the Israelites talked about um, God after he delivered them as well. So Exodus 15. Actually, does someone want to read that? Just, just go for it, whoever wants to. Cassidy, go ahead. Uh, 1 through 18. So basically, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
I went too far. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just dive right in after Alex's sec section. It was funny because while while studying uh, for this section, I went over like the PowerPoint for uh, for Alex's se session like once or maybe twice, uh, just once. And is it like sad that I remember that better than all the <laughs> all the studying I put into my section? Um, <laughs> but anyways, let's let's get started uh, just with a quick word of prayer and then just dive in. So. God, uh, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, most of all, for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, uh, to, for our sins, pay the penalty we deserve. And thank you that you rose him again on the third day, and that through trust in him and his work that we can be saved from the penalty we deserve, um, to for be saved from separation from you in hell forever, and that we can have this hope to look forward to as uh, we go through Revelation. So uh, I pray that you would speak through me. God, I really need you to. Uh, there's a little bit of complicated stuff in here that I'd like to explain, but um, I'm sure you will. And I pray that you'd help everybody listen as well and help us all learn together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to go back over the gospel because honestly, the gospel is so foundational. We can't have this hope to look forward to this salvation from future judgment without the gospel. We can't be saved from separation from God forever without the gospel. The gospel is so essential to our faith. We can't grow as Christians without having first believed the gospel. So what is the gospel? Turn with me to a passage I'm sure we all know, and I'm just going to kind of break it down and walk through it um, just briefly. So John chapter 3, six, verse 16. I'm sure you all know this very well, but um, the gospel uh, is, is um, John 3, 16. Let's go ahead and read that. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So first part, we see that for God so loved the world. Um, God loved the world. The world includes all of us. It includes all people, past, present, and future. And when this was written, we were still in the future. So it includes me, it includes you, it includes everybody from the worst, from the quote-unquote worst of us to the quote-unquote best of us. And um, really, we see in Romans 3 that there's no best of us. We're all on this level playing field. Um, as, it's, as the saying goes, uh, the ground at the foot of the cross is all level because we are all sinners and we all deserve to go to hell. But God loved the world. And for God so loved the world that he acted upon that love, that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son was Jesus Christ who came to earth as a human, like you and me. He came, but he was, not only was he a human, but he was also, he also maintained his deity he, in order that he could live a perfect life. 
when me and you can't be perfect, when we aren't perfect, which we aren't perfect, Christ fulfilled that for us in our place because he is God and he's also 100% human. Um, and uh, and then as we see in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 3 through 4, um, that Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And... Um, and uh, so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, if you trust in Jesus' death for your sins and resurrection, then God does two things for you. He saves you from a hell you deserve, and he gives you eternal life. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's the first thing that he does for you. We all deserve to die. Obviously, this implies that if you don't believe in him, then you will perish. But if you do believe in him, then you shall not perish. This is a promise from God. And does God keep his promises? Yes. Yes, he does. Um, so we all deserve to die and be separated from God forever because of our sins. Nothing good we, that we can do will ever earn us eternal life. We all deserve to die. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. All means all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nothing good we can do will ever make us worthy of eternal life. It's all about what Christ did. So if you believe in him and his work, you shall not perish. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So one, you don't die. The other is you live. You get life. You get eternal life. We have a hope to look forward to of life forever with Christ. And I can't wait till we get uh, past the judgment. Um, I'm glad we're studying the judgment, but I, the hope we have uh, to look forward to is so incredible, and I look forward to it so much. So, um, let's just dive into the section now. It is Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 15, uh, verses 5 through 8, and then we'll be looking at 16.1. So, let's go ahead and uh, read through this passage a couple times, because what I want to do is I want to make sure that we're looking at the Bible First, and that is what we're looking at before we start interpreting it or whatnot. And pay attention to the, the details and the things you see uh, throughout, these, throughout these verses. But first, we're going to look at the second half of uh, chapter 15. First, we saw the sign with um, the, set, John sees seven angels, and he sees the people with the harp of God um, singing their incredible song about God. So... Um, now, starting in verse 5, after these things, so after the sign, after these things, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bulls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Does somebody have a different translation than the New King James Version? You? Okay, go ahead, and would you like to read those, first, those five, five through eight again for us? Yeah. Thank you. So, so we we read through it a couple times, and I like I like this analogy that's been kind of popping up in different people's sections. Of I feel like when I'm reading through Revelation that I'm like watching a movie, and every movie you can kind of break it down into different scenes. And this this little portion that we're looking at, um, if you include si chapter 16 verse one, we see five different scenes. It's nice because each of these scenes lines up with. Um, 
with each of the verses we see. In verse 5, um, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony is open. Verse 6, seven angels come out of the temple. Verse 7, we see uh, the seven angels receiving seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. And then verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. And then, um, and then in chapter 16, verse 1, we'll see the command to go and pour out the, um, the wrath of God on the earth, the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And uh, notice that the setting here in these four verses is the temple. We're, so we're looking at a temple scene, um, and then that the quote-unquote main actors of the scene, the people who kind of uh, appear the most in each of these scenes, are the seven angels. You can go back and kind of read through that for yourself to double check on that, but uh, that's a conclusion I've come to reading through it. So um, so let's dive right in. Now that we've kind of got there, that there, let's go ahead and read verse five again. After these things I looked, this is verse five, after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So we see the temple being open. The fifth scene, John saw, saw the heavenly temple. John saw the heaven, the, the temple, John saw the temple in heaven wide open. Instead of the ho holy of holies, God's dwelling place, being inaccessible as in the earthly temple, the heavenly temple will be wide open. Through his death for our sins, Jesus Christ made possible this open access to God, the, to God the Father, by all who believe. And so this is, this is where God's at, and sort of, you can, you can get the picture here. And then these angels will exit out of the temple. Instead of priests going into the Holy of Holies, into the holy place, as in the Old Testament temple, John saw the seven angels coming out of the temple. In this text, we observe the momentous pageantry of angels carrying the bull judgments out from God's very presence. So, notice here in this verse, um, oh no, that's verse 6. So, verse 6, let's go ahead and read verse 6 says, and out of the temple, so the temple's open, right? And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Notice when it's, it says in this verse that they have the seven plagues when they're exiting this, the temple. And this is going to bring up something that's a little confusing, but um, I'm going to explain how I see it, and then uh, you can also do read through it on your own as well. Um, so, verse 6, these judgment-bearing angels were clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chest with golden sashes. sashes. It's interesting to note that, that um, John, bring, John notes what they were wearing. They're wearing clean, bright linen and girded around their chest with these golden sashes. So, um, these judgment angels wore gleaming white clothes made of bright, shining lit linen. They also wore wide sashes of gold around their chests. The angel's white clothing immediately reminds us of God's holiness and righteousness. Since these angels proceeded from the presence of God, they must be holy because nothing unclean can abide with them. And that's what's cool about the gospel, because the moment you believe the gospel... Christ's righteousness is put on you, too. So then, in the future, when we die, we're made perfect, like Christ is, and then we can enter the very presence of God, which is incredible. So the golden sash across or around the chest signifies the dignity of their, mm, I don't know, magisterial function, which is judgment. Old Testament priests skirted their robes around the waist with a belt, not around the chest with a sash. These angels will leave the temple carrying the most toxic substances ever brewed, God's final seven judgments against sinful humanity. Note this, it says in verse 6, And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. Note it, uh, note it says they had the seven plagues, and then it goes into a description of how they were dressed. Um, 
These uh, angels will leave the temple carrying the most toxic substances ever brewed, God's final seven judgments against sinful humanity. humanity. Each bowl will be poured out in rapid succession, and each will bring great and unequal judgment on the entire earth as described in Revelation 16, which we'll get to very soon. So, first, temples opened. Second, angels with the judgments exit the temple, and he notes how they're dressed. Now, verse 7, let's go ahead and read that. The, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bulls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Okay, so this is where it gets confusing because no, it, they exit with the plagues and then it says in this scene that they're given seven golden bulls with the, full of the wrath of God which later on are also called seven golden bowls filled with the plagues. And so it's, it's very confusing, because it's like, how, does, how do they exit first and then are given the bowls? It's confusing. But I think we'll get to, uh, get to a possible explanation of this in a second. So the sequence here is difficult to follow. One of the four living creatures will give each, one of, the, each of the seven angels a golden bowl containing a deadly mixture. Uh, we can't be sure if he will give them the bulls when they are still in the temple or after they come out. The way I see this, however, is note at the beginning, this is just how it makes sense to me. So take it for what it's worth. This is purely opinion. And so, yeah, take it for what it's worth. But at the beginning of chapter 15, John sees this sign. And at the beginning of the sign, he makes note of seven angels. Let's go ahead and read chapter 15, verse 1. He says, Then I saw... Another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So he sees this sign. This isn't actually happening. He's just seeing a sign. Then later when stuff actually, when the chronology picks up again, then he sees these seven, seven angels exiting the temple, and he calls them in verse 6. Um, Out of the temple came the sev- these seven angels having the seven plagues. Now, what I, how I see this is he's saying, hey, these angels that are exiting the temple are very, are very specific angels. These are specifically the ones I saw previously in the vision. So at this time, they might not actually have the plagues, but he's making sure to, say, to note that they, that they are the ones he saw previously in the sign. That's just how I see it. Take it for what it's worth. Um, and if that ma- didn't make any sense, Well, let's just move on. Um, So each of the four living creatures told John to come and see Jesus open one of the first four seal judgments. We saw that um, in the past. Let's go ahead and read verse 7 to kind of get back on track, and then we'll divulge off again. Um, So verse 7, Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bulls full of the wrath of God, who lives and abides forever. So this is scene number three. The angels are receiving these seven golden bulls. And let's go ahead um, and stop really quick. Although, I'm, can I get to the end of the section? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so, so, they, uh, so it says that one of the seven living, one of the seven, one of the four living creatures gives the bulls to them. And uh, it's interesting to note, he doesn't identify which of them it is. He just says that um, that it's one of them, and we see the uh, we see one of the we see each of the four living creatures telling John to come and see in um, the with the seal judgments in chapter six. He says in verse one. Now, yeah, in verse one. Uh, now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, "Come and see." Verse three. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, "Come and see." So second living creature. Then in verse five, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, "Come and see." Um, and then verse seven. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying come and see. So it's interesting. He notes that one of the four living creatures is handing them the bulls, but he doesn't note which one. So one of the four living creatures will deliver the final seven bull judgments, but John does not tell us which one. And one more point, and then we'll stop. 
These mixtures will be full of God's anger. Therefore, they will be devastating beyond comparison. We see this in the second half of this scene in verse 7. He says, Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of what? Of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. It's cool because he notes it's full of the wrath of God, and then he notes a characteristic of God, that he lives forever and ever. Let's go ahead and pray for our food and go eat. Um, dear God, thank you uh, for your goodness to us. Thank you for all your characteristic, that your, your ways are just and true. Great and marvelous are your works. Uh, Lord God Almighty, um, and thank you also for the little blessings in life like food. Um, I pray that we would go out and enjoy some wonderful pizza is what it looks like. I'm very excited. This pizza is my favorite. Thank you, God, for this. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Coconut. I love this one. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get back into this study. Okay, where are we? Where are we? Somebody tell me, because I forgot. 46, but what verse? What verse? Wait, no, first. What book? What book? What, what book are we studying? What book are we studying? Okay, good. Okay, now what chapter are we studying in the book of Revelation? Uh, and what verse are we studying? And this book is in a larger collection of books called the yeah. the Bible, exactly. And that is what we are studying. We are studying God's word, the Bible. So pay attention, not to what I have to say, but to what God has to say through his word. So let's look at verse 8. Let's read with me chapter 15, verse 8. Uh, the temple, so we're at the fourth scene. We had... The temple being opened, the angels come out of the temple. The four, one of the four living creatures gives the angels a bowl full of the wrath of God. And then, um, and then now we're on to the fourth scene, which, is, which we see in verse 8. And the, the setting here is the temple. The main actors are the angels. So the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Smoke will fill the heavenly temple, and no one will be allowed to enter it until after the plagues have been poured out on the earth. And note that this is smoke from two things, two parts of two aspects of God, from God's glory and from his power. So right before these judgments are poured out, we see this smoke filling the temple. So during these final plagues, God will be concealed in smoke. The smoke reminds us of his awesome fury. It's really cool because it's, it's, like, it's like you just see this, I see this mental picture of just this buildup right before the final judgments are being poured out on the earth. The sea of glass in front, or the, the sea in front of the throne, because we got God sitting on the throne, right, with the emerald rainbow around him and the four living creatures, and then we got the sea with the martyred saints on it, and it's turned, it's turned like, it's got mingled with fire. We see this, like, this build up, we see the red, and then, and then we see smoke filling up. The, we, the angels leave, get the, the judgments, and then the smoke fills the temple from God's glory and power. So uh, the smoke reminds us of his awesome fury. God's hiding from view also reminds us of his holiness, his separation from man by means of the veil, even, and even the day of atonement when no one but the high priest could enter the holy of holies. It is noteworthy, noteworthy about that. It is noteworthy that these verses about the earth's final judgment and magnify God's unapproachable holiness and His right to dictate the terms for drawing near to His presence. We must come to Him in His way and timing on His terms. So Revelation fifteen eight B. That's the second part of of uh, the scene, second part of the verse. Uh, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. So we get sort of this time span for how long the smoke's going to be in there, and it's until the end of um, the the last plague. So until the last plague's been poured out. So we conclude that the bull plagues will come at the end of the last three and one half years of the tribulation and will last only a short time. So this is the after the abomination of desolation, after um, the Antichrist has broken his treaty with Israel, and after Satan's been lost his access to, the, um, to heaven. So now that the backdrop and stage are set for the outpouring of the final judgments, Revelation chapter 16 gives the details. And we're going to, we're not finishing quite yet. We got to look at the first verse, but as I switch slides, um, it's, 
it's cool to note, um, I like where they put the chapter break here, because we see in the, from the last four, the last four scenes, last four verses, we see in verse, in chapter 16, verse 1, a shift in focus from heaven and the temple and the angels and God, we see a shift in focus to earth and it's going, and earth is going to receive all these judgments. So the seven bowls of God's wrath, we finally learn the details of the seventh trumpet. Remember, we have the seven seals, ju- seven seal judgments. In the seventh seal are the seven trumpet judgments. In the seventh trumpet are the seven bowl judgments, the final seven judgments poured out on the earth. Um, chapter, Revelation chapter 16, verse 1. Let's go ahead and read that. Um, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So, so it's, like, it's like when you're listening to a really hype song and it's building up, building up, building up, and then this is sort of like the drop. He, he tells the angels, go and pour out the, wrath of, the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth to the seven angels who have them. And that's when chaos ensues. Chaos in the sense of uh, these judgments. So then I heard a loud or megalis voice from the temple saying, God will command the angels to begin pouring out their judgments on the earth. Um, The voice from the temple must be God's because smoke will keep everyone angel or otherwise from entering. This chapter, chapter 16, could be called the chapter of greats since it is brimming with greats or enormities as shown by the repeated use of the Greek word megas and its uh, derivatives. So megas is used 10 times in this chapter, an important emphasis that can be missed if not reading from the original Greek. And it makes sense that these are the last seven judgments, then of course it's going to be big. Of course it's going to be uh, amazing in the sense of how like big it is, how great it is. So uh, we see this in, I'm going to go a little bit faster this, but 16 verse 1, we see, uh, we hear a great megalis, or John hears a great megalis voice. That's the same word, megas. Um, Revelation 16, 9, a fierce mega heat. Um, uh, then we see a great Megan River, <laughs> uh, the Euphra- Euphrates. Um, then we see Megalis, the great day of God. We see the allow. We hear a loud or Megale voice. In verse eighteen, we'll see a great and Megas earthquake, so mighty, Megas. So two uses of the word in verse. Um, in verse 18, and you might want to just no, jot down in your Bibles or whatever where these verses are at, um, so that as we go through the next chapter, then you can kind of you can kind of see it. No, okay, in the Greek, it's it's using this word megas, so great megas earthquake, so mighty or megas, uh, Babylon the Great uh, in verse 19, Babylon the Great megale, and then in verse 21, huge or megale hailstones. Extremely megale severe. Those are two uses of the verb again. Everything about these final judgments will be mega unparalleled in human history. Therefore, John repeatedly used the descriptive word great to remind us of the coming great horror as well as God's great and sovereign deliverance. I can kind of, I have this like mental picture of John, of John in heaven just looking at this and it's so big he's like run out of a list of words that are like big enough to describe it, so he just reverts to mega and use it it's over and over and over again. I'm sure, uh, like I've been in that situation before. It's like so incredible. I just can't use any other word except like amazing or awesome or something like that because I've run out of all the all the big words. Um, so a loud voice will command the seven angels to go and pour out the flasks of God's fierce wrath, fierce wrath upon the earth and its rebellious residents. Uh, let's go ahead and read. Um, read the second half of verse 1 again. Uh, this is the loud voice speaking. It says, go to the seven angels. Go and, excuse me, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. We see the shift in focus here. Uh, bless you, bless you. 
even though even though both the trumpet and bull judgments are similar in features, a careful reading shows that they will be be distinct in both magnitude and effect. And um, also, just y we can already know this by the uses of the word mega, the Greek word mega. Uh, the first four bulls will be splattered over all humanity and nature in general, while the fifth and sixth will be directly will be directed and specified toward the Antichrist's throne. The seventh and final judgment will again be worldwide and horrific beyond imagination. If you want to, you could in your Bible like like l highlight which ones are which, um, just if you want to. Uh, and that is the end of my section. JG, will you come up and get us started to go? Is this my PowerPoint? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, this is not your PowerPoint. You have to do this. Yeah. Uh, All right, so while we're doing that, I'll do a quick intro. All right, this is cool. Uh, so what's my name? Anybody? Jonathan, right, or JG, right? Don't give out my full name because we're live streaming here. So, <laughs> But hey, nice to meet you guys. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I would say I'm from Canada, but honestly, I'm a mutt. I'm from Bolivia. Now I live in Virginia, I guess, technically. I go to school there, so I'm a college student. And most of you already like heard me teach. Here, let me put this on here. So, Yeah, most of you already heard me teach. So most of you know I'm a pretty laid back guy, but I'm gonna be teaching about God's wrath, okay? <laughs> and so this is gonna be a fun time, but in all seriousness, we're talking about God's wrath here, okay guys? Like this is like huge, okay? This is not nothing to mess around. He's not sprinkling little dust and he's like a little pain. This is God's wrath. And so before we dive in, l let me just give a real quick word of prayer because I need it and you guys might need it. So here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this lovely day, Lord. Um, thank you for Texas. Thank you for the beautiful weather here, Lord. Thank you for the rain. Um, thank you for everybody that's been helping out at this conference, Lord. Uh, thank you for the church here at Combe. And um, thank you for everything you're doing here, Lord. Thank you for um, the testimonies we had last night, Lord. I know they impacted me a bunch, and they really touched my heart, Lord. And I, it's, it's just amazing, Lord, to see these young people here learning and craving for God's word. I know my first time going to these, these DM2 conferences, you know, I hated it, God, and it's amazing to see these first-timers say, I love it, I can't wait to come again. And so, Lord, I just pray that uh, you be with me, that I say the right things, Lord, and that um, all glory goes to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. All right, so what chapter are we in, guys? 16. 16. We just got done with what? 15, okay? So let's go to chapter 16, verse, let's start at verse 1, and I'm going to read my section. We all there? The cheaters are just, okay, if someone's falling asleep, guys, wake them up, because this is serious, okay? Usually I'd say let them sleep, but no. <laughs> then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. So where is he pouring this out? On the earth, right? So the earth inhabitants are getting affected by it. And a harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Can anyone guess what the first bowl or the first wrath is or plague? Boil sores, right? And we're going to be learning about that here coming up. Uh, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like what? Blood. Blood. So what's the second bowl? Blood of a corpse. And every living thing died. Uh, everything, yeah, every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became what? Blood. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I know it's after lunch, but... You guys are doing great. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was. For you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what, the blah, 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 blah. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch with fire. All right, fourth one, what is it? What's the sun doing? Scorching. Scorching. Oh, you guys are amazing. Awesome. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had the power over these plagues. They did not repent. Can anybody guess what repentance means? Change of mind. <laughs> okay. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and the kingdom was plugged um, into what? 
darkness. Awesome. People gnawed their tongues in a- anguish. And he cursed and cursed the God of heaven for their pain sores, pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, what? And his water was dried up. So, sixth one is? Awesome. Good job. I wish I had candy so I could. Uh, anyways. Um, dried up to the prepare the way for the kings from the east. So that's my section, guys. And so let's go in and see what we got to learn here. All right, Revelation 16, 1 through 21, the seven bowls of God's wrath. We finally learned the details of the seven trumpets. So a little tidbit about this is when um, Cody told me, he said, you're going to be teaching about the bowls. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And, you know, I read it, and I was like, oh, swords, you know, cool. And sun, you know, I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, "Ah, God's wrath, you know, it just, it kind of processed through me, but it kind of went over me like this. And then, because I'm in school for nursing, I went through anatomy, and I'm learning about, you know, the body and stuff. And as I was learning through this and going through the section, I was learning, and as I'm going through anatomy, it was like, God is punishing, and he is cursing these people. Like, this is no joke, guys. Like, these people are going to be in tremendous pain, and I'm going to try to break it down a little bit for you guys. So it might be a little bit of biology class. If you don't like biology, sorry, but, you know. <laughs> Revelation 16.1, a command will begin the final judgment. Now, it's important. Who gives the command here? God, right? Is this some sort of, like, I don't know, the environment going on here, climate change? No, right? It's God that's giving out these judgments. And is it because he's just being a bad guy? Is it because, I don't know, he's just bored and giving out these judgments? No, right? It's because they deserve these. I thought you had a question, Brett, and I was going to be like, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, command will begin the final judgment. Yes, sir. Then I heard a loud voice, Megales, voice from the temple. So is this a great voice, guys? Yes, right? Saying, God will command the angels to begin uh, pouring out their judgments on the earth. This voice from the temple must be God's, because smoke will keep everyone, angel or otherwise, from entering. Wait. I was going to say, I was like, man. There we go. There we go. We're here. First bowl, what is it? Swords. Okay, awesome. That was a little review, guys, okay? That was planned. All right, Revelations 2, 16a. For the first angel leaves the temple and pours his bowl over the face of the earth. A loathsome, malignant sore will fester up on each of the beast's followers. Okay? So, the sore is going to be very severe, and we're going to learn about, you see how it says sores? Well, let's go back to the Greek and see what it says here. Interestingly, the word sore is singular. Okay? What does singular mean? One, right? Therefore, it appears that each beast worshiper will get one disgusting and painful sore. Now, this is interesting, guys, because throughout the Bible, we talk about sores, okay? We talk about boils, sores, but in Revelation here in 16.2, it's the only time it mentions one sore. So I'd like to go to an example here. It's in Exodus 9.8. So they took the soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh. Then Moses threw it into the air, and it became boils, producing running sores on people and animals. So they were covered in sores, okay? But here, it would just be one sore. So, uh, we're talking about Exodus here, so does anybody guess when this plague would have happened? In Egypt, right? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Anyways, the original Greek, loathsome keikos, carries the idea of repulsive, ugly, rotten, horrible in the parodic sense, okay? And the original Greek, malignant, phoneros, conveys the idea of something vile or stinking and accompanied by grievous and agony pain. So if this is obviously um, smelling, and it's, it's, it's like ugly and all these things, something's obviously infected, right? We're going biology here, guys, okay? So turn your biology brains on. This would be a big sore, okay? It's infected, it's huge, it's ugly, it's disgusting. And if it's infected in all this, the, um, the people that are getting this are the, the, the beast worshipers, okay? And they'll be getting this, and they'll be getting this to the sores, and it'll be very painful. If it's stinking like that, I mean, it's infected, obviously, and it'll be very painful. So it's not something you want to have, obviously. So, Revelation 16b, in this plague, God will make a distinction between those who have the mark of the beast and those who do not. So, who's getting the sores, guys? Or sore? The, the, the people who are worshiping the beast. Yes, sir. Only those with the mark will be afflicted. So, these people that, that are beast worshiper, guys, who are they worshiping? Who are they following here? Satan, Satan right? And this curse, guys, is, is obviously going to be on, on, um, on people. Like, this isn't... 
how do I put this? This cur like this wrath, God's wrath is not going to be on believers, right? Where are we going to be, guys, when all this is happening? Heaven. Heaven, right? And that is such a great thing because we're going to be learning that, like learning through this, that you obviously don't want to be around here. It's going to, I don't think there's a word to try to explain it, but it's going to suck, like, a lot, okay? <laughs> like, in all seriousness, this is going to be awful. And it's so awesome to me that I have lived my life so great that I'll be going into heaven. No. Right? No. No, no right? Ah, oh, my bad. A little heresy there. Hey, no, in all seriousness, it's, it's thanks that I asked Jesus into my heart that I'll be going into heaven. I won't be experiencing this, right? No? Okay, well, let me try to think here. What other gospels are there that I've believed in? Um, hey, I gave my life to Christ. That's why I'm going into heaven, and I won't experience this. No, right? Let's all go to Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 real quick. I'm getting close, yeah. Ish, maybe. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. If someone wants to read that, that'd be awesome. If some, all right, go ahead, Cody. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So why am I not getting God's wrath, guys? Why am I going to heaven? It's not because of what I have done. It's not because of what I've given God. It's because of what? Grace. It's for by grace through what? Through faith, right? And I, I just want to hit on that a little bit because that is concrete, guys. That is the fundamentals, like Jamie was saying, of everything. So we can look at this God's wrath, guys, and we can be like, wow, this really sucks. But guess what? We'll be in heaven with God, right? Um, Rutledge taught, taught on this, and he did a phenomenal job on Revelation 14.9. And I just want to kind of put it on here. Does anyone remember what Relish talked about of beast worshippers? What will happen with beast worshippers? Let's go ahead and read the. Let's go ahead and read the verse real quick. And another angel, a third, with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath. Is this something good, guys? God's wrath. You do not want to be on the other. Yeah. Anyways. Pour full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever. Excuse me. And they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So, guys, once you receive the mark, there's no going back, okay? And this isn't because God's like, ah, you know, I, God has given you multiple chances, and you, you, you pick your, your team, okay? So, you just wanted to put that out there. All right, second bowl, what is it, guys? Sir, uh, sea turned into blood, okay? Now, let's learn what, what kind of blood this is. Revelation 16, 3a. Let's go ahead and read Revelation 16, 3a. I'll go ahead and read it. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like blood of a, what, corpse. And everything living died that was in the sea. So is this just part of the sea that died? No, right? Everything in the sea died. So a little biology here real quick. Um, when we're talking about a dead person's blood, there is a lot of chemicals and like that gets released, okay? And so I want you guys to all close your eyes real quick. Let's imagine we're beast worshipers, okay? And we're in this, okay? And... The, the second bowl has been poured, and now the whole sea is turned into blood, okay? Now I'm going to read off some things that it might smell like. You ready? Yeah. First, <laughs> thank you, Cody, for your enthusiasm. The first smell, rotting flesh, okay? Feces odor. Mothball-like smells. Rotten eggs. Rotting cabbage. And garlic odors, Okay? So process that through your nostrils real quick. Is that something you want to live on day by day, smelling that? No, right? All right, you guys can open your eyes now. That is awful. That is not something you want to smell, guys. This is going to be really, really bad. And obviously, um, therefore, the air over all the world will become unhealthy, right? Because all these chemicals are being released. But at the same time, because there is no water and everything died in the sea, did you know that photoplankton produces about 50 to 85% of the oxygen in the world, and they will all die? Now, think about it as a pie, right? If I eat 50% of the pie, that's a lot of piece of the pie, right? How about 85% of the pie? That's a lot of the pie. So 85 to 50% of the oxygen will not be able to be produced because the photoplankton will be dead. So minimal oxygen and sores, okay? And they will obviously have no, um, yeah, no, no going to the beach. 
Also, also, real quick, coagulated blood. I'm sorry, uh, I'm thinking anatomy because that's all, that's all I did for the past few months. Coagulated blood. This is a dead person's blood. Okay, what happens is that this is a very thick blood. It's, it's thicker than just regular water. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, Revelation 16:3b. Everything living in all oceans, including fish, mammals, and birds, will be affected. So this blood is going to be too toxic, okay, for them to live in. It's going to be too thick. They can't breathe in it. So everything's going to die, guys. Everything. Everything. Photoplankton. Everything. Nothing's going to be living in this, okay? It's going to be too toxic. In the second trumpet judgment, only a third of the marine life was killed. So in the second tr uh, trumpet judgment, how much of the sea life was affected, guys? How about in this bowl judgment? All, right? And that's very, very important to realize. But here the devastation is even greater, still every living thing in the sea dying. God's judgment will cause this calamity, okay? Not warfare or biological weapons. So I was thinking, you know, people do this even today with creation. Think about creation, okay? Do they think of a creator? No, right? Who do they blame it on? They blame it on evolution. They blame it on Bing Bang or whatever. But I'm thinking about all these organ, like organ systems that I've learned about, and I'm thinking about all these things that... that have to go into place for things to work, like your eyes, your ears, your cardiovascular system, all these things, it makes sense that there's a designer, okay? And it's, it's so, so, so awful how sin works and how it blinds us, guys. And so, um, yeah. Also, what's interesting is I looked up maybe a, a little, a few examples of what they might blame it on, and I've seen this too, because I've lived in an ocean, and it's something called red tide, okay? The water can't turn red. Okay, but God's not talking about turning the water into red. He's talking to blood, like turning to blood. Nothing can turn into blood like that. This is a miraculous. This is God's event, okay? So keep that in mind. Revelation 16, 4 through 7, the third bowl. All fresh water turned to blood. So let's go ahead and read that, 4 through 7. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became like what? Blood. blood. Awesome, guys. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say what? Just are you. Uh, I think I went a little, no I didn't. Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. So who's talking here, guys? It's the angel in charge of that bowl, right? For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I'll stop right there for now. The third angel poured out his bowl plague on all rivers, fountains of water, causing them to also become blood. So not only does the sea become blood, but what? Fresh water, rivers, streams, all these things, right? So let's think about it real quick. Let's th use our critical thinking caps. If all fresh water turns into blood, what will happen? You get thirsty, right? You have nothing to drink. Do we, I, I don't drink enough water, okay, which is not healthy. But a lot of the things that I eat or have have water in it, right? However, we'll see that all water um, like sources will be affected. So that, think about that, okay? So you have sores, you have, you have a sore right now, right? Which will be, it will be causing you all types of uh, body problems, like inflammation, I don't even, I don't even know, okay? But <laughs> you got the sea turned into blood, but also now fresh water, so you can't drink any water, okay? So keep that in mind. So now you're, you're going to get dehydrated more and more and more. Man depends on fresh water for life. Therefore, we know every, everyone will suffer greatly from this plague through scripture doesn't give details, Okay? Can anybody guess how many days a, a man can go without water? Three days, right? So these people are going to be in grave state, guys. This isn't, like, this is no joke. This is going to be detrimental. Like, this is, wow. Like, talk about God's wrath and how he wanted to call his judgment on people. Like, we might think, like, we, we might know how to judge people and what they deserve and stuff. But, wow, like, this is amazing. I think it's amazing how God is judging them. In the third trumpet judgment, these water sources were made bitter, okay? So in the third tr uh, trumpet judgment, what happened to the waters? Made bitter, right? In the third bold plague, they'll be turned into blood, a harsher judgment that reminds us of God's first plague. Like the Egyptian plagues, these target idolatry and show the stupidity of depending on human-inspired God rather than, yeah, human-inspired God rather than the almighty God creator. So whose team should we be on, guys? God's, right? Who wins in the end? God. Revelation 16.5. After this judgment, the angel that seems to be responsible for the earth's water will praise God. 
declaring that he was perfectly right to turn all water into blood. Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judge these things. This same angel will explain God's perfect justice in this judgment. Uh, Revelation 16:6a. For they poured out the blood of saints and prophets. They will declare that since the world took the blood of God's saints from them, God is right to give them blood to drink. This statement reminds us of the cr- of ground crying out for God or out to God for vengeance after Cain murdered Abel. Uh, 16:6b. And you have given them blood to drink. They what? Deserve it. Since the unsaved under Satan command, Satan's command have freely spilled the blood of the saints. God will turn water into blood for them to drink. God will bring, uh, bring against them the perfect ju- punishment for their rebellion against him. I think um, Pastor Clay put this in a really cool way, is that the angels are waiting, right? They're like waiting for, for God to bring out his judgment. Why? Because think about our lives, guys. Are we living in obedience? Are we living to glorify God all the time? No, right? And these angels are. And they're like, ah, look at these guys. And this angel's probably thinking like, yes, God, Give them blood, you know, because that's what they deserve. And that is what they deserve. And God is the perfect judge, guys, okay? And always keep that in mind. And God is always in control, even in this. Revelation 16, 7a. Let's go ahead and read 16, 7. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your what? Judgments. Guys, is God the perfect judge? Yes, right? So... The voice of the altar in heaven will praise God's judgment. Think about this, guys. Isn't that kind of cool to think about? Like, imagine it, okay? An inanimate object will praise God. Isn't that awesome? That's how, like, glorious God is, okay? That even inanimate objects will praise him. I think that's pretty cool. We should likewise always praise God's righteous judgments. If inanimate objects can do it, guys, shouldn't we also? Revelation 67b. God is completely just and above man's, uh, man's evaluation, sinful man evaluation and correction. His judgments are always righteous because he is righteous. Revelations 15, 3, 3 3-4. And sang the song of, servant of God's servant Moses and for the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will, who will not fear you, God, our Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are what? Holy. Holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for, righteous, for your righteous acts have been revealed. You see, guys, everyone at the end is going to know that this is God, okay? That is how powerful God is. Revelation 16, 8 through 8. Let's go ahead and read that. Or 8 through 9, not A. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with what? Fire. Fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had the power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So is this repentance calling about, oh, I feel sorry, God, I'm so sorry? No, right? This is what? Change of mind. But we'll see in these times, they're not looking to change their minds. And God's not looking for them to change their minds either. God is judging now, okay? And Alex brought a good point, is that we see wrath throughout the Bible, right, of judgments. God, for example, in Exodus, God was looking for them to show him that he is the true God and looking for them to repent. Here, he's given them his chances, and now they've made, they chose their, their team, and now God is um, going out, like, his wrath on them. So, you do not want to be in this situation, guys. So, it's such a great hope that we'll be where in this situation? In heaven, because I what, Cody? Awesome. Thank you, Cody. <laughs> so the fourth bowl, mankind, mankind scorched by the sun. Now, obviously, I don't have to tell you about guys, like, you guys, heat, heat, like, it's tremendous down here, right, or something? So I won't even hit on that. You guys know what, if it's going to get hot, you guys know about heat. <laughs> Revelation 16, 8, or 16, 8. The fourth angel's bowl will affect the what? The sun. The sun. Beast worshipers will already suffer from painful sore and from a lack of sanitary water for drinking and cleansing, okay? So, do we have, we have sores on us, right? Or a sore, okay? We have a sore. What else? Bring it on, guys. No water, right? No, no washing. Can't wash your sores, so they're getting even more infected, right? Neosporin ain't helping here, guys, okay? This is, this is bad. Like, this is really bad. 
And also, now what? Sun. So they don't have water. And now God's like, you know what? I'm going to add this. Boom. I'll give you sun. Okay? This is God's wrath, guys. And this is... Ooh. Okay. These worshipers were already suffering from a painful sore and from lack of sanitary water for drinking and cleansing. Now, searing heat will be added to their suffering. The sun's temperature will be intensified as never before in Earth's history. How hot has it gotten here before, guys? 110. You could probably fry an egg on that, right? Probably. Well, guess what? It's going to get hotter than that in these situations. So this is not a good situation to be in. Yes, sir. (laughs) No, no, thank you. The two witnesses had the power to cause drought by shutting up the skies. Okay, so the two witnesses had power to do what? Shutting up the skies, right? But these plague will, uh, this plague will be much more intense because it will scorch the entire what? The entire world, okay? You see, guys, this is God's full wrath. This isn't just half of him. You know, he's sending out all his wrath, okay? And this is, like, this is tremendous. The fourth trumpet will cause the celestial realm to darken. But conversely, the fourth bowl will cause it to what? Brighten, right? And burn the earth. Sixteen A A. Sadly, or nine A. Sadly, this plague will cause blasphemes rather than change in thinking, repentance about Creator God. Wow. Instead of seeing that this is God, they're what? They're like, they're I don't know what they're doing. They're, they're saying bad things about God, obviously, right? So it looks like the heat broke them. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Because the judgment will cause verbal blaspheme, it may affect only unbelievers or unbelievers only. Okay. The definite article, D, is used with the phrase to scorch, the men, Um, that Greek word with fire. This same uh, Greek word was used in verse 2 to refer specifically to those men who will choose to receive the mark of the beast. Okay? So, again, this fire may scorch just the unbelievers, the uh, the beast worshippers. Okay? So, if it's just scorching them, guess what, guys? There's also believers in these times that are going through this. Okay? So that, they're going through a lot, too. But yet, what happens when they die? They're blessed, right? Because they went through all this. For the first time in the book of Revelation, unbelievers are set to what? Let's, okay, you guys are falling asleep on me, okay? For the, for, okay? for the first time in the book of Revelation, unbelievers are set to what? Blasphemy. So much better. Thank you. The name of God. Regrettably, throughout the tribulation, the rejection of God will increase. So is it going to decrease, guys? No, right? It's going to increase and in- intensify rather than soften into repentance. So the more and more that they see a God, instead of going to repentance, they're what? They're like blaspheming, okay? So they've made, they've chose their team, okay? Think about it as basketball, okay? Who's played basketball or any sport, really? When you see your other opponent's team winning, are you happy? No, right? They're watching the other team winning right now, God, or not God, guys. God's team is winning, okay? He's pouring out his wrath, and they are not happy. They're blaspheming God, okay? Blasphemy here means to revile or hurt the reputation of someone with false words. They will continually speak evil of God, repeating the Antichrist words of Revelation 13, 6. So where are they getting all these these mentalities, guys, and all these these words and thinking about, ah, let's blaspheme God from the mouth of the Antichrist, right? Increasingly, they will act with the fury of Satan, whom they serve. So who are they serving? Satan. Satan. Is that someone we want to serve? No. Why? Because he's going to lose in the end, right? He might be winning right now. He might be shooting all the baskets. But guess what? God's coming back with a comeback. It's going to be good. <laughs> Revelation 13, 6. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering the haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for, t- for 42 months. Pastor Clay gave a, a good analogy of this. When we're talking about months, what are we talking about? What? We're thinking about the the black hat, right, and the cowboys. So what does that mean? Bad guys, right? It opened his mouth to utter blaspheme against God, blaspheming his name and his indwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Revelation 16, 9b. They blaspheme the name of God who has the power over these plagues. Who has the power over these plagues? God. Who is signing off these these wraths, these plagues? God, right? And yet they blaspheme it. Again, John reminds us that God is the one with power. God is in control. 
and Jesus is the lo Lord over these judgments. So again, he's signing away these wraths, and, and they're going out and blaspheming. God is always in control. God is in control now, guys, and God is always in control. He will always be in control. Revelation 16, uh, 9c. They did not repent, okay? They did not have a change of mind so as to give him glory. They will not know that God deserves worship. Uh, they will. They will. Okay, there we go. They will know that God deserves worship, but what will they do? They'll be unwilling to give it. Disappointingly, no revival will come in the end. Only the exposure of man's total rebellion and hardness of heart. So again, they chose their team. Their their team, okay, and they're not gonna. They're gonna see that God is there. God has given all these wraths, and He's showing that God is God. God is in control. God is Almighty, and yet, who who do they serve? It's Satan. Revelation sixteen ten through eleven. The fifth bowl, it's darkness. So let's go ahead and read ten to eleven. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into what? Darkness. Darkness. So what's the fifth bowl? Darkness. Okay. People gnaw their tongues in anguish and curse the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. Revelation 16.10a. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened. So this is going to be a local darkening, kind of like we've seen in Exodus with the Egyptians and the, and the Israelites, okay? This bowl will be poured directly on the beast throne, which will probably be located in the rebuilt city of Babylon, the Antichrist capital. Okay? The Antichrist empire will be satanically energized in rebellion against God. Therefore, God will take this judgment directly to the Antichrist throne. And we'll see um, why here in a minute. The menacing darkness enveloping the Antichrist imperial kingdom will, si will be the signal, the beginning of the end for him and his satanic government. The previous plague uh, made the earth extraordinarily bright and hot, right? Now the earth will be extraordinarily dark. We see in Exodus 10, 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards the sky so that the darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be what? So, in this darkening in, in um, the Antichrist kingdom, it's going to turn dark, right? And you might be thinking, well, that's kind of you poured out sores, you poured out heat, you poured out no water, and it's dark. But think about it this way. It can be felt. He can feel that the end is coming. And would that be something you want if you were the Antichrist? No, right? Because you are trying to get everything done, and God's telling you, your end is coming soon, and my, my beginning's coming. And it has, that'd be scary. Revelation 16, 10b. This darkness may preview the darkness of the lake of fire since fierce pain comes with it. They nod their tongues because of pain. The verb nod is in the passive voice, indicating an involuntary, uncontrollable response. So think about that, guys. You're in so much pain that your body is responding to start biting your tongue. You try and like think about a different pain. That really doesn't happen. Usually you faint before you have that much pain. But yet, God will allow it for them to, to not faint, obviously, and go through this pain. That is an unbelievable amount of pain, okay? A pain that we can't even describe. Revelation 16, 11a. And they blaspheme the God of heaven because their pains and their what? Sores. Not only will they bite and chew their tongues because of the pain, but they will use those same tongues to curse who? God. The one who gave them life and desired to give them eternal life with them. You see, guys, God gave them multiple chances. It's not that he didn't give them chances and he found this select group of people and he's like, I hate these guys and I'm just going to give them my full wrath. No, he gave them full chances and they're getting exactly what they deserve. Okay? God is the perfect judge, guys. And he gave us multiple chances. Even our, our lives. Think about it in our lives. How many chances did he give us? How many chances does he give us? You know? So many chances. And I think, I thank God that I am, that I serve a God that is all about grace and not about works. Because if it was by works, man, I'd be in a screwed up place probably. So, and I would not be, I, yeah, I would not be in, in heaven if it was by works. These unbelievers received one sword, each at the outpouring of the first bowl. So is this a talking about you're going to be covered in sores, like pre previous plagues? How many sores? One, right? The text indicates that now more pain will be added to the pain of those sores. Wow. Okay. He's like, he's thinking, this, you should add more pain to this. He's like, you're going to get my full wrath. So, yeah, this is not good, guys. The fact that the swords from the first bowl judgments are still present during the fifth bowl judgment is another indication that the judgments will, pour, will be poured out in rapid succession. 
So this isn't happening over decades. This isn't happening over years, okay, guys? We don't know exactly how, like, the timeline, but it's happening relatively quick, okay? Revelation 16, 11b. Even though these unbelievers will suffer horribly throughout these judgments in isolence and pride, they will not change their thinking. So what's the word for change of, th uh, change of thinking? Repentance. About the rebellion against God. Astonishingly, they will continue to blaspheme the very one who could end their suffering. Sin creates such a mockery, doesn't it, guys? And it's sad. All right, the sixth bowl. Okay, my final bowl that I'll be talking about. Let's go ahead and read 12. Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and read 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river. What? Now, when it's talking about great, uh, the Megas, this is a great river, right? Okay? So it's a huge river, and its water was dried up uh, to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So let's look into that real quick. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its waters were dried up. The river will dry up so that the armies can easily cross it. Historically, the 2,800-kilometer uh, Euphrates River, the eastern boundary of the ancient Roman Empire has effectively separated the east from the west. Okay? And I'll, I'll get a map here coming up here soon. Prophetically, this river is the eastern boundary of the land God promised who? Okay? Does God always fulfill his promises, guys? Yes, right? Let's keep that in mind. Solomon extended Israel's authority, authority to this boundary for a brief period of time. You guys remember Solomon? Who was Solomon? 700 wives. Yeah. Good. He's he was also king, right? I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Revelation sixteen twelve b. God will dry the Euphrates River so that the kings from the east can easily march their armies westward into Israel. Okay. Anybody be thinking? Wait a minute. Isn't is God giving them like a little a little t like help here, drying up the river? Well, maybe, but we'll see what happens though, right? Though this judgment seems minor compared to the others, it will prepare the way for the great battle of Armageddon. Is this battle something that they're going to win, guys? What happens in Armageddon to these people? It is literally a slaughterhouse, okay? So in the Megiddo Valley of Israel, uh, northern Israel, armies will cross the dry Euphrates, expecting an easy victory, only to meet a bloody doom. So they're probably thinking as soon as God dries up the river, they're like, God, why, why are you doing this? You're so dumb. We're going to beat you. But yet, God, with one swipe, slaughters everyone. And that is how powerful God is. And, ugh, I, ugh, it's, I'm thankful I'll be watching it and not getting slaughtered or anything, so thanks be to God for that. These armies may include soldiers from China, India, and Japan, since they lie east of Jerusalem and compromise a majority of the world's population. Note that the Bible states that the armies from what kind of nations? All nations will follow the Antichrist. So even America is going to follow the Antichrist, guys. Might be hard to believe, but yeah, they will. The Bible never directly... Uh, never directly mentions China, Japan, or India. When the Bible speaks of people from the east, it speaks mainly of the of Babylon or the inhabitants of Mesopotamia. Okay. These leaders and their armies will probably meet in the Shinar Valley. The drying of the Euphrates River will make it easy for them to then travel westward to Israel Megiddo's Valley. Interestingly, no mention is made of the Tigris River. Another reason we do not view these armies as only from eastern countries. So I got a little map here, guys. And so, here's the Euphrates River, right, guys? Okay, uh, all right, tough crowd. Anyways, here's the Tigris River, okay? So, we think that they'll probably meet right here, about 50 miles away from, from here, okay, right by the river, all the nations, right, all the armies of the world, and they'll travel westward, which is this way, okay, to the Shiner Valley to die. And it's going to be it's gonna be bloodshed, and it's going to be... I'm glad I'm on the right team because it's going to suck. So, in all seriousness, the essential part of this is that God is in control, guys, and God is a just God, okay? And God is pointing out his wrath on these people. Go ahead. Before I forget. No, nah, go ahead. It's good. It's good. Yeah. So
Cool, thank you, Brett. All right, and so that's my section. I hope you guys got something out of it. If you didn't, just know that God's wrath is not something you want to be at the. <laughs> Anyways, God's wrath is not something you want to be a part of, okay? This is not like your parents' wrath, which is scary. This is God's wrath, okay? So, who's next? Oh, break? Or pray? Yeah, okay. I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for I've given us, Lord. Thank you for this amazing group of kids here and adults, Lord. There's adults here, here too, and that's amazing. Young at heart. I love that. And Lord, I just, um, I pray that, uh, that we have a great day today, Lord, that we learn a lot. I just thank you that we're part of your team, Lord, the winning team. Um, Lord, I just, I pray that, um, if they didn't get anything out of it, they got that, um, salvation is not by works, Lord, but it's by faith in what you've done through your son, Lord. And, Lord, at the same time, I pray that um, they also understand that it, if I can get up here and, and teach on God's wrath, anybody can get up here and teach on God's wrath, Lord. Um, you can use anybody. And, um, yeah, I just pray that we have a great end of the day. Um, everyone stays um, safe. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Just keep on trekking. It's three. It's two o'clock on New Year's Day. Happy 2020. It's a good day to be alive. Hope you have 2020 vision this year. And uh, that's a vision to reach your world. 2020 vision. And maybe you got a friend. This could be the 2020 year for them to where they could see the gospel with clear eyes and clear vision. So be praying that way. And uh, let me encourage you to, even if you were not to say, maybe teach your best friend the book of Revelation as the first thing you're going to teach them, we do have a curriculum that we just finished on the book of John. Uh, the Gospel of John verse by verse. Awesome study. And uh, it goes through the Gospel very, very clearly and hits it from many different ways so that people can, can see Jesus the way he is and the way he is presented in the Word of God and the way he presented himself, which is awesome because we have an awesome Savior who is God become flesh, God become man and dwelt among us. So if you were going to uh, save a mound of, um, of, um, of ants from a, from a road grader that was coming to plow them away, you know, what would you do? Well, you could get a, set up a, a, a megaphone, as Jamie was teaching, megaphone, uh, a big phone, a big speaker, and you could preach to them. Hey, ants, get ready. There's a, get out of here. There's a, there's a road grader coming to plow you away, so get out of the way. Uh, build your nest somewhere, build your house somewhere else, and they probably wouldn't understand you. They may not like the sound, and so they may move just because, man, what's this noise here? But other than that, they would probably just stay there and keep on doing what ants do, you know, building their mound taller and taller, waiting to bite you if you stepped on them. But there may be a way uh, to reach the ants, and if you were a very clever person, you might could become an ant and go down and actually touch antennas with them and send them a subliminal message that says, hey, there's a danger on the horizon Get out of here, move your nest somewhere else, move a long ways away from here because you will be plowed under. And that'd be a good way to reach ants, I think. You know, become an ant. You know, um, God took a deeper step than that. He came down here to become one of us. And he left the glories of heaven, Jesus, God the Son, the eternal Son of God. Uh, who was always with the Father and the Holy Spirit from all eternity. God became a man and dwelt among us, and he communicated to us how we can escape the judgment to come. Now, you may think God is not very loving, but uh, he is very loving. In fact, when God created man back in the Garden of Eden, uh, he put two trees there. One tree would give you death. But the other tree would actually give you life. It was called the tree of life. And you know what kind of life it would give you? It would give you eternal life. Now, I wouldn't mind having one of those in my backyard. But um, a tree that would give you eternal life. Um, because we know it would give you eternal life because he said, get the, we got to get man out of this garden lest he reaches forth his hand and take from the fruit and eat and live forever. And so there was, there was death before man. And life. And you know what God wanted man to do? He wanted him to choose life. In fact, he put him in a perfect garden. He didn't put him like in a, a junkyard with sharp stuff sticking out of the ground and painful things and all kinds of diseases all around him and one kind of food that tasted like rotten eggs or something. He put him on a beautiful planet. He put him on, in a beautiful garden that he had specifically designed for man. He gave him all kinds of fruit trees, probably many that we don't even have today, and he gave him everything, including instructions not to choose death. He said, don't eat from that tree because in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. In other words, I want you to choose life, not death. That's how he created man. But God is a gentleman, and God is seeking something. We know from John chapter 4, God is seeking something. Who knows what God is seeking uh, from, yes, he's tr seeking true worshipers, true worshipers. What, what are, what's a true worshiper? person who worships in spirit and in truth. In other words, if you're going to 
If you want to have true worshipers, then you want to have worshipers that choose to worship you. So how do you do that? Well, you create a world, and you don't force them to worship you. You put before them something that will kill them and something that will give them life, and you don't force them to eat what, what will kill them. In fact, you warn them against that, and if they believe you, guess what you found? A true worshiper. But if they disbelieve you and they go against you and they believe someone that gives them a lie, you have discovered someone that is not your worshiper. And you know what? You've got before you today life and death still to this day. Now, you've already chosen death. You were born with that choice made. But God offers to you eternal life. He's offering to you um, something that will give you eternal life, and he's offering it to you as a free gift. But he is not forcing you to make that choice. But if you decide to, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what he has instantly found? A true worshiper. You know he's going to spend eternity with true worshipers? And he set the whole thing up. The litmus test between a true worshiper and a false worshiper is faith. And remember, faith is not a work. To the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. In other words, God does not consider faith to be a work. And in, in reality, faith is not a work. Well, yeah, faith's a work. No, it isn't. I am going to trust that this chair will hold me up. You know, I'm, here's a chair, and I'm going to trust this chair to hold me up, keep me from falling. So I trust in this chair, and who's doing the work to keep me from falling? The chair, not my faith, the chair. You see, what makes the difference in faith is the object of your faith. Now, I could trust in a very rickety old chair and sit in, and I could have the faith of a, you know, uh, great faith, but what would happen if I trust in a, in a rickety, old, broken chair? I'm going to fall. I'm trusting in the wrong thing. Let me ask you, did those men that flew into the Twin Towers back in 2001 or whatever it was, 9-11, did those men have faith? They had enough faith to die. They died believing that instantly, what would they do instantly when they killed themselves in jihad? They would go to their paradise, and what would they get? Seventy-something. Seventy virgins. <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to do. But anyway, they, wanted, they, they thought that, that that's heaven to them. And they had a lot of faith. They had so much faith that they believed that they could run into a mountain or a, a building and die for that, and they would go to heaven. Um, that's a lot of faith. Were they believing in a, in, a, in a good object? No, they were believing in a lie. Because they didn't wake up with 70 virgins. They wake, woke up uh, with 700 degrees of heat. I mean, they woke up in hell instantly. And that, is, that was their choice. They were believing a lie, just like you could believe a lie. You could trust in yourself to get you to heaven. And so what, what we're seeing in Revelation here is, is God, even though he is pouring out judgment, and especially at the very end, his judgment is on people who have already aligned themselves with the Antichrist. They've taken the mark of the beast. And he's already said through this angel that flies through heaven, don't do it. You do it, you're signing your own death warrant. And so um, there are people who haven't actually taken the mark of the beast. Do you know that there are people that go all the way through the whole tribulation that actually live all the way to the very end that never take the mark of the beast? That's awesome. Uh, that means they're believers and they were able to hide out in some cave and they had a stash of water and some food and some cans of sardine or something. You know, they were able to avoid death and avoid uh, the the hatchet to the neck, the, the axe to the neck, and they were able to live through. And actually, they are brought together by angels at the very end. He gathers his elect from the four corners of the earth. In other words, he gathers those who are believers on the whole earth and removes them before this 
bowl judgment that we're fixing to see, the seventh bowl judgment, happens. And why does he do that? Because this seventh bowl judgment is the most severe judgment to ever hit planet Earth. Uh, I mean, it's already been bad enough that they don't have any drinking water. They can't go to the beach and bathe in salt water. They got this sore that's killing, killing them with pain. Uh, they've been through darkness. They've been through heat. Um, but now, and then they've seen the Euphrates dry up, and these armies are marching across to do battle with Israel, but their battle is going to be turned heavenward because they're going to see the Lord coming, and they're going to think, well, we'll fight against Jesus once he gets here, and we'll beat him. And they probably got all their uh, surface-to-air missiles, everything pointed heavenward to fight against Jesus, and they lose. <laughs> they don't knock him out of the air. He doesn't get hit by their shots. He destroys the armies of the world. But this last bowl judgment, if you're anywhere on the surface of this earth in an unprotected area by God, you will be destroyed. And you'll see why here in a minute. Um, there's going to be some major, major things that happen. So keep this in mind. So we're leading between, we're between the sixth and the seventh bowl. And almost in every, well, in every one of the, the, between the sixth and the seventh judgment, whether it's the seals, the trumpets, or now the bowls, there's always a little break in the commentary. And there's this extra information, uh, what does Clay call it? The uh, cliff, uh, the, uh, not the cliff notes, but what is it? Special effects, okay, or whatever, special features. <laughs> so he gives the special features. And so he's going to give a little break here, and he's going to tell, what happens between the sixth bowl and the seventh and how the world is, is brought to, uh, to the state of we're going to fight against God and against his people. And we're going, to, we're going to win. And so we come to chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. So let's read 13 to 16 to start with. I'll let someone out there read those and we'll have a quick word of prayer after that and continue on yes please yeah mm -hmm. go for it Okay, so how many of you ever heard of the Battle of Armageddon? Okay, well, you're fixing to hear about it again. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just beckon to you and ask you to give us understanding, Lord. These are difficult verses in some ways to understand, but Lord, we, uh, we just thank you for um, just the ability to kind of stop and analyze these things verse by verse. But God, as we think of that, um, us teachers, Lord, we're... We're so needy, and we're so, we lack sometimes the words to explain things. We um, lack the knowledge and the understanding that we need. So we're just crying out to you, dear God, for, for exactly what we stand in need of. I pray for the students, Lord, because they're hearing so many different words and terminologies and so many different concepts and maybe some things that sound unfair or fearful. Or maybe they're, maybe they're just thinking, wow, finally justice. I, I don't know, but God, you know. You know each heart that's in here. You know where everybody stands. So God, I just pray, oh, Father, that you would open up understanding and give clarity. And Father, answer the questions that are, that are being asked in our hearts, Lord. Um, Lord, we, we so much need you, but we thank you that we have the Holy Spirit who is the true teacher. We have the word of God, which is the truth in written form. We have everything that pertains to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us. And you want us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we ask you to do that for us. We ask you, Lord, to turn our eyes to Jesus and let us see Jesus today in a deeper way and, a, and fall in love more and more with our Savior. 
And we pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. And so we have here a brief interlude between the sixth and seventh bowl judgments. And it's called, This is Armageddon, an explanation of Armageddon. Let's examine the following details that will help us to accurately interpret this passage. So, so the, the world will, um, will spend little time preparing for the battle of Armageddon. In other words, they're going to get ready really fast. And it's probably because they're recognizing uh, there's a point in, in the chronology of things where the world begins to say, the wrath of God has come. And it actually starts very early in the tribulation. They begin to realize, if you go with me back to Revelation chapter 6, um, and um, the, you hear the, the, the world beginning to realize when, and, then, and this is back in the seal judgments, the first judgments that God brings on the earth. In chapter 6, verse um, Let's start in verse um, 16, I mean verse 12, it says, And I looked, and he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it, when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and, and among the rocks of the mountain. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of, of, of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Now, um, the world begins to realize that these are not just happenstances or, you know, global warming. It's just happening. Rather, they, they in the, by the time the sixth seal um, comes around, the world understands that God is bringing this on them, that Jesus is fighting. And so you ramp that up. You know, you got the seven trumpets. You got the seven bowls. I mean, the world knows that this is from God, these judgments. And so what do they do? They react. They react against God. Rather than falling and saying, crying out to God. What, what does the Bible say? Draw near to God and he will run from you. He'll draw near to you. So if they would clamor to God in, in simple childlike faith, but God, I want to know you, you know, God, help. God would, you know, that, that little tiny response to what he's doing. You see, they wouldn't do that on their own, but... It, if you look around and you see, wow, there must be a God out there, and you respond, you take a tiny step toward him because he's drawing you, and he comes a country mile to you. You see, that's the God we have. And, and yet these people remain resistant, especially the ones who take the mark of the beast. They've already made their decision, and they're locked into it. And so the world will spend little time preparing for the battle of Armageddon. Uh, which will end the tribulation. Let's read about Armageddon in, in chapter 19. So we're going to get more information on this battle, but looking at verses 17 through 21, we read the following. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in the midheaven, in midheaven, come, assemble for the great supper of God. You don't want to be at that supper. At least you don't want to be on the table. Uh, like the pig with the apple in its mouth, you know, um, because that's going to be a supper you want to avoid. So that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the throne and against his army. And the beast was seized with him, the false prophet, who performed signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast. And those who worshipped the image, those who were thrown alive, in, uh, those two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of of him who sat on the horse, that's Jesus, and all the birds were filled with their flesh, and that's the armies of the world. So that's 
going to be a battle that hmm, is won by one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And we get to watch following along on white horses, trying to st stay clean from the blood, I suppose. The sixth trumpet will have uh, released from the, uh, from the, four, from the Eurate, Euphrates River four mighty angelic beings, each commanding a vast demonic army. So if you remember back to the sixth trumpet, in the sixth trumpet there were these demon leaders that released their armies, that these armies that went out all in different directions and destroyed people. It was a terrible time if you'll remember back when we studied that earlier. The sixth bowl plague will also deal with the Euphrates River, but from a different event or a different perspective. Instead of releasing demons, it will dry the river up. While the four demonic warriors will have brought death during the sixth trumpet, on the contrary, the sixth bowl will prepare the world for the battle of Armageddon where the returning Lord Jesus will cut down his enemies with the sword of his mouth, as we just read in chapter 19. So, we have three, and this is part of that parenthetical statement. In other words, between the sixth and seventh uh, bowl judgments, there's this parenthesis there, and we're going to talk about three foul spirits that which look like frogs. And um, interesting, if you want to, know what they look like, go look at your local frog. <laughs> so verse 16, um, verse 13, I'm sorry, let's read verse 13 again, and it says, drum roll, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. <laughs> hmm. So John saw three unclean spirits come forth from the unholy trinity, one from the dragon, Satan. One from the beast, the Antichrist, and one from the false prophet, the little beast. Um, and the text um, declares that these frogs will come out of their mouths. And so what usually comes out of your mouth? Words, right. So these, um, these frog spirits will likely be articulate, convincing spirits. In other words, they're going to be spirits that will give the ability to say things that make things happen. And that's what I believe you see coming forth here. Verse 14, for they are spirits of demons performing signs. Now remember, a sign is a special kind of miracle. Now if you're driving down the road and on the side of the road you see a green thing that looks like it's about like a sheet of, about the size of a sheet of plywood and it has words written on it, that's called a sign, right? And usually signs are there to tell you something like exit ahead, slow down, uh, the road stops. I mean, there's going to be something on that sign that you need to take note of. But the sign is not actually what is important. It's what is the sign pointing toward? What is the sign speaking of? So when you think of a sign miracle, you're thinking, what is this pointing toward? And these particular demons will be performing miraculous things that point toward, I believe, toward their master, toward their masters, the unholy trinity, the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet. And so these three unclean spirits will be miracle workers that will use powerful signs to summon a multinational co coalition of armies together under the authority of the beast. Now remember what Cody was saying the other day, just because someone can perform a miracle does not mean they're from God. And you may think, well, that's odd, but go with me to, uh, to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking, and he has explained some in, important things. He's telling you how to recognize a false prophet. Now, how are you going to recognize a false prophet? It's by the way they're dressed, right? They dress really cruddy. No, not likely. In fact, most false prophets are pretty, pretty nicely dressed because they are a wolf in some, some kind of clothing. What kind of clothing are they typically in? Sheep's clothing. So you're not going to recognize them by their exterior. 
In fact, if I were going to deceive sheep, I wouldn't come as a big bad wolf, would I? I'd put on a sheep's costume, and I'd kind of crawl out among them, and I would act like a sheep. I'd maybe even baa every now and then or something. And, but then eventually when I was in the middle of them, I would take my, my cloak off and devour them, you know. And see, you can't recognize a false prophet by the way he dresses. How are you going to know what a false prophet is then? can't tell from the outside. Well, you tell what comes out of them, you know. What comes out of a prophet? Words, right? And teachings or statements. So if someone comes to me and says, Fred, I'm a prophet and I've got a word for you, I'm going to say, okay, um, yeah, all right. And they're going to tell me their word. And what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to the Bible. I'm going to see if what they say is in the Bible. And because if what they're saying is not in the Bible, I've got to reject them. And if what they're saying is already in the Bible, I didn't need them. I just needed the Bible. So really what I need today is the Bible, not a prophet. This is why... Um, Prophets are dangerous today. Now, you may say, no, no, that's not true. They are, because every time they speak, you have to take what they say back to the Word of God, and if they, what they say is in the Word of God and agrees with the Word of God, you can believe it. But if what they're saying is something new and not found in the Word of God, you've got to reject them. In fact, Deuteronomy says you should kill them. Someone gives a false prophecy, they are to be killed, according to Deuteronomy. And so what do I need more than anything? I need an understanding of the word of God. So that if someone comes to me with a new teaching or a new idea, I can quickly sniff it out because I'm not going to know by looking at them. But if I go to a tree and I find apples hanging on the tree, what, what does that tell me about the tree? Apple tree, wow, good job. If I come to a vine and there's grapes hanging on it, what does that tell me about the vine? Grapevine, super. So by their fruits, you know what they are, don't you? So if I find an orange hanging on a tree, that tells me that that is an orange tree. Very good. You guys are great. So let's listen to what Jesus said. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them, false prophets, by their fruits. What is the fruit of a, of, of a prophet? His words. And so you can analyze the words of someone that is a teacher, and you can tell whether they're true or false. And how do we analyze them? We compare it to the Word of God. We compare it to the Word of God. That's the only way. So every good tree that bears good fruit, uh, I mean, sorry, every good tree bears good fruit. Let me back up to verse 16 because I jumped. By the, you shall know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes. And that's true. And figs are not gathered from thistles, are they? And that's true. They're not. No. So every good tree bears what? Good fruit. And every bad tree bears what? So if someone tells you something that doesn't agree with the word of God, what are they? They're a liar. <laughs> They're a false prophet. But if what they teach you agrees with the word of God, what are they? They're a good tree. They're truthful. Give yourself an extra 20 points. In your book. So, every um, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So, what does the Lord think about people that teach lies? They should be hacked off and thrown into the fire. That's what He thinks about them. And so, what does this say? So you will know them by their fruits. Now, does He say you'll know who are Christians by their fruit? No, the context here is you will know who's a truthful teacher and who's a lying teacher by their fruits. And their fruits are their teaching. And how do you know it? By comparing it to the word of God. This is our testing ground. This is how we, we know. So, what does Jesus say in relation to all of this? Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who calls Jesus Lord is going to heaven. That's a very important thing because there are a lot of people out there that are false teachers today that are using Jesus' name in their false teaching. Do you know that in the book of Acts there was a group of men that were going around casting out demons using Jesus' name? 
and then they used Paul's name to cast out demons. But do you know that those men were not even saved, but they were having success until they met up with this big demon? And then he stripped them out naked, beat them all up, stripped them naked, and they ran out naked. He said, I know Paul, I know Jesus, but who in the heck are you guys? And they couldn't cast him out. But they were having success because of the powerful name of Jesus, not because they were saved. They were unsaved. So just because someone says, I can cast out demons, doesn't mean they're saved. And they even may be successful in doing it, but that doesn't mean they're saved. Because many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, but not everybody who says that will enter into heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. What does God want us to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God wants you to do. And if you don't do that, you are not doing the will of the Father. And you are rebellious against God. And so, um, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, are, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Verse 22, listen to this. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not what? Prophesy in your name. Did we not cast out demons in your name? And in your name perform many miracles. You know what Jesus says to them? No, you didn't do that. That's not what he says to them. He doesn't even deny that they did, that they did or didn't do that. In fact, they probably did do it. Just like we see in the book of Acts where people were performing Miracles in the name of Jesus, but they weren't saved. He says there, many um, and will in your name cast out demons and do miracles. And he says to them, verse 23, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. He doesn't say, I knew you and I forgot you. He says, you were never mine. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, these demons that are going to come out of the mouth of the dragon, the false prophet, and the, and the Antichrist are going to perform miracles. And the world is going to see these miracles. They're going to say, wow, this has got to be true. Let's believe this. Let's follow these men or these demons. Men probably controlled by demons in actuality. And so this is where we're at. These frog-like demons will quickly hop back and forth internationally, negotiating on behalf of the Antichrist. Through demonic diplomacy, they will build an unholy coalition to fight the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, you would think, man, you're going to fight a Lamb. You don't need an army. You know, what's a Lamb against an army, you know? The, this is a special Lamb. This is a Lamb of God. By their miracles, they will easily convince the kings of the earth to gather together to defeat the Lord. Which will go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together. Initially, these kings will come together to destroy Israel. And we see that in Zechariah chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. But in due time, they will turn their power toward heaven, toward the Lord Jesus Christ himself. These frog demons will go forth to gather the enemies of the Lord together at this place called Armageddon, or Armageddon as we like to call it. All tribulation saints should be uh, uh, alert because Christ will return very soon. When this happens, those who are saved on the earth should know, wow, Jesus is coming back soon. Because me, look, the armies of the world are gathering together in Mesopotamia, in the Shinar Valley, near Babel, near the Euphrates River, and these vast armies from probably from every country on earth because these, these demons are going around the earth, gathering the armies together. Ships are being loaded with soldiers, and, and this is a huge army, probably the biggest army ever amassed in the history of the world. And the nations are being deceived by demons, and we also know from the, from, the, from the heavenly perspective that God is using the angels to hack off with the, with the sickle all of the grapes of the earth which are ripe. And he's bringing them to the Jezreel Valley. He's going to bring them in. So the demons are working toward this end. The angels are working toward this end. 
This is God bringing all of these armies together so he can do a final judgment against all of his enemies, all at one battle, in the battle of Armageddon. And so, verse 14b, or D says, for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty, will have come. So this is the war of the great day of God, the Almighty One. And so at this final war, the battle of Armageddon, arrogant mankind will get in battle formation in defiance of God, not understanding that this will be God's great day, not theirs. Drunk with pride, under the influence of the Antichrist, and being deceived by these frog demons that are hopping about in detente or whatever in, in coalitions, the world will boast of its uh, clever plan as it rushes right into God's trap, into the vat. They're being cast in there where Christ will come and trample them underfoot and destroy them. So the Lord will descend from heaven with his army of saints to utterly defeat the Antichrist and his vast army. This is what Jude, go to Jude. That's not very far away, by the way. It's Jude then Revelation. So we're going to look at the first prophecy, one of the very first prophecies ever heard on planet Earth. This is by Enoch. You remember Enoch was seventh from Adam. This is before Noah. Um, we don't have a book of Enoch that we have part of, as part of our Bible, but this we know this is true because Jude wouldn't have put it in the Bible if this was not his actual words. And so we see um, that um, down in, let's see here, uh, verse 14, in Jude 14. It was about these men that Enoch and in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the, what kind of men? Ungodly, Ungodly of all their what? Godly deeds, which they have done in what? Ungodly way. And all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So are these godly people? No, and that's what we're seeing. These armies are followers of the Antichrist. So don't think that God is just being mean here, as some people would think. These are people who hate God. These are like atheists who hate God. You know, most atheists talk more about God than, than we'll ever talk about God. They're trying so hard to disprove God. But you, we know from Romans chapter 1, that they have to suppress the truth. And it takes a lot of energy to suppress something, doesn't it? Have you ever taken a ball and pushed it under the water at a pool? And you have to hold it tight, don't you? And you have to push hard. What happens when you let it go? It comes up and hits you in the face. You, it, you see, it takes energy. And you see, atheists have to expend a lot of energy to disprove God. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, the Bible says. God has built an innate understanding that there is a God into every human being. And so in order to deny God, it's going to take you a lot of energy. So if you ever want to be an atheist, prepare yourself because you've got a life of, of exercise to do. You're going to have to take the truth and push it under and hold it down there all the time. And that's why if you go to college and a person is an atheist, they're going to talk more about God than your preacher does on Sunday. They're going to deny him more, but they're going to still mention God. It's like, um, you know, I, I love to ask atheists, you know, if they're astronauts. Because the only way you're ever going to convince me that there's no God is if you've got a, if you've got a, a Star Wars type craft and you've gone to every galaxy out in the universe and you've looked behind every star and you can come back and tell me there is no God, then I'll believe you. But until you can do that, you're, you're having just as much faith as I am. You believe there is no God, just like I believe there is God, but we are both believing because you can't prove it. They cannot prove there is no God, just like I can't prove to them that there is a God. But the God that there is has written it on their heart that there is a God. And they have to suppress that truth. They've got to push it down. They've got to deny it, and it takes a lot of energy and good luck. So verse 15, behold, I am coming like a thief. 
Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And that's a good thing. For example, when you go to bed tonight, keep your clothes pretty close to the bed in case there's a fire in your hotel or your home and you have to run outside. Put your clothes on first and then run out because that way you don't get to see walked around in shame. And that's what he's saying there. In other words, be ready, right? Be ready. That's a good thing. And we should always be ready. So let's read, let, let's think through verse 15. Jesus promised that he will come at an unexpected time like a thief. Now, does a thief say, I'll be there at 1245? Um, no. They come without any warning, and they come when you least expect it, you know. I got robbed the other day of a computer in Columbia, and it, I could kick myself in my own butt if I could get my foot back there. I don't know. But anyway... It was, I was sitting right here. My computer was like three feet away on a table. I had a friend of mine sitting at the other end of the table that could, just, all he had to do is be like this, he could see my computer. And two guys walked into the hotel when it was busy. And one of the guys went around the back of the table and we saw it on the video, that's why I know, because otherwise I would to this day be thinking that somebody raptured my computer. <laughs> but. This one guy takes and he's over there and he just closes my computer and plugs it and then with one grab he just grabbed my computer, slid it across the table, put it in a bag and walked out. And we saw it on the video afterwards but it made me so mad. But that's how thieves do, you know. That's what thieves do. They come, they do stuff when you least expect it. And that's how Jesus is going to come during the tribulation in his second coming. Um, it's going to be a, like a flash across the sky, in a sense. Now, there's going to be a sign of his coming, and I think that's one of the things they're going to be looking up and saying, what is that? You know, there's, there's Martians coming or something, you know, there's uh, extraterrestrials, or, and they're going to want to fight. But he's not going to announce, I'll be there in three days. Um, it's going to be like a thief. So, as silently as a thief, Jesus will come without any hints or warning. Now, this is not talking about the rapture. This is talking about his second coming when he appears to do battle. In the rapture, he snatches away his bride. And he gets his bride out of here before the tsunami hits, you know. That's, a, that's what I would do. Like if Wanda was here and they announced that the world's worst hurricane was going to hit the Rio Grande Valley. And if I had time and I knew it was coming, I would get her out of here. I mean, it's just, she's my wife, you know, I'd do that. And that's what Jesus does with his church. And those who say he leaves his church halfway through, through the tribulation before he takes them out, what kind of wife beater is Jesus? Really, when you think about it, he's a wife beater then. He's going to let his wife suffer three and a half of the worst years that the, the history has ever known? That's ridiculous. That's not our Jesus. And if you are married to a Jesus like that, let me, uh, let me introduce you to the biblical Jesus who takes care of his bride. In fact, he loved his bride so much, according to Ephesians, that he gave his life for her. And so he takes the church out before the hell breaks loose. And um, you can believe otherwise if you want to. And there are plenty, like if you go click in, in the Internet, you're going to get mostly people who say that the church is going to go through the tribulation and prepare yourself, go out and buy MREs and you know, get guns, and you can fight the Antichrist and everything. Let me tell you, you're not going to be fighting. You're going to be running for your life if you stay here. And if you stay here, it's because you didn't believe the gospel. So Matthew 24, 27 and 28 says, For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's a pretty quick coming, isn't it? Lightning goes fast. The Lord's return will be as sudden uh, and unexpected and powerful as a lightning bolt across the sky. Um, that's pretty fast. In chat, Revelation 16, 15, but Christ will come unexpectedly. Tribulation saints should remain prepared and expectant. This is why he says, be ready at any time. I will come when you least expect it probably. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. 
So these saints are, 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 who are faithful and anticipate Christ's return will be blessed. They will not be humiliated by, the, uh, in naked, uh, by being naked in public. And have you ever had those kind of dreams? <laughs> those are the worst dreams. I mean, if you've never had one, I hope you have one like that tonight, just so you can experience it. <laughs> because it's, you know, you're in school. This is, uh, for some reason, it happened to me when I was growing up and in school. And all of a sudden, I'd be at school, and I'd be looked down, and I didn't have any clothes on. And so <laughs> I'm, like, trying to get out of the school. If you've never had that kind of dream, you need one. Okay, just so you can understand what the Bible's talking about here. So I'm going to pray for you to have a good dream tonight. <laughs> so Matthew 24, 44 to 47, Jesus said that when, when he um, unexpectedly returns, um, he will bless the faithful slave who is doing all that he commanded him to do. So, you know, Jesus is going to have servants, you know, people who are believers during the during the tribulation, and he's going to give some of them the ability to help other saints during the tribulation, and he wants them to be faithful in, in that time, and I think they're going to probably be wealthy people like Schindler or whatever, you know, that kind of person that can help uh, tribulation saints, and some of them will do a good job of that, but some will not, and the ones that don't, he's going to deal with them very, very, um, very harshly when he returns. And that fits well with the tribulation. If, God, if Jesus comes to you, you're a believer at the beginning of the tribulation, and you're wealthy, and you can help God's children that get saved during the tribulation, and he commissions you to do that, and you don't do it, shame on you. And um, there will be those who are like Corey Ten Boom, you know, that, that help, and there will be others that, let's go to Matthew 24 so you can see what I'm talking about. Remember, Matthew 24 is not talking about, is talking about what happens after the rapture, not before. So in Matthew 24, we have a couple of parables that he ends with, and they're kind of like, wow, these are crazy parables. But, um, but they're true. And so let me read starting in verse, uh, let's go with verse 42. Therefore, be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time the, in, of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready for the Son of Man at, uh, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Now he's talking here to tribulation saints. And he's saying, don't fall asleep. Don't get complacent because the Lord is going to show up all of a sudden. And so verse 45 said this, says this, Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household and gave to give them food at the proper time? And you think about the tribulation. Will believers during the tribulation need special care? Absolutely. And so if Jesus has some very wealthy believers that he says, hey, when the time is necessary, you help my people, uh, they should do so. I would think it would be a very smart thing to do, to be a Corey Ten Boom, to be a Schindler or whatever you are. Um, so blessed is the slave um, whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. So if so if someone is faithful to that commission that he gives them to protect his people and to feed them during the tribulation, he's going to come back and say, wow, you did a great job. Here, let me even bless you even more, and I'm going to put you in charge of a lot of stuff. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink with drunkards. In other words, he says, I'm just going to, you know, I've, I'm wealthy. I can, I don't really... You know, I'm not worried about the Antichrist. I've, I'm protected, and I'm just not going to help him. I'm going to just go drinking and partying with everybody else. This is what happens to him. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know, and he will whew, cut him in pieces. That's pretty harsh judgment. That is, that is a punishment that Jesus will give to unfaithful believers during that time 
Now you say, that's crazy, that's harsh. Well, let me tell you, Jesus during the millennium is going to rule with a rod of iron, the Bible says. In other words, if you do wrong during the millennium and starting with the tribulation and forward, if you disobey him, he's going to be harsh with you. And this one gets chopped into pieces and assigned a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's not hell, I don't believe. I think it's just the dungeon that the Lord will have during the millennium. Because people will fight against the Lord even during the millennium. And people will be dealt with very harshly. You can disagree with me, but I think there's a lot of parables that really point that out. That during the, the kingdom of heaven, anytime the Bible says the kingdom of heaven will be like, that's what it's going to be like when Jesus is ruling. And some of the stuff he says, like exa for example, during the millennial kingdom, if someone, um, if someone molests a child, it will be better for him that he was never born, the Bible says. It would be better to have a millstone hung around his neck and be cast into the sea. And that is because when Jesus is ruling it, uh, on this earth, if you break a law, you're going to pay for it. And especially if you do something that hurts somebody like that. And so if you think people are getting away with stuff right now, they are. You know, there are traffickers that go on for years and years and never get caught. And they are abusing women and girls and everything imaginable. And they get away with it and get away with it. During the millennium, that ain't going to happen no more, folks. Jesus is going to, there's going to be justice from sea to shining sea. And if someone disobeys the law, they're going to be punished. Now, it's going to be a wonderful time to live because, you know, you're not going to have to worry about, you know, we, we hate it today, don't we, when we find out that, that, that people are being abused and, and people are being hurt. And we should hate that. But when Jesus is ruling on the throne, it's not going to happen anymore. It will be reported. And he will deal with it harshly and quickly. And so we'll go on for there, from there. This uh, exhortation of encouragement is as if Jesus were saying, it's almost over. Just wait a little bit longer and I will come and take you home. Keep your clothes ready. Keep ready for the moment when I return. And they will gather them together in the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon or Armageddon. The Valley of Armageddon will be the final battleground. He's going to gather all these armies together that have aligned with the Antichrist, and he's going to give them an opportunity to fight against him. We can't pinpoint the location of Armageddon exactly on a map because the name has been used to describe three separate places, but it's like this. One place is over here, one is here, and one is here. They're like the places around this big valley of Jehoshaphat, as it's called in the book of Joel. Um, anyway, so a small hill on the south central edge of the Jezreel or Esdraelon uh, Valley, Esdraelon, I guess, um, an area near Mount Carmel by the Mediterranean Sea just east of the Jezreel Valley has also been called um, Armageddon and an area near Mount Tabor by the Sea of Galilee and, um, and west of the Jezreel Valley is also called Armageddon. So really it's that whole area there. It's a, it's a kind of a huge, it's like the Rio Grande Valley. It's just a, 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 a flat piece of land in there so with no trees. No, just kidding. <laughs> These three possibilities all border the Jezreel Valley, also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the perfect, perfect place for a huge army to gather. Now, there's other armies that are gathered near Jerusalem, and there's other armies that are going to be down in Basra, which is near Jordan today, which is going to be probably the area, as Clay pointed out today, the area probably where a big portion of Israel is going to be hiding out, and God's going to be supernaturally protecting them in the mountains there. And that's where he comes first, and he does battle in the, je in, in the, je in the um, uh, what's it called again, um, Basra. And, and so he comes, and he's already covered with blood by the time he gets up to the Jezreel Valley to fight there. And then he turns around and comes back to Jerusalem and destroys the armies that are around Jerusalem. And then he stands on the earth on the Mount of Olives, and guess what happens? Mount of Olives splits in half, and a great valley runs down through there. And eventually off of the Temple Mountain comes a river, a, a stream that will go down through 
what is now through the middle of the of the Mount of Olives in a rundown, and as um, and you there's scripture that talks about at one place it's knee deep and then it's waist deep and then it's very deep and there fish from of every kind of fish can be caught in that river. So apparently we'll still be eating fish during the millennium. So if you like fish, fish sticks, um, mac fish or whatever, get ready. Armies from across the world will gather with the Antichrist, having a huge majority on his side may cause the Antichrist to believe he will easily and quickly destroy Israel. However, this day will be called the great day of God, the Almighty, or as we call it in later on in chapter 19, the Supper of God. Uh, you don't want to be on the menu. Okay. And so we come to verses 17 to 21. And how are we doing for time? Is that, is that where I... Uh, Nine-minute break, be there, be square.
<laughs> it's called math that if it's 2 plus 2 and it's you owe me, then it's 5. If I owe you, it's 3. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, we're going to keep on going. I've got a couple more verses, and then Dr. Colton Hughes will be coming up right after me. And so prepare your hearts for Colton Hughes's message as he begins to talk about, hey, guess what? We're getting close to Babylon. So, yeah, chapters 17 and 18. And uh, you're going to hear a view that is a little bit different, and, um, but, it, but hopefully true to the scriptures. So you judge when you get there. So we're in chapter 16, verses 17 to 21. And can I get a volunteer to read us those verses? Okay, so we have this parentheses is closed. We're picking up the uh, progression. We're in the seventh um, bowl, which is the seventh and final bowl. Now, if you add up all the judgments that we've seen so far, how many judgments are there uh, starting with the seal judgments through to the bowl judgments? How many? 21. 21, you're wrong. Somebody else, take a guess. 36 wrong, almost ro almost wrong, but wrong, 17 wrong, who, who said that, okay, give yourself an extra 35 points, 19, there's only 19, even though it sounds like there's 21, right, but this is a new kind of math, no, the seventh, the seventh seal is actually the seven trumpets, but the seventh trumpet is actually the seven bowls. So if you take away the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal, you have 19 instead of 21. So there's 19 judgments, but that's just trivia. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to teach us again, and we ask you to uh, use, the, um, use the voice of your servant, Father, and um, use the ears of your servants that are here. Father, to understand the truth, and none of us have a corner on truth, and so, Father, we ask you, dear God, to protect us from um, failing in presenting your message, and Lord, we want Jesus Christ to be exalted above all else, because he is the one who died for our sins and rose again on the third day to protect us from the wrath to come. And we thank you for that. We thank you that he protects us from eternal wrath in hell. And he also protects us from this wrath of judgment that is going to fall upon the earth. Maybe, um, maybe starting very soon, Lord. And even so, Lord Jesus, come to take us out of here because we are so much looking forward to being in your presence and in being on your side, to being the bride of Christ, Lord, to rule and reign with Jesus the King forever and ever. And so we just thank you for our privileged spot in your eternal plan as the church of Jesus Christ, different than Israel, different than the pre-Israel saints of the Old Testament, different than the tribulation saints to come, and even different than people who will be born again during the millennium, uh, millennial saints, if you will. Lord, we are a special people a, a priesthood and a kingdom of priests, Lord. And so we thank you that we have this unique place in your plan as church age believers. And we thank you for that. We thank you that we will be ruling and reigning in the millennium and we won't be subject to 
uh, failure during that time because we'll already be glorified and we will no longer ever again sin. And that's so awesome to think about that you could take the likes of us and turn us into pure, unspotted, beautiful people. And that's part of your whole plan of making us holy through and through. And we thank you for that, that fact. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we're looking at the seventh bowl judgment. So these bowls are like this, this frothy, evil concoction that God has designed. And each one of them causes something different as the angel, as those seven angels take and pour it out. Some of them are poured on the springs of water, some on the ocean, some on the atmosphere. And different things happen as a result of each of these outpourings. Some are poured right onto the throne of the Antichrist. As some are poured on the followers of the Antichrist. And so here we have the seventh bowl judgment. And this judgment is poured on the entire earth, on all of creation. This creates an, a cataclysmic event that is unlike any other event in the history of the world. You think the flood was bad? It was. But it isn't as bad as what this is going to be, in my opinion. So um, you judge by the end of this. Maybe it's bad. Maybe the flood was worse, but this is bad. So a great earthquake and huge hailstones. Now, how many of you ever have ever seen hail? Okay. And how? What's the biggest anybody's ever seen in here? Anybody seen any? Okay. Uh, oh, pea size. Okay. We got back here grapefruit size, right? Orange size. Those are pretty damaging, aren't they? Yeah, they, they probably weigh like maybe a pound or two or something, maybe a pound. Um, how about a 100-pound rock of, of, of ice, a 100-pound block of ice falling out of the sky and falling all over the whole globe? That would be pretty devastating, wouldn't it? So the final plague will end after the seventh angel in, empties his bowl into the air. Immediately, a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. Not finished. It is done. <laughs> when the seventh angel pours his bowl into the earth's atmosphere, the result will be cataclysmic. And we just read through it. But we will take, let's read verse 17 again. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, and that's probably God, wouldn't you think? He's the one that sits on the throne, saying, It is done, not finished. The air there in Greek refers to the air we breathe. So this one was poured into the earth's atmosphere. Um, Ephesians 2.2 2 says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So this plague is unquestionably di di uh, directed against his dominion. Now he's al already lost access to heaven. He can no longer go to heaven and say, have you ever seen Brett down there, that jerk? You know, and uh, Jesus has to step up. Yeah, yeah, I, I know he's a jerk, but I paid for his sins. He's okay. You know, we have an advocate in Jesus Christ, but Satan can do that right now because he's the accuser of, brother, of the brethren. In fact, it says he accuses us day and night before God, uh, just like he did with Job when he went in and, and, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And he's, yeah, yeah, but you got a, a hedge of protection around him. I mean, obviously, he's going to like you, and obviously, he's going to worship you because you've just made a bed of roses for him to sleep in, and so God says, well, go take his bed of roses away. And then he says, when Job didn't curse God, then he says, it's because he's healthy. You didn't take his health away. Okay, go take his health away. And he gives him sores, you know, on the bottom of his feet. It's bad to have a sore, but on the bottom of your feet, all the way to the top of your head, oozing sores. He's taking, like, pieces of, of pottery, you know, and scraping these sores to get the pus off and throw it away and everything. And, and yet he still didn't curse God. Now, he did. He wasn't a perfect man. If you read the book of Job, Job was blowing it some. In fact, at the end, though, when Job finally sees the Lord, he says, I've heard about you with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Wherefore, I repent. I change my mind, and I repent in dust and ashes. And so Job came to this realization of who God was, and he just, like, melted. And you know what's cool, though, is in the end, the Lord restored 
you know, is gave him back basically double of everything he had. So uh, maybe in the end it was worth it, but still it was a very hard life, and I would I would have hated to be Job. And maybe you feel like Job sometimes, and that that's understandable because life sucks sometimes. Instead of God saying it is finished, as He did on the cross. He will say, it is done. And I like what the commentator William Newell said. He said this, Men would not have the Savior's glorious, it is finished, on Calvary, so they must have the awful, it is done, from the judge. So you can either hear, it is finished from Jesus, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or you can stand before the one who says, it is done, who is the judge. And I'll take Jesus in that way. So what does God mean when he says it is done? The word done is in the perfect tense, meaning that it is done and will remain done forever. No more judgment in this sense. Um, by, uh, in other words, no more disciplining or chastening of wayward Israel. No more chastening the nations of the world. Um, it, it is done means that the seal, trumpet, and bold judgments will end with the outpouring of this judgment. When this judgment is poured onto the atmosphere, God is done. It is done means that the times of the Gentiles, when the Gentiles dominate Israel and, and, and mistreat and have anti-Semitism, when that's all done, and Satan's usurpation of the kingdoms of men is over. That's when God's judgment is done. It is done means that the eternal kingdom of God's dear Son, Jesus Christ, will begin. And Jesus will begin with battles. Can you, you know, it, it stands to reason, doesn't it? If you have a kingdom of darkness and you want to bring in a kingdom of light, then that's just going to be some clash, isn't there? There's going to be battle, there's going to be warfare, one kingdom fighting back and back and forth, but basically with this final judgment leaves just only place for Jesus Christ to set up a worldwide kingdom that covers the complete globe. And just as Jesus said, pray that thy kingdom come, well, it will have come because it will be done. The wrath of God will be over. As a result of the seventh bowl, the most violent earthquake to ever shake the planet will bring lightning, noises, and peals of thunder and, eternal, and, and global calamity. And so this sounds like the old cartoon underdog. Speed of lightning, peals of thunder, under... <laughs> anyway, you would have had to have been back in the 1960s. With the, with the seal, the Bible describes peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. So with the seventh trumpet, the Bible records flashes of lightning and sound and peals of thunder and an earthquake and great hailstones. That's with the seventh trumpet, but this trumps the seventh trumpet. And by the way, the Lord's coming back very soon because we have the last trump in the White House. Just kidding. <laughs> Here is the, bowl, the seventh bowl judgment. The disaster of the seventh seal judgment will be repeated, but with far more intensity and destruction. And so this will be, this will be the, the, the trumpet judgment on steroids. In other words, what will happen? Well, the great city of Babylon will be destroyed by this worldwide earthquake. Now, the great city of Babylon will be the, the, the world capital of the Antichrist. And I believe, as we will see in chapters 17 and 18, that that capital will sit in Shinar, which is where the Tower of Babel sat before. And um, it will be a city uncomparable probably to other cities, and really mainly because the wealth of the world will be there, the Antichrist will have his throne there, Nations will have gathered back to rebel against God. It's going to be a mega city that will stand for everything evil, everything that's against God. Everything that was present in the Tower of Babel when God said, spread out and fill the earth, and they said, no way, 
We're not going to obey you. We're going to build a tower, and we're even going to reach up into heaven. We're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to become great, and you can't tell us what to do. And that kind of heart, heart has been in every country of the world because the spirit of Babel is the spirit of Babylon, and it will come back to roost again in the Shinar Valley in the Middle East during the last days. And so the term great city could refer to Jerusalem as Revelation 11.8, but probably refers to none other than actually the actual city of Babylon, rebuilt to be the Antichrist headquarters. Many times in Revelation, Babylon is called the great city. Never does the context suggest that we should interpret Babylon either figuratively or allegorically as earthly Jerusalem. Therefore, we conclude that Babylon will be an actual new city rebuilt in Mesopotamia, in Shinar, New Babylon, during the latter days. The great city will crumble, having been split apart in, in three directions by this destructive earthquake. Jerusalem, situated on Mount Zion, seems to remain intact after this earthquake. This mountain will be the only recognizable landmark remaining on earth after God's violent judgment. In fact, we're fixing to see that all mountains everywhere are going to be basically leveled or become hills instead of mountains. Can you imagine the Himalayas being hills? Can you imagine um, the, um, the Rockies being leveled? That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Well, get ready. Note that the end of the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, Christ will stand on the still intact Mount Zion together with the 144,000 Jewish men. We see that in chapter 14. And so Mount Zion does not disappear. That's the mountain upon which Jerusalem sits. And that is going to remain as the, the only mountain on earth, apparently. According to Zechariah 14, 4, Jesus will cause the Mount of Olives, which is just across the Kidron Valley from Mount Zion, to split into two parts with the touch of his feet at his second coming, thereby creating a huge valley eastward from Jerusalem. However, Jerusalem will remain intact. Christ will establish his kingdom's headquarters on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. We see many references to that. And I would invite you to go back and when you restudy this on your own, to read all of the uh, cross-references to see these different um, uh, prophecies that also speak of these things. The cities of the nations fell. So what happens to the cities around the world of all the nations? What happens to New York? What happens to Harlingen, Texas? Falls. Now, how is that? Well, first of all, if you got an earthquake that shakes the earth like never before, it doesn't take much to bring down a big building if you got a huge enough earthquake. So not only will there be seismic activity underground, but if something happens to still be remaining, say the Statue of Liberty is still standing after this, watch what happens. We'll see it in a minute. The great city of Babylon will be remembered before God and forced to drink to the last drop the full cup of the wine of his furious anger. Verse 19 says this. Actually, let's read 18 and 19. 18. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there had uh, not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. And the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. So, Revelation 18.10 foretells that Babylon's destruction will be sudden. It will be in one hour. This massive earthquake explains the speed and completion of that destruction. This earthquake, the fifth during the tribulation, 
will be so destructive that all of humankind's beloved constructions, all the marvels of the world, all the monuments will instantly crumble into complete ruin. And that may seem sad to you because you might want to go and see the Taj Mahal. I got to see it one time. Um, it's okay. I mean, it's pretty impressive. In fact, it's pretty cool. But the thing is, is it's going to pale in, com in, in comparison to the, to the great things that are going to be accomplished during the millennial kingdom. And so um, the next two chapters of Revelation describe the destruction of the final world capital Babylon. For now, this verse merely mentions that Babylon will be remembered and made to drink God's wrath. So this is just a preview. We know what happens during the seventh bowl judgment. And so just keep that in mind as we begin to fold into chapters 17 and 18 to know that there's this city called Babylon that is going to be destroyed. And it says in verse uh, Revelation 16, 20, and every island fled away. Now, how many islands are there out there in the seas? A whole bunch. And how many of them fly, uh, flee away? Every one of them. And the mountains were not found. What happens to the Himalayas? They are not found any longer. What kind of earthquake would it take to bring down mountains? What kind of earthquake would it take to make all islands disappear on the earth? The first, uh, first, the great city Babylon will be destroyed. Then Babylon will be given the, the cup of, of the wine of the fierceness of God's wrath because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Just like she made the nations to, uh, to rebel against God by her concoction that she forced on the nations of the world to become idolatrous, to become materialistic, to rebel against God, to say, we don't need God, let's cast him off. Just like she has made the nations of the world rebel against God by her drink, by her wine, God will give her a taste of some real wine, some Merlot or something, maybe. This destruction will fulfill the flying angel's proclamation. And so this is going to... Um, do what the flying angel, remember that angel that followed behind the first angel said, Babylon, Babylon the great has fallen. Well, this is the fulfillment of that angel's predictions. Second, in an instant of time, cities around the globe will fall into rubble. Revelation 16, verse 20, it says this, let's listen to 20. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found and so every island will have fled away what is this word fled away in Greek it means to run to move hastily away to flee in other words probably this means that the seismic activity will cause every island to suddenly disappear below the surface of the oceans the earthquake will cause mountains not to be found. Found is the word in Greek which literally means not even with an intense search will they find them. And so this is amazing, you know, thinking of looking for mountains and not finding any anymore. Now, that's going to be kind of sad from my perspective because I like mountains in a sense, but um, it's not going to be sad, <laughs> actually. Because God's got something very special planned for the millennium. For example, for one thing, during the millennium, deserts are going to flower again. Um, if you've ever flown across North Africa, you go across the Sahara, and all you can see if you're in an airplane, you know, at 30,000 feet or whatever, you just see nothing down there but sand. Now, some of it's blue. I mean, some of it's pink and red, but it's just sand. It's just nothing down there. In fact, we get dust from the Sahara all the way to America at certain times of the year. Um, it's, it's a vast nothing piece of land that nobody can live there, basically, and that will turn into forest and, and springs and everything again. That will be awesome, you know, I think. So you won't need mountains. You can go explore the Sahara. 
There, this earthquake will completely change the topo type, uh, topography of the earth. An absolutely mind-boggling concept. What will the earth look like after this, after this moment? And why, why, is God, why is Jesus doing this? Because he's going to let us go back out as his emissaries. You will rule and reign with Jesus during the millennium. And by the way, we're going to be glorified. Us here in the church age, we're going to already be glorified. We'll already have been judged. We'll already have our rank in his kingdom. And so you will be used by God to be over maybe cities, over regions of the world that will be repopulated after the tribulation is over, after this destruction has taken place. Uh, um, the, the Lord will redistribute living people who make it through the tribulation. They will go out and they will begin to have families again, but we will rule and reign with Christ as his government. You'll be like the, um, the cabinet to the Lord Jesus, the King of Kings, and you will be assigned certain areas. For example, Dr. Will Hughes will be over New York City probably, you know, big area. I'm going to be over the bathrooms of Harlingen or something. <laughs> but we'll all have a place to, to, to reign with him because we're going to rule and reign with him. Just what place will you have? Well, it depends on your faithfulness right now as a believer in the Lord Jesus. Will, are you faithful as a, as a child of God? If you're faithful, you receive higher authority. If you're unfaithful, you're over the bathrooms of Harlingen. <laughs> Whatever. But you will rule and reign with him. With the exception of the global flood in Noah's day, no event in history will affect the earth as much as this earthquake. It will prepare the earth um, for a complete reconstruction and renovation during the millennial kingdom under Christ's rule. So, listen to verse 21. This is the final verse that touches me. Me toca, as, in, as they say in Spanish. Is that so? The huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men and men blasting God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was so extremely severe. So finally, the sky will spew forth huge hailstones. So let's say somehow or another the Empire State Building survives this huge earthquake. It won't stay standing. Why? Because these hailstones are like bombs coming out of heaven, 100-pound hailstones, and they're pulverizing whatever's left on top of the earth and destroying it and, and, and leaving it in rubble uh, um, and stones, no, nothing more. Um, so they weigh about 100 pounds, 45 kilos each, uh, causing injury and death to many who survived the previous judgment. So let's say a guy was hiding out in a cave, and an earthquake came, and he ran out of the cave. Well, you better get back in the cave quick, <laughs> because it's going to come probably at the same time. Because the great earthquake will destroy most buildings, people will not be protected from the hailstones. As death looms, they will, cha uh, will they change their mind and believe in Christ? And the answer is sadly no. Instead of believing, they curse God. In fact, these unbelievers will blaspheme God. Even in the most severe of all judgments, mankind will maintain a stubborn and rebellious pride and will not respond to the merciful invitation that God has faithfully extended to everyone throughout history. Since uh, some claim that hail is uh, a metaphor for rocks or projectiles from catapults, Yet God specifically chose the, this word for hail, which is the actual word in Greek for hail, um, not the one for rock or asteroid or anything else or bombs. These are real hailstones. Now, how is a hailstone made? Well, water in the sky like a raindrop starts to come down, but then enough draft takes it, takes it way up into the atmosphere. And as it goes up, it freezes. And then it starts to come down again. And as it comes down again, it um, collects more uh, fluid, and then it gets another updraft, takes it up again, and as it keeps doing this rotation, it, it gets bigger and bigger each, each rotation it makes. And the, uh, the higher and the longer it stays in the air, the bigger the hailstones. So these are huge. This is storms like un, you know, 
unimaginable storms that are happening. So these literal hailstones will not come from man-made weapons, but from the air, from God, from the bowl judgment, which is the region over which the seventh plague will be discharged. So what do we have? We have the seventh um, big, huge judgment. Now, this, is, this comes um, probably either right before Jesus destroys these armies or at the same time, during the same time. It's kind of like uh, Pastor Clay was saying earlier today, when when it when we when we, we become believers, you know, we get uh, we get baptized into Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, we become a child of God. We, what order do those things happen? They kind of happen all at once, you know. All these things happen to us, and so a lot of what we're seeing here is just uh, uh, God's way of explaining a bunch of stuff that happens at the end. In fact, when you think of the, the harvest that we saw earlier, what is a harvest? Well, a harvest is after many months. So you plant first, and then you wait, and, and there's growth and growth and growth. And then the harvest usually takes a few days, doesn't it? A harvest, you, you bring the tractors out, and you, know, you go through the field, you harvest. So a harvest is a quick event. And at the end, uh, not only will these things happen, but actually there's this thing where Jesus sends out his angels to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. And that is because he has to pull them out of the way because he's going to pulverize this earth. Um, and, and that can look like a rapture, but it's not the rapture. In other words, it's, it's angels doing this job of going out and finding all the believers, finding people who do not have the mark of the beast, and extracting them and pulling them, kind of putting them into barns and protecting them, so to speak. Where will this protection place be? Probably near Jerusalem, I would think, because that's not going to be affected. That is not going to be destroyed by this, these storms and this earthquake. And so um, the Lord protects them and then leaves the others out there to be destroyed by these plagues. And so you don't want to be around during the, these judgments, and you don't have to be. Because you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and escape the wrath to come. Praise God. So let's pray, and then, and then immediately our brother Car uh, Colton will come forward and continue on. Heavenly Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for what you're teaching us, and may we understand, Lord. And um, there, there's so much to learn in these verses, but we, we ask you, dear Father, to, to prepare our hearts to instruct us and to teach us. And I pray for Colton now as he comes up to continue this study. Lord, that you would uh, just give him what he stands in need of as far as uh, words and understanding and explanations and whatever else he needs. And then give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on down, brother. Can you get the candy from our Sunday school here? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start. Don't mind my awesome helpers who are awesome. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's start here in a second. All right. So if I were to ask you what you think the most <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs> all right, if I were to ask you what you think the most influential city in all of human history was, what would you say? <laughs> Definitely Noonan, Georgia. I mean, y'all do have so many Chick-fil-A's, so that does make you the most influential city. No. Okay. Um, all right, maybe you would say, I don't know, Rome, New York City, Dubai. 
even though that's been around for like 20 years or something. This wouldn't be a good answer. But the correct answer would be actually Babylon. Now, you may not have heard about Babylon before a lot. You probably heard it mentioned once or twice, maybe in church, but it's actually something really important that we should be learning about probably a lot more than we normally do. And that's why we're going to take a break from the verse by verse of Revelation and do a little topical section on the history of Babylon. So that's what I will be doing. Now, since we might not know a ton about this culture shaping city, um, let's talk about first off why we're learning this. I mean, we could just say, let's talk about ancient Japan. Okay, why? Is it too high? Okay, let's try this. Is this better? Okay, cool. So let's talk about why. This is going to be moving way too much. Okay, right there. Right here. Right there, right there. Hey, that's good. Is that good? Yay, all right. So, um, why are we just talking about ancient Babylonian history versus ancient Japanese history or Greek history or something? There's actually a reason. So Babylon, according to Blue Letter Bible, is mentioned 287 times in the Bible. It is the second most mentioned city in the Bible, second only to God's holy city of Jerusalem. So it's obviously really important. And it's also mentioned a bunch in the next two chapters that we're going to be going over in Revelation, which is why we're talking about it. So Babel is the Hebrew name for the city with the Greek name of Babylon. We see this in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Typically, Babel is used for the original city and Babylon for the more recent city. The reason Babylon is so influential is because it was actually the birthplace of sinful society. It was the first post-flood, one of the first post-flood cities to be built. And we can read about this in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. So let's go to Genesis 11, 1 through 9. And this is the first place where we learn about the history of this place of Babel or Babylon. So in Genesis 11, 1 through 9, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So what geographical area is Babel or Babylon in? The plain of Shinar. Good job. And they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had a brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to them to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And that is why, um, and, not, and now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us, talking about the Trinity, go down and therefore confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Okay. So here we just read this passage, and this talks about Babel. So an important thing to understand is that Babel is usually the term that is used for the original city in the land of Shinar that tried to build the tower. Babylon will come later with King Nebuchadnezzar. So Babel is the city that tried to build the tower, and we just read about it. They had three main goals, as we can derive from the text. Um, but they wanted to, one, build a city, whereas God told them to do what? Fill the earth or scatter. But they're like, nope, then we'll build a city. Second, um, they decide to build a tower to reach heaven instead of honoring God. Decide to do that instead. And then three, they wanted to make a name for themselves. So those were like the three goals of the original city of Babel. 
We must understand that Babel, the city in which worldwide rebellion against God first began, was the birthplace of false religion, idolatry, and centralized commerce, materialism, both of which an imperial government used to gain absolute control. In other words, Babel has two sides to it. So what are those two sides, or like two parts? One, they have a religious aspect, and then two, they have a commerce or business aspect aspect as well. Interpreting Revelation 17 through 18, which is all about Babylon, um, correctly is the most difficult and controversial task in our study thus far. Many respected Bible teachers disagree in their understanding of these chapters. You may not agree with all our interpretations and conclusions. Our request is that you prayerfully consider our conclusions which we have gleaned from careful study of the biblical text. We encourage you to base your conclusions solely on the Bible as well. And of course, that should be true of everything that we are learning this week. It should always be put and compared to the word of God, especially um, with Babylon. You do not have to agree with this curriculum, but we exhort you to beware of basing your conclusions on commentators, traditions, denominational ideas, the news, or a favorite radio or TV teacher. The Bible should be your only authority. So these next two chapters are loaded with symbolism. Careful study is required to determine their metaphorical meanings from within the context. We urge caution because wrong assumptions about these symbols will lead you to flawed conclusions. Whenever a symbol used, it's a really cool way that God can get a point across to us. But of course, if we give that symbol a wrong meaning, then you can come up with something really weird. So that's why it's important to be careful. All right, so how are we going to interpret these passages? In this study, we teach that Revelation 17 and 18 both speak of the cataclysmic destruction of Babylon with a different element underscored in each chapter. So, in other words, we believe that when Babylon is mentioned in Revelation, it's actually going to be a city in Babylon. It's not meaning something else. In chapter 17, we will observe the final outcome of the countless spiritual and religious deviations that were spawned directly from the historical city of Babel. Remember how I said that Babylon or Babel had two aspects. What were they? Um, one person answered. Yes, Sarah. Yeah, religion and commerce. Good job. Okay. My first candy to throw out. Okay. It hit the table and bounced. All right. So they, it has a religious aspect and a commerce aspect. In other words, Babylon or Babel isn't just a church, and it's also not just a business. It involves the government. It involves religion. It involves a lot of different things. It's basically in control. In chapter 18, we will observe the end of Babel's huge, powerful political and economic institutions that have long encouraged materialism around the world. And this is interesting to note. So Babylon has these two aspects, right? The religion and the commerce. And the reason why both of them are wrong is because in actuality, not just the religious, but also the commerce, they're both actually idolatrous, right? And it's easy in our culture to only think hey, we don't worship idols because, I mean, some people do, but most people in America don't go and bow down to Buddha every single day or something. But there are other types of idols than just religious types of idols. There's also the material idols as well of business and commercialism. Just as God defeated the historical cities of Babylon under both Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar, the epitome of idolatry and materialism, so also he will destroy this future Babylon and all the idols and wealth that it spawns. The harlot mentioned in this passage was obviously not a real person. The text is clear that she represents a city, the great city called Babylon. Um, and where is this verse? Here it is. The woman whom you saw is what? The great city, and that's another name for Babylon, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So, who is the harlot? Babylon. Babylon, yes, that's right. Harlot equals the city of Babylon. So we don't need to be looking for some like actual great harlot. Um, no, this is a depiction or a symbol. 
of the city of Babylon. Interestingly, this woman is not merely false religion, though she does represent the city that gave birth to false religion. God considers false religion spiritual immorality. Every nation that has ever existed has drunk from the gold cup of Babylon's spiritual rebellion. Babylon will probably house the final government of fallen humanity and be ruled by the Antichrist until the close to the time of the Gentiles. And we've talked about that prophecy in Daniel before, right? Where it had the statue with the different parts that represented the different kingdoms. And the last one at the bottom was the Antichrist kingdom. And then what was going to destroy that? The stone cut without human hands, which represents Christ's kingdom, which is going to come in and shatter all of them. So basically, this interpretation is that Babylon is that bottom kingdom that will be revived and then smashed by Christ's kingdom. And the last days, Babylon will once again have crushing control over the world, reveling in the rule of a power-hungry elitist, the Antichrist. The Antichrist, it's really fascinating, will try to achieve those same evil goals that the original rulers of Babel failed to make a one-world kind of global hub instead of scattering people about we're going to have now a one world government once again where everybody is the same and everybody's going to come together in this great city and worship ourselves and have this material and religious idolatry and that's fascinating how we see history is like kind of a big circle in this and that the first evil civilization is going to try to in the last evil civilization resurrect itself so let's talk about yeah a little bird. Babylon embodies Babel's rebellion under Nimrod's leadership. And Nimrod was that leader who tried to build the Tower of Babel. So Babylon, in the future, will try to embody that same rebellion. Babylon also incorporates the pride, decadence, and debauchery of the Babylonians in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. So you had the Tower of Babel, And then later in history, you had the Babylonian Empire. And the two most famous kings were Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar, who are also recorded in the Bible. And the future Babylon will incorporate the evilness of all of those previous evil people. The prophecy of Revelation 17 and 18 foretells the end of the devil's evil world system of false religion and materialism and one city under a satanically dominated human government. (coughs) So in the next two chapters of Revelation, we learn that the city of Babylon is destroyed. It's not just going to be replaced with a different kingdom. And you see, that's what happened beforehand. Uh, Jesus, or God, scattered the people at the Tower of Babel, but they weren't all killed, were they? They were just scattered. And then Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom got replaced by the Medo-Persians, but it also wasn't completely killed either. But that is going to change. The final Babylon is actually going to be completely smashed, as we learn in the prophecy with Daniel. It's not ever going to rise up again. It's going to fall, as we'll see in Revelation. Therefore, Revelation 17 and 18 are the explanation of the seventh bowl judgment, as summarized in Revelation 16, 17 through 21, and as celebrated in Revelation 19, 1 through 6. So in other words, the seventh bowl judgment kind of explains what is happening, and that Babylon is going to fall as a result of it. All right. So let's talk next about Revelation 17 and 18, and how they describe the destruction of the city of Babylon. Let us consider the historical concept of Babel and Babylon as found in Scripture. So we're going to dive into some biblical history of this area. According to the Old Testament, Babylon was situated on the plains of Shinar near the Euphrates River. So Babylon is not just a name for evil civilizations in different areas of the world. It is actually a specific specific geographical location, not specific, where the most prominent evil civilization has appeared and resurfaced throughout history. 
in scripture, Shinar is often synonymous with Babylon. In fact, you see all those cross reference verses there. It's interesting. Depending on which translation you have, your Bible might say Shinar and it might say Babylon in different uh, uh, in those verses. And that's because the two are synonymous, pretty much. The area is also called Mesopotamia, Meso, uh, between, and then between Potamia rivers, meaning the area between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. It is also called um, the Levin. So you probably have learned about that place before in history. Even non-biblical scholars um, commonly say that is where the human race originated. Um, it's often also called the cradle of civilization. Has anyone heard that before? The interesting thing is that we'll also learn here that it is the casket of civilization as well. So that's, again, that kind of full circle thing. Babel was ruled by Nimrod. Through his original kingdom, consisted of Babel, Erech, Akkad, and these other cities, he expanded his rule northward, and he built the cities of Nineveh and other cities as well. But Babel was the place where he tried to build the Tower of Babel, and it was his biggest. Since Babylon under Nimrod and other rulers control much of Mesopotamia, figuratively, it is said to be sitting on many waters. As a major metropolitan area, the city of Babylon's motto was, let's make a name for ourselves. To do so, it spawned false religion and also materialism. Unbelievers built the Tower of Babel as a place of false worship. They fostered, promoted, and conveyed the rebellion against the one true God to all nations of the world. So Babel encouraged two sins, idolatry, which replaces the one true God with false gods, and then materialism, <coughs> which replaces him with things. So what are the two sins of Babylon? Okay, I saw Tato's hand first. Never mind. All right. <laughs> I saw Levi's hand then. Yeah, okay. Wow. I almost took out um, Sean's head, but he ducked. <laughs> That's smart. All right. God called Abraham to leave Ur, a city near Babel, that had been seduced by her sins. God wanted Abraham to leave the influence of Shinar and go to Canaan, which he had prepared for him. So even back in Old Testament times, and really always, this area of land had been evil, and Abraham, or God told Abraham to leave this and go to Canaan instead. God called Babel's false religion harlotry. After the flood, everyone on earth knew the truth about God, but soon Babel rejected God and began practicing spiritual adultery. Romans 1 explains that the entire world has committed spiritual adultery. And that's really, and just think about that for a second, that God compares idolatry to basically like cheating on someone that you're in a relationship with. And that's because God made the whole world for us. But when we go to false gods, counterfeit gods, and idols, we are cheating on our true God. And he takes it very seriously. And we're going to read this passage. It's all on the screen here in Romans. And just think about how it applies to the city of Babylon, which um, is rejecting God. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So again, God has expressed the truth to these people. Why? Because for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made, so that they are without excuse. Through creation, the people of Babylon in all time are without excuse. You cannot deny that God is real. For even though they knew God, they knew he existed, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. <coughs> Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals 
and crawling creatures. And the result of all of this idolatry, it says, therefore, <coughs> God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So in other words, don't hug a tree. Thank Jesus for the tree. <laughs> hug him instead, I guess. Also, uh, some of these slides <laughs> so far this week have been very weird. <laughs> when the Antichrist sets up his worldwide government, the false religion birthed in Babel will return to Shinar, its place of origin. There, a rebuilt Babylon will establish an anti-God, one world government, and economy like Babel's. And there's a place, a prophecy that really explains this. This is a really fascinating prophecy um, in Zechariah. And we read it once, and you probably remember it, because it was quite memorable, of the evil women in the basket who had the stork-like wings. But the point of that prophecy is where was the wicked, the woman who was called wickedness going? To Shinar. Why? She was going to settle there or build a house there. So this is talking about Babylon being rebuilt. Now we will examine extra biblical information about Babel's false religion. So we talked about the biblical history, and now we're going to get into the secular history about Babylon. According to this Roman historian, Nimrod's wife, Sarah Remu, I'm probably going to mispronounce this. I, I even wrote down how to pronounce it. How it's Simarus? That. Um, Simarius. Okay. Semiramis. Semiramis. The queen of Babel was worshipped as a goddess. So this was the queen of Babel, the original um, place. And I think this was according, I got it from Britannica. And there's a lot of legends about this queen of Babel. According to this, Sem Semiramis became pregnant after engaging in an adulterous affair while married to Nimrod. Around the same time, Nimrod died a violent and untimely death. In an effort to retain power and hide her misdeeds, this woman made an, an audacious claim. She publicly declared that upon Nimrod's death, he had been resurrected as the god of the sun. As the sun god, Nimrod used his sun rays to miraculously inseminate Romanus with a child. This child was thus considered to be divinely conceived. The child's name was Tammuz, which she claimed was the reincarnated Nimrod. Thus, this would make um, Nimrod both Saramurus's uh, wife and mother. Now, that probably makes no sense. It didn't for me. I had to read it like multiple times to understand it. But the point that we can get about this is there's this really messed up, sinful, idolatrous woman who was this queen of Babel. And there's a lot of different legends about her. Um, legend says, as it explains here, that her son was miraculously conceived by the sun's rays. This false teaching declared that he was the offspring of a god and thus divine. Another legend says that her son was attacked and then killed by a wild animal, but miraculously came back to life. So all these legends about this queen of Babel and her like god son, false god son, over time got passed on and on, and that's why there's so many about them. In time, this concept of a mother as a god was accepted in Babel. According to some accounts, Aramanus claimed to be the queen of heaven. And we can read about this, um, we won't because it's really long, and Jeremiah, but here we learn about some Jews who are living in Egypt who basically say, we should just go back to worshiping the queen of heaven. It was so much better than when we did that. So that's really weird to think about that even the Jewish people, God's chosen people, here, we're going back to worshiping this ancient queen of heaven. So this has been passed down throughout history. This false teaching of a mother deity and her divine son that originated in Babel made its way into many cultures. Um, and there's a list of some of them there. And here's some other pictures of different cultures in the world that have this idea of a divine mother and son duo. 
for instance, there's Shingumu and the child from China, the virgin Hertha and child from Germany, the virgin Patrua and child from the Druids and Britain, Isa and Iswara and India, Aphrodite and Eros and Greece, and then Venus and Cupid from Rome. And even if you hit closer to the valley, who has heard of, uh, for instance, like the virgin Guadalupe and child before? So there's a lot of these different holy mother and child combo before, and it's really interesting if you think back to that started at the beginning of the most evil civilization of Babylon with this false queen of Babel and who she claimed was her miraculous son. And you, this might have been going on in your head already, but many conservative scholars contend that the false teachings of Mary as the mother of God or the queen of heaven arose after a rebellious segment of Christianity added these cultic myths to their idolatrous religion. And it definitely seems probable that some people um, it take Mary and worship her, and that's just a continuation of this worshiping the queen of heaven and her son instead of the true um, only God, Jesus Christ. So now we will examine the extra biblical history of Babylon. But to do this, since we're going to be going through a ton of really fast facts about Babylonian history, and I don't know, who here loves history? Okay, good. Who here loves math? Okay, good. I think history got a little bit more. I like do not like math. But history is awesome. That's why I chose this. And my favorite um, game show, because I love history, is Jeopardy, actually. So I have three contestants who are going to come up and I'm going to go through some of the points as we learn about Babylon, and then I'm going to ask them some questions in Jeopardy style, and they're going to answer. So I already picked out um, some people. So we have the awesome and awe-inspiring Autumn. Welcome her. <laughs> Next, we have the amazing and animated Antonio. And finally, we have the cunning and creative Cassidy. OK. There. OK. So how this works okay, is I'm going to do a couple of test runs of questions that you would already know the answer to. All right, so whoever taps first, obviously, will show up in the different colors. All right. So the capital of Germany is? <laughs> All right, Antonio? No. <laughs> All right? Is it? <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> All right. <laughs> OK. Let's try another one that you really should know the answer to. All right, the name of Cody's girlfriend is? <laughs> that is correct. All right. Okay. Oh, we don't want to do that. All right. So, I don't know why it's doing that. No. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, y'all get how it works. So, how it's going to work, though, with this is I'm going to go over a few points, and then after a couple minutes of that, I'm going to ask a question based off of the information we just went over. So you don't, this isn't testing you on knowledge that you have to know beforehand. It's just more whether or not you're paying attention. So pay attention. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, and Jeopardy, there we go. And the category is Babylonian history. And we have three contestants. All right. So <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar rebuilt and expanded the magnificent city of Babylon on the site of the Tower of Babel. So we already talked about Babel the first time the city was built, on the plains of Shinar. That's the location. But many, many years later, another person, King Nebuchadnezzar, decided to rebuild Babel. And what place did he choose to rebuild it upon? The plains of Shinar. And the second time a kingdom was built on the plains of Shinar, this time it wasn't called Babel anymore. This time it's mostly referred to as Babylon. So Babel was Nimrod's kingdom, to get it straight, and then Babylon would be um, the next time it was built with Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Oh, and I even made a slide to make it easier for us all to understand. So Babel was the original city, Babylon was the newer city, and the location of both of these places was on the plains of Shinar. 
At the capital of the Babylonian Empire, Babylon was known for gold, wealth, pageantry, and an insufferable arrogance. Here's a verse that explains just how arrogant Babylon was. Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand. She made the whole earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore they have gone mad. So notice that Babylon hasn't just been terrible for itself, it has corrupted the entire world. Even us today, our culture and civilizations have been corrupted from the ancient civilization of Babylon. All right. It looks like we're to our first question. Okay. And Jamie is going to be keeping track of everyone's uh, money, but you'll actually just get a prize. You're not going to get $600. All right. So question for 600 what area of land was both Babel and later Babylon built upon? Uh, All right, uh, what would be Antonio? Uh, what is the plain of Sinai? That is correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> woo! So, 600 points <laughs> for Antonio. Okay. There's a lot more questions, though. And they get harder. The Euphrates River in the Shinar region of southern Mesopotamia had many arteries. And an amazing feat of architecture, uh, Babylon was constructed over one of the primary branches of the river. According to Greek writings, the city produced one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens. So this happened during the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you're in our Daniel study, um, we just call him King Nebi. Cody started that. Because Nebuchadnezzar is a mouthful. But King Nebuchadnezzar is talked about a lot in the Bible. Um, he's, he's mentioned, mentioned 90, 90 times, times according, according to the Blue Letter Bible. Bible. And some of the things, in case you're thinking, Nebuchadnezzar, I think I know that guy. He's the person who conquered Judah, pillaged Jerusalem and the temple, um, put the Jews in captivity. He made the huge statue that he made everyone bow down to, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't want to, so they were thrown in a fiery furnace. And the most coolest thing that King Nebi did was he was turned into an animal for seven years because he was too arrogant. And that's actually a rare medical disorder called clinical lycanthropy, when someone believes and acts like an animal. But the Bible isn't the only place that mentions King Nebuchadnezzar. He's mentioned a lot in secular history as well, especially for building the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It's believed that he built these gardens for his wife because she missed the plants from her homeland. The gardens were thought to be 75 feet tall. That's why they had to be hanging. And this means that in order to water them, most scholars believe that 8,200 gallons of water would have been hauled up into the gardens every single day. So that's pretty crazy. All right, next question. All right, Babylonian history for 600. What are at least two things in the Bible that Nebuchadnezzar did? Gosh. All right, Cassidy. Um, <laughs> what is take over Judah and pillage Jerusalem? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is <laughs> You did a lot of things, so. Yeah. Oh, they so All right. In BC 586, Babylon overthrew Jerusalem and destroyed Solomon's temple. Uh, it's not about it. All right. As mentioned earlier, this happened when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah. Okay. So Babylon, of course, as Cassidy mentioned, overthrew Jerusalem, destroyed Solomon's temple. Next, in BC 539, Cyrus the Great of Persia defeated Babylon under the combined armies of the Medes and the Persians. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. So the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar and his predecessors came to an end. Um, and this was actually prophesied by Daniel, the prophet. Because Daniel said in his statue prophecy, if you'll remember, that King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon was what? The head of gold. Uh, and King Nebuchadnezzar didn't like that, which is why he built an entire statue of gold, because he didn't want to just be the head. But Daniel and God were right. He actually was the head. And the next kingdom, the next part of the statue that was going to take over the head of gold would be the Medo-Persians. Now, who here is like, I totally know about the Medo-Persian invasion of Babylon. Okay, 
like some people, maybe like 20%. Most of you probably know a little bit about it. Who has ever heard the phrase, the handwriting on the wall? Okay, then you kind of do know about it. So the handwriting on the wall, that was the night that the Medo-Persians invade, invaded Babylon. Uh, there, there was a big party that was happening, and King Belshazzar, who was a king of Babylon a little bit after King Nebuchadnezzar, was having a big party and thought it would be fun to take the sacred objects from the Jewish temple that his predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, had stolen and then defile them at the party to make fun of God, which was a very bad idea because what happened was that a hand started appearing and writing something on a wall, which made Belshazzar extremely frightened, as it would probably any of us. In fact, some translations say that he actually like wetted his pants, basically, when he saw the um, handwriting on the wall. We had a long discussion about that in our class. It was a little too long. But the point here is that the Medo-Persians took over Babylon. Now, the way they did it is really fascinating, if you like military kind of stories. It actually wasn't a really long or bloody battle at all, because everyone was having this big party and was preoccupied. And there was a big wall around Babylon, so the Babylonians thought, we're cool, our enemies, the Medes and Persians, can't ever get in. But they found a way to get in. They actually went underneath through like the sewer systems and then came up. And since everybody was parting really hard, they were able to take over in a coup the entire empire of Babylon overnight without, well, <laughs> there were no weapons back then, but without a shot being fired, basically, is the idea. So they were able to take it over. And something happened, though, because of this. Babylon technically was no longer in control, but it wasn't like they were super defeated because a lot of the um, important governmental officials, like the prophet Daniel, he had a place in the Babylonian government. He also had a place in the Medo-Persian government. So a lot of the government was kind of just transferred from one civilization to another civilization. Um, and, and that's important to realize. There wasn't a huge war. All the Babylonians weren't slaughtered. Their way of life or their government wasn't radically changed, just the title was. All right. So the Persians overcame and occupied Babylon with virtually no bloodshed or destruction, as we just talked about. Because Babylon was not destroyed in the violent way prophesied in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 through 51, the literal fulfillment of these prophecies is yet future. In other words, the Bible actually has many prophecies in the Old Testament about how Babylon will be destroyed in a very bloody way. And everyone is going to die and it's going to be completely obliterated. And that's not what happened when the Medio Persians invaded it. So that's why um, we believe Babylon will have to be rebuilt so those prophecies about it being completely annihilated can be fulfilled. Let's look back. Okay. What? Jeopardy for 400. All right. Who was the last king of Babylon? He saw the handwriting on the wall. Oh, wait a second. All right. Dang, <laughs> Abbott. Belshazzar? That is correct. Objection, right. Your Honor. <laughs> I concur. She has. <laughs> I should say what is. No, because you don't. Okay. Oh. Okay. This question wasn't done yet. This isn't like actual Jeopardy. Oh, what? This is actual in my life. Oh. <laughs> Continue. I'm sorry. This is GMT Jeopardy. He told me to be competitive. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so next, let's look at some of these prophecies about the ultimate destruction of Babylon. Actually, we're going to get into them in the next sections, so I just wrote down some key points about them, too. But in, the, um, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, it talks about some things that will happen when Babylon will be destroyed. First off, Babylon must be destroyed in the day of the Lord. Second, Babylon's destruction must be accompanied by signs in the sky. Third, Babylon's destruction will be accompanied by the world's destruction. Four, Babylon will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah was. And five, Babylon's destruction will leave no brick left. And six, Babylon's destruction will be followed by Israel's reunification. So if we look at all of these, it's pretty clear that the destruction of Babylon will have to be in the end times, especially because when the Medes and Persians overtook Babylon, the entire world was not destroyed. This didn't happen in the day of the Lord, which is an end times event. There weren't signs in the skies. And when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, there was fire and brimstone. 
and it said that Babylon will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, and there wasn't any fire and brimstone when Cyrus the Great took over Belshazzar's kingdom. So these prophecies, and these are just a few of them, and others, which we'll be going into, kind of are why we believe that Babylon will have to be rebuilt. Because if God says that Babylon will be destroyed with no brick left, that the whole world will be destroyed, and that's going to be this bad, then the Medo-Persian kind of taking over or coup of Babylon isn't really fulfilling those prophecies well enough. And God will fulfill his prophecies to the T every single bit of it. Boasting over 200,000 inhabitants, Babylon was the largest inhabited city in the world from B.C. 612 to B.C. 320, over two centuries after it was overpowered by the Medes and the Persians. So Babylon continued to be this huge city with the same culture after the Medes and Persians took it over. In June B.C. of 323, Alexander the Great, who had conquered the world, died in Babylon. Okay, looks like we have Babylon in history for 800. Okay. What are at least two unfulfilled prophecies about the destruction of Babylon? All right, Cassie. What is, it will occur in the day of the Lord, and it ah! <laughs> No brick, dis not left, destroyed. <laughs> what is? That is correct. Day of the Lord, side of the sky. Oh, yeah, yeah. give her a hand. Give her a hand. <laughs> oh, man. Day of the Lord, side in the sky. The whole world will be destroyed. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, no bricks left. And then also the Israeli reunification. What? <laughs> then I guess you don't get to answer them anymore. The idea isn't to bang them on the table, it's to click them. What? It's just stuck on mine. Yeah, it's just stuck on Cassidy's. I'm just kidding. I was just kidding. Try yours. It works. I'm just kidding. I'm just and try yours. All right. See, it's fair. Guys, I keep on clearing it. Stop looking. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is getting heated. Okay. <laughs> In BC 275, the Greeks escorted many inhabitants of Babylon to Seleucia, causing the city to lose considerable importance. Even so, it was not totally abandoned. During the first century BC, Greek writer Diordius and Silicus and the Greek geographer Strabo wrote that the hanging gardens of Babylon still existed. So even in the first century BC, which was a long time after Nebuchadnezzar, these gardens were still there. And then in 1 Peter 5:13, Peter wrote, She who is in Babylon, or Peter wrote that the church in Babylon sent greetings to his readers as late as as the first and second centuries after Christ, the city was alive and well and a stronghold of Christianity, hosting the headquarters of the Church of the East. So there were still Christians in Babylon during this time. And the Babylonian Talmud was written in or around Babylon in approximately 500 um, AD. And that's an important document in Judaism. Okay. Babylonian all right. You guys can sit this one out if you want. <laughs> also, um, this question that I have here is very long. Okay. I'm just going to have to read it. All right. So, which apostle wrote that the church in Babylon sent greetings to the Jews? Mine's Bethlehem. Those are the first. Peter. Who are, what is Peter? Who is Peter? What is Peter? What is Peter? He's an apostle. Oh, no. oh, yeah. 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 Who is Peter? All right. That is correct. <laughs> Okay. All right, there will be one more question left, which will be a thousand dollars. Okay, so pay attention. And then the section will be over. After its conquest from Islam in 650 AD, most of the remaining Babylon was destroyed and eventually buried beneath the sands, although many baked bricks of the vast city continue to be taken and used by humble people to build their own dwellings. 
Um, this is from, for the audience, why would it be important that people take the bricks of the vast city and use them? All right, I saw Lindsay. Exactly, exactly. Nice catch. Yeah. All right, so yeah, it, that's exactly right. And there's prophecies um, in Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, and Revelation, and Zechariah about Babylon. And that's where we get those different ideas from. Okay. As recently as the 1980s, the late Iraqi President Saddam Hussein was trying to rebuild the city of Babylon. He actually compared himself to the ancient rulers of the Middle East, like Nebuchadnezzar, and it was his goal to rebuild it, and he did try. Um, and of course, our Navy SEALs stopped him, so, but he was, it's kind of interesting that you see even some people who are like trying to bring about the end times, it seems, but it's not the time yet for that to happen. At least it wasn't the time with Saddam Hussein, but who knows, maybe the next leader who tries to rebuild Babylon, it will be that time. And then in 2004, the World Monuments Fund had led efforts to rebuild the city of Babylon. And this is interesting. So you have two different types of people in our world who are pushing for the rebuilding of Babylon. You have like terrorists who want it because they want the Middle East to trump the West and be this epitome of the world. And then you also have these like elitist people in the West, like the World's Monuments Fund, that wants to rebuild it for the sake of history and, I don't know, other reasons. So there are people right now who want to rebuild it. Now, it might seem kind of a little crazy to think, is this amazing civilization or bad civilization that's going to be the epitome of the world? Could it really be rebuilt? Um, but it's interesting to think about that we can't always just compare prophecy to what's happening in our world right now. You can't say, well, I don't see it being rebuilt right now, so it's not going to be rebuilt. If you're a good Bible prophecy student, you will believe the future according to God's word. One really cool thing about that is what is one country or group of people that are mentioned a lot in Revelation? The Jews, right? Israel. Prior to 1948, it seems ridiculous that the Jews would ever have a country. It'd be like saying, I don't know, that the Sioux Indians are going to have a great country, even though they just live on reservations and are a wandering people, or the gypsies in Europe are going to have a great country. That's not probably not going to happen. And that's what a lot of people thought about Israel. But there were some very you know, good Christians who did believe, hey, in Revelation it says there's going to be <laughs> this nation of Israel, so it's actually going to be rebuilt, even if it doesn't seem like it will be. Of course, after the Holocaust, it seemed a lot more probable, and it did happen that the Jews got their own nation. But the point is, we can't judge and say, well, we need to change the interpretation of Revelation because it doesn't seem probable with our modern world. It very well could happen, you know, in the next few years or so that Babylon could be rebuilt. Who knows? Biblically, the great city must return to prominence in the last days in order for the prophecies of Isaiah 13 through 14, Jeremiah 50 through 51, Zechariah 5, and Revelation 17 through 18 to be literally fulfilled. And then, of course, Daniel also talks about the statue as well. God always literally fulfills his promises down to the smallest details. All right, it's the final question. Babylonian history for a thousand. Can we get that Jeopardy theme song? All right. That's okay. no. Thank you. That's enough. Good, good job. All right. This is the last question. Are we ready? No. Uh, okay. List three Old Testament prophets who prophesied about the ultimate destruction of Babylon. Okay, I have right. it. Dang it. Who is uh, Zechariah, Jeremiah, and Isaiah? That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> Bonus question. <laughs> no. Okay. Do we have Final our? scores are. No. <laughs> Autumn with four hundred. Yeah! Woohoo! <laughs> 
Cassidy with 1,400. What's up? And Antonio with the final score of drum roll, please. I want the men's bath ball. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Thank you. And we don't get participation trophies here. Whoa! I see him to Jeopardy. Go, 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 go. <laughs> we also don't give out the candy jars. <laughs> you can have some. Okay. All right, let's give a hand for our Jeopardy contestant. Okay, so that was fun, at least I thought. But hopefully we also learned a lot about Babylonian history. Who thinks they know more about Babylon than they did prior to like uh, 50 minutes ago? <laughs> I probably did actually. <laughs> Reading over this always reminds me. So this taught us a lot, hopefully, and it will be really important, I promise, when we go into chapter 17 and 18, you will be happy that you know something about Babylon because we'll be talking about it a lot. One last thing I want to end off on, which is really interesting. Babylon, of course, we learn, is going to make all the nations, it has made all the nations drunk. It's terrible. It's the epitome of evil, basically. And did you know that the word hallelujah, um, it occurs only four times in the New Testament. It occurs a lot in Psalms and other times in the Old Testament. But in Revelation, in the New Testament, it's used only four times. And they're all in Revelation. And in fact, they're all in Revelation 19, 1 through 6. The four uses of this word, hallelujah, actually are all in response to the ultimate destruction of Babylon. So this nation that has made all of the nations gone mad, that has been idolatrous and has ruined the earth, will be smashed by the stone cut without human hands, which is Christ's perfect kingdom. And that is a reason to say Hallelujah. Exactly. So, thank you. And that is it. Now you are all PhDs in Babylonian history. So. Thank you, sir.
We are going to continue on with Bab 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 Babylon. Yes. Uh, where'd he go? Oh, Colton, where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Way to turn what was boring into absolutely fantastic stuff, man. That was awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. That is a tough act to follow, I'll tell you that. All right. So we're going to continue on with Babylon and why Babylon is such an important city in the Bible. And it's always set in contrast with Jerusalem as far as... In this dream, he, he gets Daniel eventually in there. He doesn't go get Daniel at first because I think he was, was kind of concerned of what it was going to mean for him. And eventually Daniel comes and interprets the dream for him, but Nebuchadnezzar doesn't pay attention. Verse 28. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And note that twelve months later. Just an easy observation. But it's already been interpreted, the prophecy is already there, and it's still a year before it's actually fulfilled. So there was time that went in between the telling of this uh, before it happens. And Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebi, as I've heard him called, it was, had plenty of time to change his mind, but he doesn't. And this is what it takes to change his mind when, it, when he gets struck in as a cow. So the king reflected as he's on the roof of Babylon, of his, of his palace, and said, is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence? This is encapsulating the thought process of the city of Babylon throughout history, the arrogance of this. He says, by the might of my power and the glory of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. That's the way it's going to be when Babylon is destroyed also. The difference here is King Nebuchadnezzar wasn't destroyed. This was a grace judgment going on with Nebuchadnezzar. God was working within the God consciousness of Nebuchadnezzar, and this is what eventually brings Nebuchadnezzar seven years later, when all he can do is he's a cow in the backyard. All he can do is lift his eyes toward heaven. But in that moment of humility, God gave him grace. God gives grace to the humble. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful as we come to the end of, a, of another long day that we've been able to just soak in your truth today and soak in the view of your holy character on display as it will be for the entire world to see. As we end today, Father, in this last hour together, we ask for strength. We ask for our ability to concentrate as we study some difficult things here in regards to understanding of Babylon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're picking up with how will Babylon play a prominent role in the latter days? Although Babylon was largely abandoned after 600 A.D. Now, that's A.D., after the time of Christ and of Domini, the year of our Lord. If the prophecies concerning it in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Revelation are to be literally fulfilled, the city must be rebuilt and become the most prominent city of the world by the end times. Can Literal Babylon be rebuilt. Yes, just the temple in Jerusalem must be literally rebuilt, or just as. 
in the end time, so also the city of Babylon must be rebuilt. God prophesied both, so both will happen. Some might ridicule the possibility of this rebuilding, but remember that for many years people ridiculed the idea of a revival nation of Israel in the end time. This ridicule was silenced in 1948 when against all odds Israel once again became a nation. It was in the 1800s certain men like Robert Anderson and others who were just studying scripture began to realize Israel must return to the land when there was no thing of thinking about that, uh, that it could even possibly happen. And they were ridiculed, they were laughed at, they were mocked, they were scorned. And then look at what has happened. Does Babylon have to be rebuilt before Christ returns at the rapture of the church? No, the return of Christ could happen today. The tribulation doesn't begin with the rapture, but with the signing of a covenant treaty between Israel and the Antichrist. That's the Daniel 9 passage with the signing of that peace treaty for Israel to have the temple where they can then worship God, and that will be brokered by the Antichrist. So it doesn't have to be rebuilt before. There may very well be a short time lapse between the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation, giving time for the rapid building of Babylon, considered Dubai's rapid birth, as well as time for the rebuilding of a Jewish temple in Jerusalem. It could happen quickly. There's a level where even, as has already been mentioned, I think, this week, about the, the Jewish temple, the Temple Institute, they've got the things ready to roll. And they don't have to necessarily have a completed temple building. It just needs to be functioning. Just like when the return was Zerubbabel and the first return with the Babylonian captivity. They didn't have the full temple until 20 years later, but they had a functioning temple right away once they established the altar there. At the same time, we may witness the rebuilding of Babylon and or the temple before Christ returns for his church. We can't know, but we do know they will be rebuilt. All right, now we're going to move into Mystery Babylon. And Mystery Babylon, if we'll turn real quick now to Revelation chapter 17. The reason we use this term is because that's what we find right here in Scripture. Revelation 17, verse 5, And on her head a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And what we're getting ready to see when we get into Revelation 17 and 18 tomorrow is the complete destruction of Babylon. God is going to crush Babylon and toss it down. That's like the force right there. You know, just, you know, right now like that. Bible scholars teach three views of the city of Babylon. So I get to look at counter views again with, with this. Let us first consider Revelation 17, 5, which reads, as we just read it, and on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great. What did John, the author, the one who is writing this, mean by the word mystery? Because this is what he is, he's seeing this, what does he recognize this to mean? Because mystery is in capital letters and part of her title, isn't John saying that the city of Babylon is figurative or allegorical? No, not necessarily. The word mystery, mysterion, does it, is not like what we think of a, a Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes type mystery, but more of something that was previously unrevealed in the Old Testament. There's an unrevealed aspect of Babylon that we learn about here in Revelation 17 and 18 that we don't have anywhere else in scripture. The capital letters in our English translations can be misleading. We need to remember that in the first century when John wrote the entire book would have been in capital letters called unicals as was traditional in the Greek language. Equally important is the placement of commas in our translations. The Greek of John's writing used no commas, wood ba uh, word boundaries, or periods. In other words when you go to look at a Greek manuscript, this is what you're having to deal with. I don't know about you, but that's all Greek to me. <laughs> so let's do this in English. All right, you can write it wherever you want, but I like for all, everybody to write these letters with no spaces, all caps. Okay? L, L as in Larry, that's the first letter. E, T, S, E, A, T, G, R, 
A N N Y. Now, how you interpret that, where you place the comma, is the difference between having supper with grandma or having grandma for supper. So commas save lives. Commas are important. Punctuation is important. Grammar is important. And so some of the things that we're looking at that's different here relate to that. Okay? Now, therefore, this verse can be interpreted in two legitimate ways. Caution is essential. Was John quoting a caption on her head that reads, Mystery Babylon the Great? And we find that in the KJV and the NIV. Or was John quoting a mysterious caption on her head that reads, Babylon the Great? And that's what you find in the NASB. So which one's it going to be? Your interpretation of this verse will greatly influence your understanding of the following chapters of Revelation. Much like what we saw earlier today in Revelation 14 with the phrase, Son of Man, that controls what you do with the rest of that passage. Well, now we've got two large sections, two large chapters, based upon what we do with this phrase. One reading will make you conclude that the name on the head of the harlot Babylon is Mystery Babylon, meaning a mysterious or allegorical name standing for another city. And when you go this route, well... There's a multiple interpretations. If you read 10 interpreters, 10 commentaries that take this route, you're going to find 10 different opinions. You're going to find 10 different interpretations. The other reading will make you conclude that a mystery surrounds the city of Babylon the Great. This curriculum supports the second view. So we're going to be looking at the different views and some of the strengths and weaknesses of those views and why we consider taking it literally as it said here and that this the mystery is the unknown aspect of Babylon the city, Babylon the great. Many scholars conclude that John was saying that Babylon is a mystical concept or an allegorical code name for Rome, Jerusalem, or another city. Again, we do not agree. In this study, we teach that God meant what he said. Babylon means a literal city of Babylon in Shinar that will become a center of the Antichrist Empire during the last days. All religion and commerce will be controlled or influenced from this city. And we've already seen some of this when what, what Colton took us through just a moment ago. We teach that an actual city of Babylon is essential for the prophecies of Revelation 17 and 18 to be fulfilled literally. If our interpretation is correct, this city will have to be rebuilt in the last days. And we saw, just saw six reasons why it has to, be, has to come back, because it has not been completely destroyed as we have in certain passages, and we're going to be going and looking at some of those in Isaiah and Jeremiah here in just a moment. If not rebuilt soon before the rapture, then Babylon must be erected during the brief period between the rapture and the signing of the non-aggression pact between Israel and the Antichrist. Again, Daniel 9 is where we find that peace treaty being signed from, with the prince who is to come and comes to establish that seven-year contract. Using a literal hermeneutic, Babylon must be a city of great importance, even possibly the capital of the one world end times government. This Gentile government will dominate all other nations and may possibly be ruled by nations that constituted the old Roman Empire, or the, what we would call the European nations now, which for years with the newspaper exegesis or eisegesis has been the European Union. Now we've got countries wanting to come out of the European Union that were part of the Roman Empire. That's a rather interesting dynamic. But let's talk about, a f just get a chart on, on here to kind of see where we're headed with what we do with Babylon here. So these are pre-Armageddon events, Armageddon being the final campaign at the end of the tribulation. The midpoint, Revelation 13, 15, with the abomination of desolation, as we've seen it in also in connection with Daniel 9 and Matthew 24. After the midpoint, we have the woman, Israel, going into the wilderness, possibly Basra, Petra, Teman area, to be protected by God from the dragon. Revelation 12, 6, 
13 to 16 also parallels with Matthew 24, 16. Well, after that, or maybe coinciding with that, is going to involve some of this aspect of destruction with Babylon. There, somehow or another, the beast, the Antichrist, <coughs> excuse me, joins with the ten kings to destroy Babylon, and God is the one, however, orchestrating this, just like we saw earlier when we were going to have the armies of the world gathered at Armageddon. They're going to be gathered there with demonic influence, but God is moving his plan forward through these influences. And then the final destruction seems to be connected with the, when we get into Armageddon and the final bowl, of, of, this is the sixth bowl, but when we get to the seventh bowl, that will... If Babylon isn't already totally destroyed by then, it will be then by God himself. And so, again, you've got a lot of details. You have two long chapters in Isaiah. You have two long chapters in Jeremiah. And we've got these two long chapters in Revelation. All of these details we've got to find a pigeonhole for. And so there's a lot of things to work out, and it gets kind of difficult to get the exact scenario chronologically down. Although we believe Babylon will be headquartered in Shinar, we are not suggesting that Islam will control it because the Bible doesn't say so. And it's possible, but it doesn't have to be. Let's examine the strengths and weaknesses of the belief that Babylon is a code name for Jerusalem or Rome rather than a reference to actual Babylon. Babylon equals Jerusalem. Today, most preterists... Raise your hand if that's a new term to you, preterist. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay? Most preterists, those who believe that most prophecies of the end times have been fulfilled, teach that John used Babylon as a code name for the first century Jerusalem. There are several ways that Revelation is interpreted. Preterism is one of them. Historicism is another. Idealism is another. And I'm going to give a chart here in a minute. We'll go through all of them so you can see how they, how they interpret the passage. They suggest that both Revelation 17 and 18 and Matthew 24 depict the destruction of Jerusalem by General Titus of Rome in A.D. 70. And that uh, they connect that to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. But they do a poor translation of trying to add what the Lord talks about in Luke, in that sermon on the aspect of end times within the Olivet Discourse, and the hermeneutics is really shaky, if not almost blasphemous in some ways. So let's do this. We're going to chart out the chronology of the events on the top line, and then down here we're going to put the different schools of interpretation, and we'll see where they interpret all of these events. So with the crucifixion of Christ, roughly 33 A.D., his resurrection, ascension to heaven, we then have the beginning of the church age with the day of Pentecost. During the church age, 70 A.D., the temple is destroyed and Israel is scattered with a greater diaspora than what we had before. Now, the church age will end with the rapture of the church. That then can be the time after that we have the signing of the peace treaty that begins Daniel's 70th week. That could happen on the same day. You could have the rapture and the signing of the peace treaty. In other words, you could have the, you could have the uh, media all gathered there with the cameras on and the ink about to go down the contract. <laughs> We're out of here. And then he signs the paper. And you could have it that way, but you don't necessarily have to have it that way. There's a difference between saying the rapture starts the tribulation versus saying that the rapture must occur before the tribulation. So we want to keep the distinction there. That's why I've got a space. That, that gap there could be a moment of seconds or years. I don't think it's going to be a lot of years, but it could, could be. Now, at this point, it could be. So we've got the first half of the seven-year peace treaty, three and a half years, 1,209, that should be 1,260 days. Sorry about that. And who wears the 1,260-day hat? Okay, the Jewish people, it's the white hat, okay? The 42 months is the black hat for the Antichrist, right? But it's the same basic, basic time period. So we've got one full week or one set of seven years that will end with Christ's second coming at the uh, coming to end the Armageddon campaign and deliver Israel, and then we move into the kingdom. All right, so here are all the events laid out. Now, preterism... 
takes all of this that we've been studying and jams it all right here as having been already fulfilled. Everything but chapters 21 and 22. wonder why that would be. Remember what 21.4 says? He will wipe away all tears. There will no longer be any death, no longer any suffering. That's kind of hard to allegorize, don't you think? So they don't put that in there, but they put everything else into being fulfilled at that time period. In other words, 70 A.D. with the destruction of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is Babylon in their view and is fulfilled all the way jot and tittle in their view. Historicism, that's what, the, you can't see it very well, this is historicism. Now historicism sees these events as circular. And so within historicism often you get the Catholic Pope as the Antichrist, just continuing to show up again and again and again throughout history. And that's, one, that's another view of this. And so there's no, the, everything's symbolic. I mean, everything in the book of Revelation is symbolic with an allegorical interpretation. The numbers are symbolic. You can't have a literal thousand. You can't have a literal seven. You can't because you've got to symbolize these things to make it fit. Futurism is our position of where we recognize that these events are still all in the future. We're still waiting for the fulfillment of these events. So I think we probably understand that one. One more is idealism. And idealism is just this idea that, well, this is just a, a real neat movie about good versus evil. In other words, you could just make it Star Wars and the same thing. You know, just good versus evil. And eventually good's going to win in the end, and sometimes evil is going to win, but eventually good's going to end uh, win the, in the and, Christ, and God will establish some sort of eternal destiny for all of us. So everything is just spiritual ideals rotating over and over and over again. Okay? But preterism does take the view that Jerusalem is Babylon. Some will do that with historicism as well, but also Rome, and we'll talk about that one in a minute. We do not hold to this view for various reasons, but mainly because there are only a few similarities between the events detailed in Revelation 17 and 18, <coughs> excuse me, and what actually happened to Jerusalem in AD 70. <coughs> Preterists allegorize many details of Matthew 24. They always start in Matthew 24. That's their controlling hermeneutic. And not necessarily in a good interpretation, just that's their con way they interpret Matthew 24 controls what they, how they interpret everything else only taking literally those details that seem to have happened when Rome overthrew Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Even though some details may seem similar, the prophecies in Isaiah 13, 14, Jeremiah 50, 51, and Revelation 17, 18 did not occur in Jerusalem, making them yet future. And we'll, when we look at Isaiah and Jeremiah in a minute, we'll, we'll see that. Not one single reference in Scripture equates Babylon with Jerusalem. In fact, throughout Scripture, Babylon and Jerusalem are treated as separate cities. Now, one reason they do this, if you look with me real quick at Revelation 18, verse 21. It says, Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, note, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. You see the phrase, the great city. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 11. <coughs> Revelation 11, 8, with the death of the two witnesses. It says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So what's the great city in the context? Okay, in this context, Jerusalem is the great city. So what they're doing is when they see the great city in Revelation 18, they're saying it's got to be Jerusalem because it was Jerusalem here. That's poor hermeneutics. Context controls what it is. First of all, it tells us specifically in this context. And then if you look at the overall context of Revelation 17 and 18, it can't be Jerusalem. There's a reason for that. This is what's called, big words, illegitimate totality transfer what that means is you're taking what's legitimate here but you're illegitimately taking it out of this context 
and transferring the whole meaning into another context that's different from this one, and therefore it gives it a different meaning than what's intended. And that's bad Bible study, and this is what, what they're doing. Here are some additional difficulties with this view from Revelation 17, 18. Revelation 17, 1, 15, and 18, 17 to 19 depict Babylon as being by many waters. And a lot of that aspect is the woman sitting on the waters. The waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The, the passage in Revelation explains what the waters are. And explains to that it's the global influence that's going on with the harlot. In this verse, many waters is used figuratively for the nations of the world. We know God means Babylon because it's described as being located on many waters. God never described Jerusalem in this way. Jerusalem is equated with Egypt sometimes, and even Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament, but never do you find it equated or used symbolically with Babylon. You don't find that in the Old Testament, so we shouldn't expect to find anything new like that here unless it was specifically stated, and it's not. When the angel took John to the city of Babylon to show him the harlot, the Bible says he was taken into a wilderness. In the first century A.D., Jerusalem was not in a wilderness, but the area of Shinar, the location of Babylon, fit that description well and still does. It's, you know, it's the area of Babylon, even when Saddam Hussein has rebuilt a good part of it is it's still not uh, in a place which you would call uh, heavily inhabited yet. But there's a lot of things going on that can change that very quickly. Revelation 17, 18 indicates that Babylon ruled over the kings of the earth. First century Jerusalem did not rule over the kings of the earth. Instead, Israel, of which Jerusalem is the capital, was under Roman rule at that time. Revelation 18, verse 7, says that the harlot Babylon will say in her heart, I sit as queen, like the queen of heaven, as Colton was telling us about, and I am not a widow and will never see mourning. That prideful declaration repeats Isaiah's words in Isaiah 47, prophesied about Babylon, not Jerusalem. You can see Genesis 11 there and some of the other passages that we've already talked about. There's Daniel 4, verse 30, that we started with. Verses 15 and through 19 of chapter 18 states that the shipping industry will become rich from the cargo of Babylon, and therefore they mourn the city's destruction. Jerusalem did not make the shipping industry rich, especially not in the first century. Israel didn't have a great port. There was a reason for that. God wanted Israel to depend upon him for their trade and their commerce. And it's also not located by a great body of water in the sense of like what we have with the river there of Babylon on the Euphrates. Revelation 18.21 corresponds with Jeremiah 51.63-64 in which a stone was thrown into waters of the Euphrates River to show the final and absolute destruction of the great city Babylon. It was first century Jerusalem completely destroyed? No, because people have been living there ever since. And they've come, I mean, not in the sense of the full Jewish uh, uh, population, but it's, that's what's happening now. And with Babylon, there's always been some people living there, but not as the metropolis-type situation. 22 through 23 says that destroyed Babylon never again will enjoy music, craftsmen, the grinding of wheat, light, or even marriages. Jerusalem has never fulfilled this prophecy, but has remained a viable city throughout the centuries. And when Babylon is destroyed, it's be going to become the, the holding place for the demons. There's the unclean demons that are going to be held there. Satan's in the abyss for the thousand years. Babylon becomes the holding place for the demons for the time for the kingdom. We see several passages that deal with that in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Modern Jerusalem is a fully functioning city, enjoying a bustling economy. Music, craftsmen, grinding of wheat, light, and marriages are alive and well in Jerusalem. Even in the first century, after the destruction of Jerusalem, the Romans continued to house a legion there. Therefore, Jerusalem cannot be the fulfillment of Revelation 17 and 18, and specifically Revelation 18, 21, with the millstone thrown into the sea or into the Euphrates. So that's about Jerusalem. So now let's talk about Rome. Babylon equals Rome is another position. Some people believe that Babylon represents the city of Rome and her false religion. And this would be more of the historicist view. But you'll find this also with some futurists, especially early on. 
in, in pre-mill, pre-trib, uh, early on, sometimes it's interpreted as Rome, Babylon is Rome, and the harlotry or the spiritual harlotry is Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. And that is viewed sometimes. And uh, it's, that was at an early time of developing an understanding of eschatology, and there's a reason why they were taking that at the time. These teachers hold that the harlot represents a one-world church based in Rome, the Vatican, and controlled by the Antichrist during the Tribulation. This is why often within this they'll see the Pope as the Antichrist. And he might be the false prophet. You know, I, don't, I don't know, but he's not going to be the Antichrist of what we see in this sense as far as because he's in Rome. This view typically teaches that Revelation 17 is a prediction of the destruction of the future one world church that will dominate all religions during the tribulation. They often teach that this church will be destroyed at the midpoint of the tribulation. They believe chapter 18 describes the future destruction of the actual city of Rome, which will house the Antichrist and his government during the tribulation. In other words, within the getaway from historicism, let's think about it within futurists, which are very close to our understanding, they, they see the emphasis in Revelation 17 on the spiritual idolatry, and then they see the emphasis in Revelation 18 on the commerce. As Colton pointed out, there's two, two identities to the harlot, her religious system and her economic system. And because you can see a distinction, they see a shift of one being destroyed and then the other being destroyed later. Huge problem. The unity of the two passages going along with Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51, it's not possible. It doesn't work out that way. We've got to see it destroyed all at the same time. The strengths of this view of Rome is Babylon. The Bible says that Babylon reigns, present tense, keeps on reigning over the kings of the earth, a fact that was true of Rome during the days of the Roman Empire. The imagery of the harlot in her comparison to the pomp and pageantry of organized religion, especially Catholicism, is strong. There's a great deal of liturgy and, and all the ritual and everything that goes along with that that you could see within this idolatry of the worship of Semiramis and Tammuz and all that mother-child cult stuff that has come along from Babylon and seems to have been gravitated and captured by every nation since, in some degree or another. This city was drunk with the blood of the martyrs, which was true of the historical city of Rome. Historically, Catholicism persecuted both non-Catholic Christians and Jews. <coughs> this, is, this is a problem when you're witnessing to a Jewish person because you have to make a distinction between the Jesus of church history and the Jesus of the Bible. Because the Jesus in church history, along with the Catholicism connection, has been guilty of killing Jews throughout church history. You ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? That was religiously motivated within Catholicism. And sadly, you've got a lot of Protestants that do the same thing. And so you have to think, keep that in mind, and there's a distinction between what has been done in the name of Jesus in church history versus what the Bible says about Jesus. That the city is built on seven mountains is often cited as evidence of Rome. It is said to have been built on the seven hills. In Revelation 17, verse 9, it says, Here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. You know, the seven hills of Rome. You know, who knows the seven hills of Rome? Ooh, all right, give them to me. No, the names of them. You know the names? Oh. Oh, come on. One of them, some, yes. And then you have, one's Palestine, Kulinera, uh, what's that? Sahrite, good. There's a, it's A-C-C-P-Q-V. No, A-C-C-E-P-Q-V. So those are the, you got them? That sounds, what she, is that not what you said? Is that not what you said too? Okay, yeah, all right, that's the other one. Anybody remember that one? I knew it was some homeschool kids we'd have some of those names out here. I, just, I knew it had to be there. Awesome. Fantastic. Anyway, that, they're all given names. They all got different names. And this is one reason. And there's a certain legitimacy to that. But the, the text is going to interpret to us and help us understand what these seven hills are. They're not the hills of Rome. These are kingdoms. 
the text interprets it for us. The shipping industry was made rich by Rome's wealth in the first century. And again, we're going to see the, the, the shipping masters are going to be really upset when Babylon is destroyed. The weaknesses of this view of Rome is Babylon. The harlot is never called false religion. On the contrary, she is emphatically said to be the great city of Babylon, the harlot city. Notwithstanding, we know and confirm that she gave birth to all false religion, idolatry in particular, going back to Babel or Babylon. The imagery of a harlot does not only represent the false Christianity of Rome, but rather she represents the city in which false religions originated, in Babel. After the flood, idolatry starts at Babel. And it began there, and it will end there. It's like bookends of post-Diluvian history, the post-flood history. The false religions that came from Babel include Buddhism, false Christianity, Confucianism, all these other isms. False religion is not just one particular apostate church. So you name the ism, you can chase it to Babylon some way. The city is said to reign, again, present tense, over the kings of the earth. While that was true of first century Rome, it will be equally true of the future city John saw in his vision, whether or not that is Rome. Note that Revelation 17 to 18 does not merely describe happenings in the first century, but more specifically those of the city John saw in the wilderness at the end of the times of the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles is when you have the end of that statue of Nebuchadnezzar or the final beast out of the sea and the whole, all of it is concluded. The times of the Gentiles comes to an end and then the kingdom arrives. It is true that Rome was built on seven hills. Revelation 79 it is also true that the harlot will sit on seven mountains. However, Revelation 17.10 clearly declares that the seven mountains are seven kings. The text does not allow us to interpret the seven mountains as seven literal mountains. John's explanation demands that we interpret them as kings or kingdoms. So I guess that's what the Easter Island guys are supposed to be, the kings, not the hills. All right. What's wrong with that guy? <laughs> Something different about him. <laughs> Got the little horn coming out of oh, no. All right. Babylon equals Babylon. What an odd interpretation, huh? Just take it as Babylon, right? This is, this is what we hold to. This study holds to a literal interpretation of Babylon as the city Babylon as we've stated. Odd hermeneutic. Just take the Bible of what it's saying. Okay, just go with it. So let's talk about interpretation for a minute. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the rules of interpretation. And we're talking about literal interpretation. We're talking about taking the word of God as it says. Literal, historical, grammatical interpretation. It's within a historical context. Like the U.S. Constitution is written in a historical context to be interpreted from within that context. Scripture is the same way. Grammar makes a difference. Remember, whether we eat grandma or not, that, that makes a difference. And so the grammar is important. All these things go into applying to Scripture, and what we want to be is consistent across the board. And where we have differences often, it's a hermeneutical difference. Even within like-minded believers, the difference often falls within a lack of consistency somewhere on someone's part. And we all have our blind spots. We all have certain baggage that we bring, and this is why we need to constantly be coming to Scripture and prayerfully and with the idea for God the Holy Spirit to guide us into our study. So literal interpretation emphasizes the need to understand the text within its original historical context. And this was with John seeing these things. There's a difficulty because he's seeing things in the future. Remember, future past. He's over here in his future looking back at what's still future, but seeing it in the past, and he's seeing things that haven't been invented yet. He's seeing things that haven't happened yet, and he's got to describe these things. And so there's, there's some language issues going on with that. But at the same time, God the Holy Spirit is inspiring him in his writing, and God communicates for the purpose of being understood. So there's, we, these things can be understood. But sometimes it takes a little work, takes a little sweat, takes a little effort, and we need to consistently apply the hermeneutic. 
Literal interpretation prefers the clearest interpretation based on the inductive method. Often we can consider Bible study as being a detective, going in and looking at the evidence versus the deductive method. Let's see if we can chart this out a little bit. Deductive method is what we want to avoid most of the time. And I'll, we'll talk about application of deduction here in just a minute. But this is not where we start. So let's, let's start here just for fun, okay? So we come along with, all of us do, with a background, our cultural context, our experiences, our intuitive ideas, just the way we read is a, is a background. Uh, the way we read things has an impact on when we read the text. So we're coming to the text of Scripture to read it, to study the infallible Word of God, inspired by God, by the Holy Spirit. But if we come deductively, then we're going to come and eisegete. And that means, eis is a Greek word meaning into. We're going to read into the text what we want. This is coming to the Bible study with preconceived ideas and looking for proof texts that prove our viewpoint. In other words, we've already made up our mind what we want it to be. Now let's find a verse to support it. There's a story, if it's not true, it ought to be. I read it in a book that uh, ought to be true about Theodore Roosevelt. President Roosevelt was sitting in the Oval Office, and he was getting ready to give a speech on the Monroe Doctrine. Remember, speak softly, carry a big stick. You know, that was, that was Theodore Roosevelt. And he's there on his desk. He's got a Bible. He's got a concordance. He's got all these different uh, Bible works on his desk. And two of his, I can't remember if they're cabinet members or advisors, whatever, come in. And he doesn't even recognize them. He's just pouring over the Scripture. And he looks up and he says, Gentlemen, grab a book. The Monroe Doctrine's in here somewhere. And he's, I think he's probably right, but uh, he was already made up his mind that the Monroe Doctrine was in the Scripture. He's trying to find a passage to support it. Now, yeah, you like that. <laughs> well, that's not the way to do Bible study, okay? We don't want to do Bible study because this is what happens. When we do Bible study that way, we come out unchanged. The text hasn't had the opportunity to impact our thinking because we didn't allow it. Inductive method is what we want. So when we come to text inductively, we still come with the same background, but now we are purposely, with our hermeneutics, pushing those things aside. We, we want to try to check those things at the door and not bring them into the text. And when we come to the text now and we read the Bible, now we want to exegete the text. And that means to bring out. Coming to Bible study, focusing on the details to formulate our viewpoint based on the data in the text, regardless of our background. Now, we come to this prayerfully, we come with this humility, with, with a humble mindset, and the results here then, when we allow this to happen and we believe what we've learned from the text, then God the Holy Spirit can enact a change in our character. Character transformation can take place. But deductively, that's not going to happen. Now, we'll go back to something I said this morning. Inductively searching in the text for when Satan fell. We don't find the inductive data. So then we make a deduction and hold our deductions very loosely. Okay? But realize it's a deduction. When I'm teaching, I often I try to point out this is my deduction from the text. And you're very free to disagree with that at any time you want to because those deductions can change based on more inductive data, okay? So what we're seeing is, as we're getting this into Babylon, we're looking at how in the past there's been a lot of deductive Bible study on Babylon, and we're trying to look at it more inductively. Literal interpretation emphasizes the principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. In the book of Revelation, there's a lot of Scripture that fills in the gaps of the white space in the book of Revelation, and that's the Old Testament. And there's a lot of Old Testament passages that fill in the white space of Revelation 17 and 18. And that's what we're going to use here in just a second to look at these things. So a careful examination of the prophecies in Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 50 to 51 about Babylon's destruction shows a future fulfillment. For example, Babylon has not been totally annihilated. History records that the city was inhabited at least until A.D. 600. And even today, people are busy restoring it. That was one of Saddam Hussein's pet projects. All right, let's turn to Isaiah 13. 
We're not going to read all of these passages. We're just going to hit some highlights of them. In Isaiah 13, verse 4, A sound of a tumult on the mountains, like that of many people, a roar, sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathered together. So God's going to get these nations pulled together, either directly or indirectly. The Lord of hosts is mustering the army for battle. That's Revelation 17, 17 goes with this. They are coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons, the Lord and His instrument of indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. So God, not man, will create a heavenly army from the farthest horizon to destroy the whole land of Babylon. There's going to be both human armies involved in this as well as an angelic or supernatural aspect to this. Uh, now, in verse 6, it mentions the day of the Lord. And I haven't uh, heard a whole lot as far as details of the day of the Lord since I've been here. So I just want to quickly review the aspect of the day of the Lord real quick. I'll try to make this as fast as I can. I know you're hungry and tired and look like you could use an extra hour of sleep in the new year. All right. The day of the Lord serves as a key to unlocking the eschatological door. The eschatological being the last things. Every New Testament book has a reference to the day of the Lord with the exception of Philemon. And the reason is it's all over the Old Testament. Hundreds upon hundreds of passages dealing with the day of the Lord. It's a very important concept. The day of the Lord is the Hebrew Scripture's most common term for the tribulation period, but also includes the times of blessing in the millennial kingdom. So let's, let's chart this out. That's, you know, uh, as a dispensationalist, that's the 11th commandment. Thou must make charts. So we make them. So the day of the Lord equals over a thousand years because it's like a Jewish day from sunset to sunset. So we have the first sunset, the time of the tribulation. This is the night time. When the, when the day of the Lord begins with the signing of the peace treaty, this is a very dark time. We've been looking at a lot of the dark things that happen there, although done by God, this great day of judgment going on. Most of the passages where you have the day of the Lord mentioned focus on this part because it's a, to be a motivating factor for Israel to get themselves right with the Lord. That time will end with the daybreak, the sun rising, when the Son of God comes at the second coming, and we move now into the daytime period, the time of the kingdom, when the lion will lay down with the lamb, the Lord will rule for a thousand years. But that thousand years will end with a final sunset, the evening darkness when Satan is loose at the very end of it, and he will get a rebellion up, and God will squash that right away, and we move into the time period of the great white throne judgment, and then on into eternity. So this is the layout of the day of the Lord. Most of Revelation is with about this. How many verses about the kingdom do we get in Revelation? Well, if you put them all together, maybe, if you put them all together, but in that part of where it's just the kingdom itself focused on in chapter 20, it's only like four or five verses. Why? It's all in the Old Testament. The book of Revelation assumes we know that. And so fill in the white space from the Old Testament there. Most of it is giving us the, the chronological outline of this time period. Now, there are other passages in Revelation, when you put them together, probably will equal up a chapter with the announcement of the kingdom and those types of things. But when it's right there chronologically, it's a very small amount. So, the day of the Lord is a major eschatological theme in both Testaments. Joel 3, 9 through 16 describes the wrath aspect of the day of the Lord. So does Zechariah 14. Joel 3, note 17 through 21, describes the blessing aspect of the day of the Lord. And you don't see much of a time interval between it. And we, I think we've already talked about that a little bit as far as the time interval between things happening. So let's look at it this way. If you look at Joel 2, this is the time period of wrath being described. And you have the daybreak in Joel 3, and then Joel 3, 17, that's the time period of the blessing. So in the day of the Lord, you've got to focus on the wrath, and you've got to focus on the blessing. And you have to look at the words around it to decide what part is being emphasized in those passages. And that's the same thing what we're looking at here in these two passages in Isaiah and Jeremiah. So in Isaiah 13, 9 through 11, the Lord declared that Babylon would be destroyed during the day of the Lord. The events described in these verses could happen only in the end time. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. 
cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it, the earth dwellers, the usurpers. For the stars of heaven, their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. And so God destroys the objects of their worship. Verse 11, Thus I will punish the world, key verse here, for its evil. This is the reason for the judgment. And the wicked for their iniquity. I also will put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. So the, the judgment that God brings is going to reveal the evil that's on the planet and he's going to destroy them as he destroys Babylon. Verse 12, the Lord declared that when Babylon is destroyed, mankind will become scarcer than gold. This reduction in population will happen at the end of the tribulation. Therefore, I will make the, I'm sorry, verse 12, I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. And you can go and do the math which I'm not very good at. I get seven out of five things wrong every time I try to do something in math. But you can go, do, some of you caught that, some of you will get that later tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but the, the math on this, if you go and do the percentages, by the time you get to the end of the tribulation, I mean, you've got billions of people that have died during the tribulation period. God says that the destruction of the city of Babylon will be like the total obliteration of Sodom and Gomorrah. Babylon was not completely destroyed by Medo-Persia and still exists today. We cannot find Sodom today, but we can visit Babylon. So verse 19 says, In Babylon, the beauty of the kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What was left of Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> Nothing, yeah. The Dead Sea is there, which will have life in it during the kingdom, but it had not had life in it since. And so this is what's got to happen to Babylon. And again, when the Medo Persians came through, the Babylonians were in there toasting the gods, getting drunk, and, and the Medo Persians, Cyrus just walked in because he, bright idea, just dam up the river and walk right into it. And that's what he did. And he went in and it took the city without having to destroy the city, and it continued on, and people have lived there to this day. Verse 20 Isaiah said that no one would ever resettle or live in Babylon. History shows that people lived in the city as late as A.D. 600 and today are resettling that exact area. We've already talked about that. Matter of fact, we as U.S. have put billions of dollars in the area of our U.S. Embassy in that area and all the fiber optics bringing in and that stuff. Interesting stuff. Jeremiah also declares that Babylon would be decimated and her land never again inhabited. So let's jump over to Jeremiah 50. And basically we're only looking at the passages that emphasize the fact that Babylon must be completely destroyed. There's a lot of other things going on here that, have, that kind of jump around a little bit, but we're just looking at these passages that emphasize this. Jeremiah 50, verse 3. For a nation has come up against her out of the north. It will make her land an object of horror, and there will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off. They have gone away. And verse 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, the word which the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through Jeremiah the prophet. And so in verse 3, he says, there will be no inhabitant left in it. Every living thing will flee when Babylon is conquered. The end of verse 3 there, everything wanders off. After Persia captured the city, it continued to be the largest city on earth for another 200 years. Matter of fact, Alexander loved the place. Made his Greek friends mad because when they were returning back from having conquered everything, or at least they got tired of conquering everything. They came back and he, he stopped off in Babylon. He wanted to make it his capital. Babylon will become the least of the nations, a wilderness, a parched land, and a desert. While that may have been partially true, the city is being rebuilt today. It says, Behold, she will be the least of the nations, a wilderness, a parched land, and a desert. In verse 12. Verse 13, Because of the Lord's anger, no one will live in Babylon, which will be a total ruin. Because of the indignation of the Lord, she will not be inhabited, but she will be completely desolate. Everyone who passes by Babylon will be horrified and will hiss because of all her wounds. And we'll get to see some of the hissing tomorrow with the destruction in Revelation 18 from the kings and the merchants and the shipmasters. For when Babylon is destroyed, they are hissing quite a bit. Babylon will surrender. Towers will collapse and her walls will be destroyed when the city surrendered to Persia did not collapse or fall apart. 
They just went from section to section because they'd had the city sectioned off. They just went from section to section conquering. They did. Raise your battle cry against her on every side. She has given herself up. Her pillars have fallen. Her walls have been torn down. For this is the vengeance of the Lord. Take vengeance on her as she has done to others, so do to her. Verse 20. God promised that when this destruction occurs, Israel's sin will not be found. That is certainly not true today because Israel as a nation is still in unbelief. Hold your, hold your finger here and go to Zechariah 5. Now, Zechariah 5, we've already heard from uh, Brett and Colton about the woman in the ephah, the woman of wickedness, which rumored I taught that passage for a year. But I taught the book. Uh, anyway, but there, you know, that's Zechariah 5, 5. You know what comes before Zechariah 5, 5? Very good. And 3, 2, and 1. So let's look at that because that is very important based on this point right here about Israel no longer being uh, uh, the, the nation Israel, sin not being found, because look at what happens. Zechariah 5, verse 1. Zechariah that night had eight visions, long night. He tried to get some sleep. Some angel would kick him in the side and say, hey, take a look. Tell me what you see. It, it happened over and over and over again. You might have that dream tonight. That's better than the naked dream I heard about earlier. So. <laughs> Verse 1, Then I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, What do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. <laughs> but note what he emphasizes. He says, Its length is 20 cubits and its width is 10 cubits. That's the exact measurement of the holy place for the tabernacle or the temple. Or the tabernacle, really. Then he said to me, This is the curse or the judgment that's going forth over the face of the whole land. That would be the land of Israel. Surely everyone who steals, it's a violation of the Eighth Commandment, will be purged away according to the writing on one side, <clears throat> and everyone who swears, a violation of the Second Commandment, will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. So it's a scroll written on two sides that's flying around. And it emphasizes the violation of God's standard. Verse 4, I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts, and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears by, falsely by my name, and it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timbers and stones. This is the cleansing of the land going on. It's going to be removed. This is like the Day of Atonement for Israel. And it's in connection with Babylon being the headquarters of the harlotry of the woman wickedness in the ephah. That little woman in the ephah. I mean, the ephah is you know, about like a five-gallon bucket. She's either real little or it's a big bucket that has a little ephah in it. But anyway... Uh, she's taken to Shinar, and she's taken to Shinar because that's where the Babylonian system is going to return. There's a connection there between the cleansing of Israel and this movement of things back to Babylon. Because remember what the tribulation is for. That's one of the key reasons for the tribulation is to bring an end of sin for Israel. Verse 30, back in Jeremiah 50, and we put them all have it right here. Her young men will fall in her streets, and all her men of war will be silenced in that day is not an accurate description of Babylon's fall at the hands of Persian King Cyrus the Great or under the rule of King Darius the Mean. And by the way, you get a, get a hold of Herodotus' history when you can't sleep one night and read about his uh, talking about this event of Cyrus taking over. That's kind of cool. Jeremiah prophes prophesied that Babylon will become empty of human life. Just as God completely destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, so no one will live in Babylon again. Today, Babylon is being resettled during the Gulf War. The United States even had a military base there. Verse 39, Therefore the desert creatures will live there, along with the jackals, the ostriches, also will live in it, and it will never again be inhabited or dwelt in from generation to generation. I've got nothing against ostriches and jackals, but they're unclean animals. And so the picture there is only unclean things being there in Babylon. As when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors, declares the Lord, no man will live there, no, nor will any son of man reside in it. So no human residing there in Babylon. God is going to make Babylon a rubbish heap and a total wasteland forever. Forever is a long time. This has never been true in Babylon. Forever is like... Forever, it doesn't end, it just keeps on going. And so, behold, I'm against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys the whole earth, declares the Lord, and I will stretch out my hand against you. And that's an idiom for the omnipotence of God, the almighty power of God coming against them. 
and roll you down from the crags, and I will make you a burnt out mountain. They will not take from you even a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but you will be desolate forever, declares the Lord. No brick left. Houses were not burned or gates smashed when Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians. Amazingly, the takeover was not destructive. But in verse 30 says, The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. They stay in the strongholds. Their strength is exhausted. They are becoming like women. Their dwelling places are set on fire. The bars of her gates are broken. Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a den of wild dogs, a wasteland with no one left in it. More prophecies that had not yet been fulfilled. Verse 37, Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror, and hissing without inhabitants. Now that's interesting, a hissing sound with no one there. That could be the wind, or that could be the demonic aspect that's held there for that time period. Not by man, though. Verse 41 43, we pretty well have that verse here. The sea has come up over Babylon. She's been engulfed with its tumultuous waves. Her cities have become an object of horror, a parched land and a desert, a land in which no man lives and through which no son of man passes. Another description that does not fit modern Babylon. Jeremiah 51 62. You, O Lord, have promised concerning this place to cut it off so that there will be nothing dwelling in it, whether man or beast, but will be perpetual desolation. 51, 63b through 64. When you finish reading the scroll, tie a stone to it and throw it into the Euphrates River. Jeremiah often is told to act out stuff, awesome stuff. When you see Jeremiah get up, have to do something, pay attention. And so he does this. And then say in the same way, Babylon will sink and never rise again because of the disaster and bring against it. On the contrary, today Babylon is rising. Therefore, this statement has not yet been fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in the day of the Lord. Look at Revelation 18. 21 this is awesome because jeremiah got to act out what this strong angel gets to act out in revelation 18 21 it says then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea violent throwing saying so will babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer the action provides a graphic illustration of the destruction of the harlot Remember, we started out with the crush and throwing it down. Come, it's biblical. comes right out of this passage here of Revelation 20, uh, 18, 21. Why do we emphasize these points? You may be saying, it's late. Why do we spend two hours? I mean, we got to watch Jeopardy. And that was cool. But I mean, the rest of it, man. Because God always literally fulfills his prophecies. And these details have not yet been fulfilled. So, big picture takeaway, Babylon equals Babylon, okay, after all of that. Now, a couple points, just real quick. Babylon operates as two great bookends for the beginning and ending of the post-Diluvian civilization. Post-Diluvian is just a $5 word for after the flood. Okay, Diluvian, the deluge, the flood. So, after the flood civilization, which we are a part of, Babylon is a bookend. Both the antediluvian civilization, that's the pre-flood civilization, from Adam to right up to Noah and his sons, but they kind of, they have a foot in one and a foot in the other. They get to go into the post-diluvian, end with cataclysmic judgments. And so what we learn by looking at those is that man's sin nature is self-destructive. Doesn't get improved upon, doesn't get any better. And Babylon is an example of that. So we start history out in the post-Diluvian civilization with Babylon, as we saw earlier in Genesis 11, wanting to make a name for themselves as they build a city instead of spreading out and trying to build a tower to reach heaven with a possible implication. Let God send another flood. We got him beat this time. We'll build a tower high enough to get out of it. It was just shaking their fist at God, blaspheming against God, what they knew God wanted them to do. Well, Satan was behind that. Then... He says, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. A lot of similarities between what Satan says he's going to do and what the Babylonians were saying they were going to do. And what did we have then? Well, we had internationalism with a global religion and a global economy. Now, what we're looking at with Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 is the same thing. 
And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And what we have with her is the same thing. We have internationalism, global religion, and a global economy. So it's a historical bookend for the civilization that will end with the coming of Christ. God takes sin seriously. J.G. was emphasizing that with, when we're looking at the wrath of God. We see that because God takes sin seriously. So seriously that he gave the greatest gift to take it away for us to be able to have a right relationship with him. And that's Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the uniquely born son, because he was alive before he was born, because he's the eternal son of God. And he made the decision to follow through with the father's plan to pay the penalty for our sins. And God the Father was pleased to do this with us in mind. So he gave him to the world so that whoever wants to believe in him can have eternal life. That's how seriously God takes sin, that he would want to take it away for you. And that's how much he loves you. God will judge idolatry in a complete and cataclysmic way for the same reason, because he takes this seriously. The idolatry is willful turning away from him. Because Paul tells us in Romans, the scripture tells us that everybody knows God exists because he's constantly communicating his existence from his creation. The heavens continually declare the glory of God. And when, we, when man turns away from God, that is the idolatry, that is the rebellion, and that's the height of what we're seeing in Revelation 17 and 18, really the whole time period of the tribulation. So as believers, knowing all of this, how should we then live? See, here's the question. Let's go and close with 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Knowing all this, we should live wisely regarding the days we have on earth. In 2 Peter 3, verse 3, Peter says, Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And they're going to deny the coming of Christ. They're saying everything is going to keep going like it has been from the beginning. And when they do that, they ignore the flood and other things. He talks about that. But get down to verse 10. <clears throat> that whole concept of the day of the Lord, Peter, in great Peter fashion, just pulls it all together in one verse. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Like the Taj Mahal. That Brett was talking about. The earth's works will be burned up. We know all these things are going to be destroyed one day, and we're going to have a new heavens and a new earth. Since we know all that, look at verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? How should we live knowing these things? Everything we've been looking at in Revelation has a motivating factor right here. It should impact the way we walk with our Lord. Are we walking according to the calling for which he's called us? Are we walking by faith? The same way we received him, we are to walk in him. Are we doing that? Note, while looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning the elements with, will melt with intense heat. There's always a question that comes up here. How can we hasten the coming of the day of God? I mean, God's got it on his timetable. How can we, ha there's something here with the way we walk can hasten the coming of the day of God. And here's how I like to think about it. God knows the last person that comes into the body of Christ. And so get busy making disciples and witnessing. How would you like to be witnessing to the person that believes in Christ when the rapture happens? You'd have a testimony for all of heaven. Hey, well, we brought it in. See, wouldn't that be cool? See, that's what it's supposed to focus us on. It's focus us on why we are left here. Because when we believed in Christ, we're still here. We're still here for a reason. And understanding all of this about Revelation is designed to motivate us in our walk. And that's what Peter's saying about this. Okay? Let's close in prayer. Do I need to give thanks for the food or you got announcements? Okay. Okay, dinner right after this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wow, what a whirlwind of looking through these things about the future of literal Babylon. And Father, we just pray that God the Holy Spirit will help us to continue to fit these things together. It's a lot of 
of understanding to go in and a lot of information to absorb. And Father, we know that it is beyond us. And we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need your help in order for us to put all these things together. So help us to be patient. Help us to remain humble. To always come to your word looking to know what you say. Not what others say, but to know what you say. And to understand exactly what you have communicated for us. We're so grateful for the salvation that we have in Christ. And not only are we saved from the lake of fire, but there's so many great things that you've given to us for life and the spiritual life in time. May we not take these things for granted. May, as we continue looking at the book of Revelation, may we continue to understand more about how we should utilize the assets that you've given us in Christ for your glory. Father, please bless this food that uh, we have now and, and bless the hands that have prepared it. May it be a strengthening to our bodies as we need strength and rest for tomorrow. Please go with us and give us a good night's rest for the night. And as we come back together, bring us all back together safe tomorrow as we continue to soak and, and pickle here in the book of Revelation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.